Gwyn Saga. Volume 20. Daughter of Syria. By Keiru Kurimoto. Sometimes there are people who truly live for love and die for love. While many people live for love but do not want to die for love, this man thought that he could die for love. Indeed, Saria was his only goddess, Chiron's song. The characters, in a play or novel. Gwyn. Leopard-headed super warrior. Marius. The wandering bard. Aldine, brother of Nerus, vizier of Paro. Achilles. Emperor of Chironia. Mariah. Empress of Chironia. Darius. Grand Duke of Chironia. Emperor's brother. Iris, Octavia. Beautiful swordsman. Darius' niece. Sylvia. The princess of Chironia. Hazos. One of the twelve electors of Chironia. Elector of Langobard Dulcius. Head of the Dragon Knights, one of the twelve Silent Legions. One thousand Dragon Generals. Demos. Elector Wolstad. Xenon. Head of the Emperor's Pro Army Thousand Dog Knights. General Seninu. Baldur. Viscount of Chironia. Thor. Mercenary born in Atosia. Daniel. Mercenary. Chapter 1. The Silent Conspiracy. And the story returns to the Garden of the Moon in the Royal Palace of Chironia, where the Silence, the Wind Hills, and the Obsidian Palace are located. It was the night the leopard-headed warrior Gwyn was to be presented to the court of Chironia. The party's over and we've already cleaned up. The maids bring the drunken master into their quarters to sleep and go out to snore. The moon is blue and the beautiful seven of Chiron light the hills, and in the gardens the statues of Janus the Twelve cast their shadows. Assassins creep in the darkness, their eyes glittering with suspicion, and the lucerne birds flap their wings in fright. And the evil omen passed through the obsidian palace on the windy hill like a dreamer's stealthy kiss, and awakened the slumber and dreams of the people. The Marquis of Langobard has become a scoundrel. The Elector of Langobard. You're a stinker. Guards. Guards. Their dreams were shattered, and they rushed out, holding up torches and shouting incomprehensible things, without understanding where or what had happened. Even among the courts of the famous kingdoms of the Central Plains, the Palace of Obsidian is the most spacious and luxurious. It was not easy to find out the origin of the cries that suddenly arose in that part of the city, but conjectures and speculations flew wildly and the confusion grew worse as the peasants, knights, and courtesans ran around in confusion, and the night was slowly dawning without anyone knowing what had really happened. It's a new day for the silence. Marquis. The garden is lined with beautiful and mysterious statues, and is in full bloom with Lunaria. There was a large warrior in the armor of the dragon knights of Chironia, who ran straight into the inner garden, scattering the Lenorians. His cloak is fluttering, and he is not wearing a helmet. Rather, there is no helmet on his head that he can wear. The warrior had the head of a leopard. Marquis. Marquis of Langobard. Gwyn's keen eyes caught the shadow of something fluttering in the shadows of the bushes as he shouted and went in search of his friend. A moment. Gwyn's body flipped like a goblin. He. At the sound of a faint voice, a young man's form was being dragged out of the bushes of Lenoria by Gwyn's arm. Her beautiful pale face, her long, silvery gold hair, her black, ominous robe of death, she is Iris. What do you? Iris gasped. Ouch, let me go, leopard. You, Iris. You're the one who did this to Marquis. Gwyn's eyes flashed fire and from the whole body of Silenos it seemed as if a flame of rage that could not be directed at him flared up. Iris's blue eyes flashed with fear. What are you? Say it. Gwyn's voice was low, but it held a great deal of dignity. You killed the Marquis of Langobard. What are you talking about? If it was me, what would I do? With her arms crushed in a tight grip, Iris finally regained some composure. I'm not gonna let you get away with this. Gwyn is a sharp speaker. You called me your friend. 
He welcomed me as a stranger with great kindness and without knowing a thing. I'm the enemy of his enemy. It's not me, Leopard. While Iris tries to shake off Gwyn's hand. Not me. I have no reason to kill the Marquis of Langobard, Hazos. I'm sure it's true. I swear. One day, when I know you're ready, I'll slay your ambitions. I don't want to be a liar. Ambition. Gwyn finally let go of her hand and Iris looked at her carefully. What are you talking about? What do you know about it, Leopard? I don't know anything. You, uh, you kept my secret. And for that, I'm grateful, but I need you to stay out of my life. Anyone who associates with me will be unhappy. I'm not in it for the sake of being in it. I'm in it for the Marquis of Langobard. Gwyn's thick chest rippled loudly. So you didn't see anything, Iris. I saw it. Slowly and deliberately, Iris said. I am the pale moon. I light this garden with the shadow of death. I have seen. I saw the Marquis of Langobard creeping out of this garden into the gloom, followed by a shout and the sound of a man being stabbed. Who who is that? Well, one of them looked like a woman, though. Leopard, you saved my life and you kept your mouth shut. In return, I'd like to thank you. For no longer engaging in the intrigues that plagued the silence. From now on, this beautiful palace will be an invisible battlefield. It's safest to see nothing and hear nothing. I thank you for that advice, Iris. Calm down now, Gwyn said. But I don't need you to worry about me. I can take care of myself. I've always been able to. You do. But that clown of a minstrel, he alone should leave the silence quickly and out of the sight of anyone unsavory. I'll tell them. Gwyn didn't care about Iris anymore and tried to walk past her. The golden-haired youth shouted at his back as if he felt a strange lump in his heart. Listen, leopard-head Gwyn, don't forget what I told you. You don't want any part of this. Especially a mother with loathsome ambitions and a daughter in love. They are of the blood of Zord and Tyr. They can bring no harm to anyone. You mean Empress Mariah and her daughter Sylvia? But Gwyn didn't even try to say so. He was already on his way to the inner sanctum. Looking away from the black figure, Iris had a strange expression of annoyance on her face. Then, suddenly, he lifted his cloak and hid his face, and his figure, resembling a spirit of death, disappeared again behind the bushes of Lenoria. Gwyn, on the other hand, was stopped by his family when he entered the inner hole. Ah, oh, Lord Gwyn, there you are. His Excellency, the Marquis of Langobard. I know. I was stung by a bastard. Yes, yes, sir, but that His Excellency Hazos wants to see you. What? Then is their breath. Yes. Still. You're still. Please hurry. The doctor says you're in danger if you don't get help soon, but he won't leave until I tell you in private. Where is it? And with that, Gwyn jumped into the room indicated to him. It was a room in the guard's quarters. Two couches were placed there, covered with cloth, and the wounded were given to them. People are looking at you anxiously. I have brought Lord Gwyn to you. As soon as the surname was touched, however, Hazos raised himself to control the murmur of the people. Marquis. You mustn't move. He's bleeding again, he's bleeding. Get out. Hazos shouted in a muffled voice. Get out, all of you. I need to talk to Gwyn. It'll be quick. Until then, there's no time for benefits. Chiron's rise and fall is at stake. Now, get out of here, I'm blind. Hazos groaned and reached out his hand to Gwyn as the panicked people were driven from the room. His neat, masculine face was as white as a flowing cloud, and his robe was covered with blood. Gwyn. Gathering his strength, he whispered as Gwyn helped him up. No one no one is listening. It's okay. I missed you. I thought I couldn't die until I met you. It's strange. You're the only one I could trust. I've only just met you. What do you want me to? Yeah. Hazos held the cloth tightly to his side as the blood flowed. I've seen it. I saw it, Gwyn. So this is the identity of the one who consulted with the Emperor Achilles to shorten his life. Yes. 
Gwyn took Hazos in her arms, put her mouth to his ear, and whispered a name to him. No. Oh. Hazos panted loudly. Did you know? No. I thought it was. It's a likely thing. It's not just that. Hazos reached out and took Gwyn's strong hand. Your true identity may be a terrible Gwyn, the mortal danger of Caronia. I can't ask anyone else. I can't trust anyone anymore, and I don't know who I can trust. I need you to keep this with you, please. Please, protect me from the pain. All right. I'll take that. No more talking. No one would believe me if I told them now. If anything, they'll think I'm crazy or evil. This is the only piece of evidence. I risked my life to take it from you. Protect it. Okay. Gwyn took what was given to the Marquis of Langobard and put it away. I'll keep it with me like this. So you can concentrate on your health without worry. Oh. Hazos threw his shoulder wide. Blood gushes from the wound. I think I've been beaten. To the punch, Gwyn. My lord will not die. Gwyn said, growling. We'll get you patched up. I, I like you. I don't know how I can trust you, whom I've met for the first time today, more than all the others I've known and been friends with, but surely, looking at you. But surely, when you see it you will wonder what you have believed in, what you have protected. Don't say another word. Don't die, Marquis. You were my first friend in Chironia. Don't die on me. I'm not. A stream of blood trickled from Hazos's lips, and he jerked his head back. Gwyn screamed as he gently cradled her body. Doctor. Marquis, please. Doctor. That's enough, come in, quickly. It was as if the whole of the court of Chironia was silent and held its breath. A bright and refreshing day is about to begin, oblivious to the dark and cloudy recesses of the earth. Gwyn reappeared in the courtyard, shoulders slumped and nodding. The tragic news of the death of Elector Langobard has already swept through the court, and may have caused a great deal of consternation. The bushes of the Lenoria are still and silent, and the men and women of the court, who would normally be engaged in their morning duties, are nowhere to be seen. It was when Gwyn suddenly raised his dark and somber gaze, as if inhaling the scent of the mysterious and glorious Lenoria. Don't move. A quiet voice said, and at the same time a spiky thing poked Gwyn in the back. It was a rare slip of the tongue with you. I'm ready. I'll stab you in the heart before you can turn around. You're still around, Iris. Gwyn's voice is never the same. I don't know how much longer I can keep doing that. Iris's voice held a hint of annoyance. Keep walking straight. You'll see a small pavilion to the right of the statue of Ilana. Go in there. Quietly, Gwyn did as she was told. The sound of a lock being lowered crackles in the air. Well, Lord Gwyn, Iris said mockingly, there is no time. I have to leave Windhill before anyone sees me. The Marquis of Langobard has given me something. Bring it here. I'm not giving anything away. We've got at least one spy on us, too. And Iris. Ho. Oh. Gwyn was expressionless. We, so you're saying there's someone behind you, or with you. Iris's cheeks flushed. He glared sternly at Gwyn, who turned his head. I'm better than that Baldur. I don't care how good a warrior you are, you will not be underestimated. With such an easily upset nature, it's hard to be important. Gwyn is quiet. I would like to pray alone for my friend, the Marquis of Hazos, for a moment. If that's what you want, you can do it later. I guess Hazos didn't make it, Iris said. A bold thing to do. To stab to death in the palace of Obsidian the key figure of Chironia, the twelve electors, and the most popular and trusted man in the court, Hazos, even if he was seen. Janus will surely judge those who do wrong. Janus means you, I suppose. But be careful. There are already whispers here and there in the palace that you were summoned by the dying Hazos and entrusted with something. Even if he did not, everyone believes that Hazos told him something. 
In place of the dead Marquis of Langobard, you will now be hunted from all sides. I don't care what you think, Gwyn said. Let them come after you. Great confidence. But I'm one of the ones you're after. Give me what Hazos gave you, Gwyn, and you can take a break from all this. And I swear to you, I will see to it that no one ever comes after you again. No, don't you trust me? It's not that. I'm just saying no, don't you understand? No matter how much of a super soldier you are, you can't fight the arrows from the darkness, the poison in your drink. You're just one man. One man may have to fight thousands, tens of thousands. If you don't want to join forces with me, I won't ask you to. But I can at least make sure you're safe. I'm sure it can be done. Gwyn smiled faintly. Iris glared at him. How much do you know about what? And he whispered. I don't know who you are. I don't know who you are. I don't know what you think, I don't know what you know. And when you think about it, your identity is the biggest mystery of all, there's no guarantee you're not some secret agent. With this face. Because of your face. Anyone who looks at you will be so frightened by your strange face that they will forget to look underneath to see what you really are. I see, you're also quite the military strategist. Do you think I'm an idiot? Outrageous. If you think you've got me on the weak side, you're mistaken, I'll tell you that. I, on the other hand, will go to any length to protect it. Stupid. Gwyn sighed. How long do you think you can keep up this pretense? No matter how cleverly you hide your breath, the color of your skin, or your gestures, if you stay around long enough, you will become known. You don't understand. Iris mumbled to herself. My delusion, my blood-curdling desire to avenge my mother's death, even if I had to go to hell alive. I saw with my own eyes the murder of my beautiful young mother. I heard her last breath and smelled her blood and cried clinging to her miserable corpse. I don't have anything to hide from you. The real me died then. Now I'm just a living curse, a living demon. That's not true never is, Gwyn said. Neither your heart nor your body is dead in the least. You're young and beautiful and full of life. I'd tell you to forget it, to think of it as a nightmare of the past, but that's not for me to say. That's right. But, may I ask you a question? What? Your true name. Iris looked at Gwyn with some kind of realization. Then he said, surprisingly calmly, Octavia. Octavia, Gwyn repeated, a beautiful name. I don't think you should do anything that prevents you from loving someone and calling them by their name proudly. You can't live that long in the name of servitude. I know that. I know that. I didn't even know who I was until recently. I didn't even know if the name I called myself was true or not. I don't know what you're talking about, Iris said defiantly. I don't know why. When I meet you, I'm like a little boy who's met his father, who listens to what he's told, who easily reveals secrets he doesn't want anyone to know. I'm sure I'm not very good at you. Anyway, as long as I get the evidence the Marquis of Hazos gave me, I'm good to go. Come on, we've been here longer than we thought. Come on. I'm only gonna say this one more time. Let me have it. No. Do you really want me to spill your blood? You better. I can't. You twisted Baldur's hand like a baby's. But I will not give it to you. Why? It's... Suddenly, Iris clammed up a little. Then I said it again. It's I'm determined to get it, I suppose. Come on. Gwyn looked at Iris with narrowed eyes. But he turned away silently and walked carelessly toward the door. Don't move. Iris shouted. His voice reverberated in the pavilion. I've got to go. Gwyn didn't want to deal with Iris. Iris let out a sigh of regret. Even though I don't want to kill you, you can't kill me. I'm going. I will not let you go until I have what Hazos gave me. Iris made up her mind. He bit his lip tightly and held his sword up straight. Gwyn doesn't care, he'll open the door. It's so noisy out there. I'm gonna go back and say it. If you don't want to be found, you'd better get moving. I'm coming. After I kill you. 
At the same time as he shouted, Iris's body sprang up and lunged at Gwyn. Gwyn did not even make a move to draw his sword. He twisted his body and deflected the tip of the sword by the slimmest of margins, then grabbed Iris by her slender wrist and made her drop the sword. Og, Don't be reckless. If you make a noise here, people will notice, and everything will be over. Cool. Iris grabbed her numb wrist and glared at Gwyn. Who the hell are you? I can hear you gasping. What are you up to, the way you say it, it's like you know everything. Who are you? Who are you? Gwyn of Lundok. Gwyn said. I know nothing. I'm not up to anything. You can put aside your fears that I will reveal your secrets. I don't get involved in things I'm not involved in. But that's not gonna happen anymore. Iris said mockingly. You're up to your neck in it. In fact, you've become the focal point of this swirling conspiracy. At the very least, you'd better be careful not to get caught in the act. I'll remember that. Gwyn said, leaving the small pavilion and walking away as if nothing had happened. Iris looked away from him with dark, firelit eyes. Oh, Gwyn. Where the hell have you been? General Darcius stood outside his quarters and looked at him with a stern face. They've been looking for you. You know of Hazo's misfortune. It's outrageous. I know. I met with Ho. So it's true that you were there when he died. What a surprise. I loved Hazos. A wise and reliable man who should have been a pillar of Chironia. The old general held his eyes. I feel a dark cloud beginning to gather over my Chironia. Oh, my, oh, my God. Well, come in, Gwyn. Gwyn obeyed silently. Where have you been all this time, and what have you been doing? Dulcius asked, slumping in his chair. I'm trying to find the person who did this to you. It's none of your business. Leave that to Zeno and Nardo. That's what they do. I've heard some strange rumors. Darcius looks at Gwyn as if he's just seen her for the first time. Is it true that Hazos had something important to tell you on his deathbed? Yeah. That's right. Is that something you can't say to me, your employer? I don't think it's a good idea to say anything right now. Why? Why should I stand idly by while Chironia is in danger? The crisis in Chironia may be. Maybe. Maybe not. I'm still not sure what the Lord wants from me. General, I'd like to be rid of them. Even my guards and my entourage. All right. Hold on, everyone. Leaving the two maidservants and the chief of the hundred dragons in the room, Darcius listened to Gwyn's whispering in silence. At length a cry of astonishment escaped his lips, and the old general's face gradually grew stiff and pale. You can come in now, guys. Gwyn stood alone by the window, silent, as Darcius called and the jesters entered the room. What do you say, Gwyn? I must return to my home and pay another visit with two squadrons of dragon riders. Hazos's unexpected death was a source of great anger and grief to you. You cared for and respected him above all else. Until we find Hazo's killer, Obsidian Palace will remain under martial law. You may stay here or return with me. I've been thinking about it too. I want to go back with the general. It's better that way. Darcius gave him a difficult look. What a mess we've gotten ourselves into. Yesterday, the Chiron court was so lively and merry and the princess is about to choose her son-in-law. Gwyn. Yeah. Now, if you ever need a wrinkle or an army, just tell me. Thank you, General. There is no one here in Chironia who could assassinate you, so I dare not say you will have an escort. Darcius thought for a moment. You know, Gwyn, I was going to tell you this later, but whatever you have learned from Hazos will come to the ears of the Emperor. Then you'll be called before the tribunal and you'll have to stay at court for some time. Since ordinary mercenaries can't freely enter and leave the Palace of Obsidian, I'll give you the position of the Hundred Dragon Chief for now. Please keep that in mind. But, General. It's a decree from His Majesty. His Majesty saw you at the banquet last night and said you're not worthy of being a Hundred Dragon Chief. I'll have to jump over ten dragons. No one will object. Do you have any objections, Els? 
No, General. You may not like it, but I can't have a common mercenary roaming around the Palace of Obsidian. The formal attire I had you wear has come in handy. Go back to the barracks and choose five Gianku. And a few more for your entourage. I don't need an entourage. He was about to say something when Gwyn changed his mind. I only want two. Thor of Atoya and Daniel. Thor of Adokaya and Daniel. Sternly, the old general looked at Gwyn. Then he nodded. Very well. Then let's go back to the barracks and get ready. We'll be in the Obsidian Palace for the foreseeable future, so be prepared for that. As you can see, the diplomatic mission on Twinarabigaka and the barracks of the Black Dragon Knights are in a flurry of activity. The messenger had been announced in advance, so the soldiers on duty at the court with Darcius were armed and ready to sleep in the Palace of Obsidian for the time being. The Black Dragon Knights are an army to deal with foreign enemies, not the court guards or the Thousand Dog Knights. The main duty of these soldiers was to protect their generals. The armies of the Six Electors, the King's Guard Regiment, and the Thousand Dog Knights of the Year would be in a state of riotous excitement. Oh, Gwyn. As soon as he entered the barracks, Gwyn was surrounded by a crowd of mercenaries. I hear it was a hell of a thing. The Marquis of Langobard has been murdered. Are we going to war? How was your unveiling? Are you okay? When Gwyn is struggling to keep up with all the talk. Out of the way, out of the way, idiots, Gwyn's a busy man. It was Thor of Atokian who intervened loudly and drove him away. Since I have to go to Windhill again soon yo, I heard that you were appointed as Gwyn's general, the Hundred Dragon Chief. Yeah. Good, good, good. You're the one who recommended me. Thank you. I'm new here, and I'm sorry for my outburst, but it's just a diversion for this incident. When this is over, you will be returned to normal. What are you talking about? Thor burst out laughing and slapped Gwyn on the back. We don't have newcomers or haters. The strongest are the best. Between you and me, it wouldn't be strange if you were a general. Ain't that right, boys? Waving his hand in agreement, Thor continued, Yes, yes, yes. Everyone's happy. I shouldn't talk like this. Excuse me. Don't say that. Just keep doing what you're doing. I'm still me. Oh, I knew you'd say that. That's why you're a grown man, by the way, Thor said in a whisper. I hear you got me and that weak bastard Daniel at the same time. Yeah, there's something going on here, isn't there? Thor's wise blue eyes stare into Gwyn's topaz eyes. Gwyn nodded silently. I thought you'd say that. Have this is getting more and more interesting. It's gonna keep me occupied for a while. What about Daniel? I think you're going to prepare. Are you ready, Thor? I can always get out. All right, then. By the way, where's Marius? Yeah, Thor looked a little unwell, but... You tell me. Hey, you tell him. Seeing people poking and prodding each other, he said in disgust. Well, I'm sorry, man, I'm out. He left. Yeah. This flim-flam idiot kept pestering me. But that's not all. He said he couldn't just hide out here forever, and he wanted to know if there was a good place to hang out, so I told him about Sartes, and he said he'd go there, wandering around with a kithera in his hand. Hey, Frim, it's your fault, idiot. I'm sorry, Gwyn. But it's not like I did anything weird. How much? He left a letter. Here it is. Gwyn took it and opened it. In beautiful, feminine handwriting, he wrote on the parchment that he was going to stay in Sards for a while, that he intended to return in a few months, and that if a girl named Rubina should inquire about him, he should tell her that he did not know where he was going. If anyone asks, he'd like you to keep it a secret that he went to Sards. Gwyn said as he spun it around. Well, he's a bard in the wind, and he'll come back when he feels like it. Thank God you're so understanding and so quiet, Gwyn. Thor said, sounding relieved. I'm glad I work for you. Are you ready for this? Yeah, well, I'll go do it. Gwyn went into his room. Daniel, who was hurriedly gathering his belongings on the bed next to him, looked at him with a grim expression. This, 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 that, that. Now that I've been appointed as the Hundred Dragon Chief, 
I've asked my roommate to let you be my aide. Slowly, Gwyn said. I hope you don't mind. Oh, my god, oh, my god, oh, my god. If it bothers you, let me know. I'll get you something else. That's not. Daniel. What what? Were you alone in the barracks all night? But of course, where did he go? As I told Thor, you don't have to change your attitude just because you're a hundred dragon chief. Gwyn is at ease. General Darcius will speak to you officially later. Daniel, were you born in Urania? What? Why would you do that, Eulania? Why again? Well, I'm sorry. It's Kumu, I forgot. Oh, I was born in Chironia. Oh, is that right? I told you, I grew up in Vermit. Oh, right. I'm sorry. I must have mistaken you for someone else. I don't know how I could have made that mistake. Daniel looked at Gwyn, who was smiling and starting to pack slowly, as if she was creeping him out. At that time, a family member came in and told the group to meet, and that was the end of the story about Daniel's hometown. As you may already know, this morning, His Highness Hazos, Elector of Langobard, was stabbed to death in the inner court of the Obsidian Palace by unknown assailants. His Majesty, Achilles the Great, is extremely angry, and has ordered us to find the culprit and denounce him severely, no matter what. The twelve divine generals and all the elected princes, nobles, military officers and civilian officials of the Silence will be crammed into Kazagaka for the time being to investigate the assassination of Lord Hazos. Of course, old Senryu Shogun will also be in charge of guarding and protecting His Majesty's side. I don't know how long I'll be gone, but for the time being I won't be returning to Twin Hills, I'll be staying at the Palace of Obsidian. I'll leave you in the care of Dursu. I expect you all to obey his orders and keep watch over me. I'd also like to introduce the new captain of the Order of the Thousand Dragons. As I'm sure you all know, His Majesty's will is to appoint Gwyn as the Centurion Commander and he'll be in charge of the Third and Fourth Companies. Gwyn will announce his greetings and the names of the five ten dragon leaders who will serve under him in due course. Gwyn is the best warrior and hero in our company. Those who serve under him and those who don't should obey his orders well and stand by him. Goodbye, Gwyn. In the courtyard of the barracks on Twin Hills, lined up were all five thousand members of the Black Dragon Knights. The two hundred men of the two companies following the general were already armed, while the rest were in plain clothes. Under their scrutiny, Gwyn advanced slowly. I am a newcomer and have not yet earned the credit I deserve for being chosen for this position but I accept it on the Lord's orders. But I consider it a temporary appointment in times of emergency. The ten dragon chiefs I nominate are as follows. Caius, Sirius, Alexius, Demas and Lore of Frilgia. Good luck. It's a very simple and casual greeting. Darcius laughed. Very well. Then we're leaving. Stay behind and don't get too comfortable while I'm gone. The order to move out may come soon. Keep your hands clean, boys. Let's go. The two squadrons started to move slowly. The leopard-headed warrior, dressed in the battle armor of a hundred dragon chiefs and carrying a simple load on the back of his horse, stands out remarkably even among these one hundred and thousand soldiers. On either side of them were Thor and Daniel of Atokian, and the mercenaries watched them with fascination as if they were watching the march of a king. What do you think, Gwyn? You look great. Ah, the hundred dragon chief's armor and cloak look incredibly good on you. Looking at him like that, it's no wonder he's a great general. His physique, his calmness, his dignity. I think he's going to be a big boy before long. Whoa, that's what I've been saying for a long time, isn't it? What there? In the midst of the knights going down the twin hills, sent by the murmurs and whispers. Hey, Gwyn. Thor of Atokia leaned his horse against him and whispered softly. Yeah, they like you a lot. They're talking about you like you're the greatest. Thank you. Gwyn laughed. Truly, you people are good to a deformed thing like me. Nah, it's your virtue. But some people are better off without them. No, I noticed that dragon chief Saisu, watch out for him. He was looking at you with piercing eyes. 
and I use of sorts. Sias and I use. Why? Haikuricho doesn't mean centurion, as you know. It's a job title. And there's only 20 of them in each core. One becomes a centurion and one has to quit. I use of Sardis was promoted from centurion to company commander because you were promoted to centurion. I use of Sardis was promoted from a centurion to a company commander. I don't think that's any of my business, is what you're saying. No, it's not. I have no pleasure in being called a hundred dragon chief, so I thought that the one who is so happy to receive it and wants it so much should become one. No, it's not. No, you're not. Thor chuckled sarcastically. That's the trouble with you. You're a good man but you're too worldly for me. They can see at a glance that the position of the dragon chief that you want so much is insignificant to you and not worth the trouble. The more miserable they feel in front of you, the more you remind them of the difference between you and them, the more they resent you and try to cover up their own misery. They're pathetic, but people aren't so pretty. You're a philosopher. Who? Me? No kidding. I'm just a mercenary. The longer you're in the mercenary business, the more you know about their temperaments, that's all. Well, you're strong as an ogre, so I'd be a fool to worry about you, but aside from Sias, that I use guy has a pretty bad head on his shoulders. And he used to be Lord Sard's maidservant. He ran away with a courtesan and became a silent mercenary and knows Lord Sard's. So it doesn't matter, but you'd better be careful. Thank you. I'll keep that in mind. You know, you. Thor looked at Gwyn. I heard that the Marquis of Langobard liked you. You've got quick ears. They say that Marquis Langobard is the best young player among the twelve electors, he's sharp, and in addition, he's a uniquely loyal vassal. Who do you think did it? Come on, I don't know. What a pity. You're wary of me. No. But really, I don't know anything. Well, okay. But this guy, this time of year, this situation, he's not gonna get away with it. You said there might be a war soon, old man. You're an old man with a good eye. He knows exactly what he's talking about. What do you mean? The assassination of Elector Langobard alone is a huge uproar that challenges the prestige of the Chiron court, but there are only eight days left before the birth of the princess and the celebration of her thirty-year accession to the throne. It would be strange if it didn't turn into a great deal of excitement with a great deal of hope. Now that Mongol is out of the way, Kumu and Yulania may be stretching their fingers at Chironia all over again. If either of those countries are involved in the assassination of the Marquis of Langobard, this will be the start of a war. If it were up to me, Gwyn, I'd say the man behind the assassination of Marquis Hazos is either Archduke Darius, the red-haired Taroin, or even Marquis Denae. Don't say too many words. Here. Gwyn casually cocked his chin toward Daniel. Yeah. Thor grinned and. Since you've chosen me. When I enter Obsidian Palace, I'll try to get along with that Daniel bastard and talk to him. He must have chosen me for that purpose. It's not just that. You're a man of skill and knowledge, too good to be left as a mercenary. When you're king of Chironia, you'll have to make me your general. Thor of Atokia said fearlessly. And then he started laughing. The reason is that Daniel looked at him in surprise. Gwyn. For the umpteenth time, Gwyn came to his senses. The piercing blue eyes of Thor of Atkia were closer than he had expected. What do I do? It's unusual for you to be so lost in thought. Oh. No. Gwyn looked as if he had just woken up from a deep sleep. I'm coming, man. I'm coming. Yeah. The group has already entered Kaze Ga Oka. Before their eyes is the majestic site of the Obsidian Palace. Obsidian Palace is a palace towering on the hill. The palace itself is as big and wide as a small city, and the whole hill is its garden, and you can see the city of Silent below. What do you want to do? That's weird. No. I've been thinking. Gwyn slowly turned his topaz-colored eyes to the Obsidian Palace. What? About Chironia. Chironia, what? I'm not too picky, Gwyn. 
I'm still very careful, but I'm a man who doesn't care about others or himself. Give me a break. No, I'm not picky at all. I was just vaguely thinking about the country of Chironia. Hmm. Thor's blue eyes follow Gwyn's as if he wants to know what Gwyn is seeing, and he turns to Obsidian Palace. It seems that the Palace of Obsidian has already been put on high alert after the Great Incident. Even the Dragon Riders are being searched one by one at the gate, so it's not easy to enter the palace. In the palace, which was filled with the noise of noblemen yesterday, the guards of the Knights of the Thousand Dogs are walking around, wearing the headgear of dogs. But when it was Gwyn's turn, the gatekeepers looked at each other and nodded. Please come through, my lord. And they said to Gwyn, we will not change our bodies. You're not a problem. Later, the emperor will allow you to see him. A farmer, who was waiting for him, told him. Gwyn nodded silently and led his horse by the reins through the large front gate. Last night's visit to the castle was, so to speak, not only to show his face, but also to be exposed. But today's appearance was clearly different. The whole court knew that Gwyn had succeeded Hazos, the Marquis of Lungobard, as the new focus of the tumult. There was a new light in the eyes of the court as he walked proudly, wearing the armor of the Hundred Dragon Chief, and they whispered to each other as he went. This time, because of the potentially lengthy court session, Darcius and his men were given separate quarters in the third circle. Gwyn is given a room in one of these quarters, and is assigned a subordinate. Thor and Daniel sleep and sleep in the next room. Gwyn entered the room, and before he had time to unpack his things, a son-in-law came to escort the son-in-law of the messenger. General Dulcius of the Order of the Thousand Dragons, Captain Gwyn. His Excellency Demos, the Marquis of Wallstad, would like to see you, if you would be so kind. Please tell him I'll visit him later. At the moment, I can't leave this place in preparation for General Darcius' review. In fact, he is waiting in the visiting room, but may I bring him here? Here. Then I'll take you to the visiting room. Gwyn told Thor of his intentions and then went to the visiting room in the San Nomaru district. The handsome elector stood there without an attendant. His beautiful face had grown pale and worn out overnight and he was in a pitiful state of grief. Oh, Gwyn. I wanted to see you, but you were taken away by the general so I had no choice but to wait for you. I heard you got a promotion. I must congratulate you. No. Gwyn stared blankly at the lure-like beauty of the Marquis of Warstadt. Hazos, I'm sorry for what I did to Hazos. What Demos suddenly began to say, with a look of anguish on his face, was something unexpected. What do you mean you're sorry? I've been blaming myself for the death of Hazos ever since I was told of it, Gwyn. Daimos sits down to collapse. As you know, Hazos and I were close in age and because we were strangely kindred spirits, we had always been the best of friends. He was older than my wife, and we had known each other from the time we were just waddling around. I've been thinking ever since that Hazos would have done something like that. This is all my fault, if I hadn't been so indecisive and pathetic, if I hadn't been able to rebuff his imperial highness more firmly, if I hadn't allowed the rogues to take advantage of his imperial highness' disordered mind and you wouldn't have let Hazos fall into his hands. You can't blame yourself like that, Marquis. It's not your fault. For some reason, I feel a little more at ease when you say that. The Marquis of Waldstad, looking even more beautiful and distressed than ever, said earnestly. But I don't think I'll ever forgive myself. Hazos was a fine man, Gwyn full of talent, character, charm and integrity many times more than I. He was a manly and proud man, a great aristocrat at heart. I never thought he would die in such a miserable way, and still so young. Why did Ho come to me? Yeah. The Marquis of Waldstad sighed. You have every right to be suspicious. Is it true what they say, Gwyn? That you, Hazos, on your deathbed, have been told something that could lead us to the men who killed him. Don't get me wrong. I'm not here to find out about it from you. I've only come to tell you that if at any time you need my help, don't hesitate to call. If the rumors are true, the whole court will be hunting you to see if they're true. I'd like to avenge Hazos, but I'm afraid it's not something an ordinary man like me can manage. 
However, I am one of the twelve electors, and as such, I have money, men, and the trust of the emperor. If there's anything you need my help with, please let me know. It is the least I can do for Hazos. Thank you, Lord Demos. And yet, the world is an ironic place, Gwyn. Demos had tears in his beautiful eyes. If only I had been assassinated instead of Hazos, there would have been no problem. And Lady Sylvia would have decided to choose her groom without regrets. If I had survived, I would not have been able to become a key figure in Chironia like Hazos. Smile, Gwyn. You see, I am but a weak-minded coward who loves his wife and son but fears the wrath of the princess. Gwyn, that's all I wanted to say. Hazos was very fond of you. From the first moment he saw you, he felt something like fate. He talked about you all through the feast. Unfortunately for me, I'm too ordinary a man to sense that fate, but in place of my late friend Hazos, I would like to be your friend this time. Gwyn, remember me. I will give you all the help I can, whatever it takes. Thank you. Gwyn said sincerely and reached out his hand. The Marquis of Waldstad clasped his huge hand tightly. Even so, I don't know why Her Imperial Highness thought of me the way that she did, it's not like I can tell her now. I'll add to it. Hazos, Xenon, and Robert are far more attractive and profound as men and as human beings than I am. My wife, Act, always teases me, calling me a simpleton. I'm a rustic from Waldstad. I know only the forest guard, how to make Vasha wine, sheep and cattle. I think you're in love with a vision of your own making. I guess that's just the way it goes when you're 19. Oh. I'm sorry, I know you're busy. Don't forget what I said. And at any time, well, if you ever need my help, here it is. Demos removes the ring and presents it to Gwyn. Give or bring it to my sons, and I will make sure that your orders will be carried out as well as mine in my house, in my lodgings, and in the castle of Wallstad, even when I am not there. Avenge Hazos, Gwyn, and if you can, give me the satisfaction of having aided him. I have thought of you as a true true brother. The Marquis of Waldstad grasped Gwyn's hand once more and walked away in a hurry. Gwyn looked away from it with a pitying look, before he left the room yet. Suddenly his eyes flashed, and he flashed through the window of the visiting room. The one who was about to duck and run through the garden stopped and looked back at him defiantly. Yeah, it's me. As usual. Master Baldur the red-haired was eavesdropping on you, Gwyn the hundred dragon chief. Baldur smiled a ghastly smile. What do you think, that poor, beautiful man, he was so miserable. If I had poked him a little more, he might have thrown himself on the sword for the sake of the world, or else he might have said that this face was all to blame, and if it had not been for this, he might have put a burning iron on it and crushed that lure-like face, but that would have been a pity. When Gwyn learns that Baldur is the one who was standing there, he seems to have lost interest, silently withdraws his hand, and tries to return to the visiting room. Hey, wait. Are you saying you're too dirty to talk to the bastard son of a Talwan woman? You're so arrogant. Baldur, annoyed, called out from behind him. You're a leopard-headed monster, you shouldn't behave so impersonally. You were very polite to Demos, that good-looking boy, even for an arrogant man. You hate the Marquis of Warstad a lot, don't you? Gwyn said. Baldur grinned. Of course not. How could I like such a beautiful man? as manly and beautiful as a lure statue even to my eyes. Gwyn, when I see a beautiful woman I want to defile and humiliate her by force, but when I see a beautiful man I want to burn his face with a broiler, cut him up, gouge out his eyes and pluck his nose. Don't you think so? Don't you want to curse the injustice of heaven when you see the beautiful face of the demos fool with the accursed head of a beast on it? Yeah. I don't think so. You're a beast inside and out, you know that. Baldur chuckled. I'm very fond of you for that. Don't you think they make a good pair, the fatherless son of a hated to ruin woman and the unborn beast? Well, you don't seem to think so either. I don't know. Baldur said venomously, and leaned toward Gwyn in a strangely familiar manner. Hey, Gwyn. I was the only one standing. 
There's no one else standing here. It's time you told me what you really think. What do you really mean? Nothing to hide. What is it you're planning? I want you to tell Baldur. Plotting. I don't remember plotting anything. Don't cut the white. You didn't tell anyone about last night's act between me and Sylvia. There's nothing for you to gain from my favors. And it's not as if Sylvia's mother told you. So it seems you're trying to blackmail and extort me or Sylvia with the incident of yesterday. What? You know everything, Baldur Sama. It was a way of measuring others by one's own measure. But Baldur, he's all smiles and smarts. I think you're about to take a bite out of my plan. I know. If that's the case, I'm willing to let bygones be bygones. As for me, a swordsman like you, you and I could do anything, even take out Caronia. Why should I threaten or blackmail you or Princess Sylvia? Gwyn's voice had a wry smile in it. I've only kept my mouth shut because I don't need to talk about anything else. I have no ambitions or plans at the moment, except to solve the mystery of my birth. What? Baldur looked at Gwyn in disbelief. You think I'm gonna believe that? I'm not so naive. Do you think there's a man in this world who's so good with a sword and yet has no ambition? I've never seen a man without ambition and greed in my life. Gwyn is no match for him, and he's going to try again. Once more, Baldur's voice rang out in frustration. Hey, Gwyn don't be a prude. You're certainly up to something, and who wouldn't be? That's why you're trying to keep the secret book of evidence the Marquis of Langobard gave you hidden and pretend you don't know about it. He's doing it so that he alone can reap the benefits. I don't remember receiving any secret messages. Liar. Your tongue is as long as Igrex. Baldur laughed mirthlessly. Or did you get a letter of martial law from a group of people who are plotting to rebel? So you're planning to extort each of the men on it one by one. What do you think? Did it mention my lord Baldur? Well, you never know. It's possible you killed Hazos to get that book and turned a blind eye to it. There were whispers in the palace who said as much. What do you think? The tongue of Baldur, as if to slap, became more and more venomous. He's probably trying to escape because he was spiked. They're all torques in the same den, and all humans are greedy, colorless beasts. Who am I to judge me? I'm just a little more honest than most. Look at me. You can't tell me anything I don't already know. Gwyn still won't say a word. But then. Lord Gwyn Hunter Dragon Chief. There was a loud cry for Gwyn, and without another word Baldur rode away. Gwyn was about to go back to his room directly, not to the visiting room, when he saw a pensive look on his face, as if he had given a human form to his resentment, curse and bitterness. You're here, your highness. It's terrible. The farmer panicked and grabbed him. What? Her Majesty the Empress has summoned the Hundred Dragon Chief. If you don't go now she'll be furious. I'll tell His Highness, Darcius, as soon as possible. Is Empress Maria so feared? The Empress is a very strict lady. Many maidservants and maidservants have been put to death just for serving her. Come on. There's a courtesan at the East Gate who will show you the way to the Inner Palace. Okay. Gwyn started to walk, and as he walked, he fastened his cloak properly and made himself presentable. How busy you must be, he murmurs to himself. He had expected such a thing, but he could not help noticing that his departure was now the focus of the attention of the whole court of Cylonia. There seemed no time to ponder or to be bored by the continuous events which had not yet had time to warm his seat. The maidservant who stood at the entrance to the corridor, seeing Gwyn, urged the maidservant to hurry, hurry, hurry. They rode their horses from the west exit of the third circle, passed through the beautifully landscaped garden, which was surrounded by deep green trees like a forest, and entered the service gate of the rear palace straight ahead. This place is normally off-limits to men, so please be mindful of that and don't look around too much. The courtesan gives a warning. We already know that the women of the court of Chironia were very elegantly dressed. 
They wore jeweled breastplates and loincloths of many colors, soft, transparent pantaloons that reached down to their breasts, long silk sashes around their waists, ornamental rings around their ankles, wrists, and necks, short, thin overcoats, and their heads were bobbed and pinned with flowers and precious stones. Of course, when they go out in public, their pantalettes and upper garments are replaced by more comfortable ones, and the higher-ranking women wear open-fronted skirts over their pantalettes, as well as long fur cloaks and shawls. In spite of, or rather because of, the coldness of the country, the dress of the women of Chironia was more splendid than that of the Kumu, and was in no small measure influenced by the Kumu, in contrast to the dress of the men of Chironia, which was more simple and rigid. It was a striking contrast to Gwyn walked as if she had not seen or heard anything, amidst the bustling whispering, pointing, and giggling of the flamboyant, well-dressed, and fair-skinned ladies of the court. The inside of the women's palace, which is usually forbidden to men, is covered from ceiling to floor with lustrous silk and incense, and the air seems to be filled with the stifling heat of oil powder and fragrance. That's him. That's the guy. You're so tough. How tough. A real leopard. Let's see if I can read your love letters. The muffled laughter, the amiable sneer, the murmurs and whispers, however, ceased as soon as they reached a certain point. Suddenly, the air seemed to grow chilly. This was the private quarters of Empress Maria. Your Highness. I've told you many times that Empress Maria is a very strict and unforgiving woman. Answer her questions immediately and don't be afraid to answer directly. And don't let a hair out of place. Don't look the king in the eye or touch anything without permission. My lady and I will take care of everything. And please, do not disobey his majesty's wishes and incur his wrath. So the true rulers of Chironia are the Mendori. Gwyn murmured quietly, but not loudly enough to be heard. The furnishings had become even more opulent and extravagant and at the same time, everything had become cum like It was almost impossible to tell whether I was in calm or in silent if I only looked there. Well, you're up front. Get down on your knees. What are you doing, Illyria? Without waiting for the curtains, which were made of velvet and embroidered with gold, to be raised on either side, a piercing voice was heard. Immediately, the lady-in-waiting stiffened visibly and fell flat on her face. Ha, hey, your majesty, I brought you. Slow. Well, good. Teresa, Luisa, stand back. Alea, you, too. Well, that's, 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 that's. Down. Time is depressing. At the sound of the crane's voice, the maids retreated in panic. Gwyn and all that. His voice was thick and strong like a man's. Don't be distressed. Raise your eyes and answer me soon. There's only you and me here. I am Maria, Empress of Chironia. I don't have time to be crushed by idle groping and wooing. Empress Maria said softly to him, still kneeling and hanging her head. Gwyn. I saw you fight in battle against Xenon and I know. You will not stay with old Darcius. Gwyn. You're to leave the Order of the Thousand Dragons and become captain of the Empress Guard. I'll only tell you once. Gwyn didn't say anything. He just slowly looked up and saw Empress Maria. Above his eyes there is a harsh, gaunt face like a man's. The face of an impassioned woman with eternal dissatisfaction and natural dignity the Empress was dressed in a beautiful, soft silk loungewear, but she still looked as rugged as a man. She lacked all of the weakness, lasciviousness, flirtatiousness, and gentleness that made a woman feminine and graceful. Her piercing light brown eyes stared at Gwyn as if she was treading carefully. You got it. The queen said, as if she already knew the answer without asking. Pack up your things and move into the palace barracks immediately. I'll have a room prepared for you. Good. No. Gwyn, as expected, said in a tone of voice that he rarely used. One moment, please. I'm a mercenary of General Dulcius, and I can't act without his permission. Darcius, the loyal servant of my emperor, whose will is the will of my wife, how could Darcius disobey my command? But, darn, it was a noble voice. 
But when I raised my voice after that, she lowered her voice unexpectedly. No, Gwyn. Or is there some reason you're not serving as my guard? Is there something you're not telling me about your background, or is there some circumstance you're not telling me about? No. Tell you what. There's no one here but me and you. A mysterious smile. The Empress slowly brushed her hair back. In her right ear, there is a heavy, shining, black and gold earring with a kumalite pattern. The earrings are extremely elaborate, with black jewels studded in the shape of runes. What did you do? Empress Mariah whispered. She smelled like a bad salvio. What is it that has made you so stiff-necked? What have you been told about me? I'm not a stone and I'm still young enough in body and mind to be a foolish woman. Do you want proof of that? Gwyn slowly bowed his head once more, pretended to prostrate himself, and looked away from Lady Mariah's eyes. Oh, Gwyn I know there have been strange rumors about me. Empress Mariah's voice is fainter and fainter. It's been said that all my enemies die strange deaths for some reason, that they often breed those who use Kumu's poison and Katai's poison. But that's a misconception. I'm not such a fearsome woman. I'm not that hard to please, especially for strong, hardy warriors like Xenon and you. Gwyn. I don't care if you are a true leopard or a man. Gwyn, it's time to answer the question, will you join my guard force? I'm sure you will. I don't need to wait for Darcy's answer. No. The answer was slow, but clear. I am a mercenary of General Dulcius. I will answer your questions through him. What the? The Empress, who was about to lose her temper at that moment, restrained herself firmly. It was a strange thing. For all intents and purposes, Empress Mariah appeared to have a passionate temperament that resisted opposition and disobedience above all else. Nowhere in the world could she have shown the kind of restraint that she had just shown. But the Empress was smiling. I see. That's unfortunate, but so be it. Then I will speak to you again later through Darcius. However, since you have come all this way, I hope you will at least drink a cup of wine from me. I'm sorry for my insensitivity, so here's a drink to make up for it. My, my, best. Two. Her lips mistakenly fluttered as she smeared the Empress's red on them. The Empress stood up with a swooshing sound and approached the closet at the back of the room. Not this. Ah, uh, oh, this one, this one. This is the drink for a brave man like you. She took a bottle of sake in her hand and poured a generous amount into a silver cup that had been prepared in advance on the shelf. Then, with a strange, languid gesture, the Empress took a silver lid with a finely engraved cover from the same shelf and poured something like a vatch of fruit or a column fruit from inside into the silver cup. Now, you can drink as much of it in one gulp as you can of a potion. Gwyn bowed graciously in silence. But when he saw the contents of the cup he had been given, Gwyn's eyes lit up. A crimson wine that clears like a jewel. I see something in it like a faint glow. Poison. What did you do? Gwyn. Empress Mariah's voice was filled with uncontrollable mockery. Can you not drink my wine? Or do you suspect something? You think I put something in it? I don't think so. What I put in there earlier was a local elixir of Kumu, a bit foul-smelling, but very potent. It heats the body and then cools it like ice. One may not be enough for a man of your size. I'll put another in for you. There, that'll do. The Empress laughed and threw back her bony throat, as if she was amused. It's rare for a man to meet me alone and not shudder and lose his senses. You are a man of great courage. Now dry yourself off. I'll let you get your reward. Come on, come on, come on. A strange, nasal odor, and a gradually clouding red. Gwyn stood there staring at it. There was no longer any doubt that it was laced with enough poison to possibly kill even a man as strong as he was. Your Majesty, the Empress. Gwyn said slowly. Do you want me to disappear from Chironia? If you defy me. The Empress replied clearly. Your power, your skill, and your virtue that makes people believe in you. All of them will become my enemy if I cannot tame them now. Then it's my job to pluck them while I can. Drink it or become my guard. 
you can still let him choose in the end. I can't help but feel that it would be a shame for a man as brave as you. You are an outspoken man, your highness. Gwyn said, holding the silver cup in his hand. Are all the women of Chironia so forthright? I'm the daughter of the previous Grand Duke of Kumu, Gwyn didn't you know? Comes. Well, that Mario with his three bad kids is my half-brother. I didn't know that. What good does it do to know? Generations have passed in the land of Kumu and now they've forgotten that a woman as terrible as you was ever a princess. It's funny. The women of Kumu are famous for their beauty. Yulania, on the other hand, has never been known to produce a particularly beautiful girl. Julia Euphemia. I remember her even to this day. She was beautiful, 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 the kind of girl that would make even a woman's heart swoon at the sight of straw. I tell you, you know nothing, you understand nothing. Now, will you take it, or? To the guard. Yes. Mariah laughed. The emperor is very fond of you, and I must tell you before he does that you may wish to join his king's guard. If even Xenon is no match for you, there is no warrior in all of Chironia, let alone the entire Middle Kingdom, who can match you. It's a pity I won't let you die in vain, do you understand? Gwyn stared at the cup. Now the crimson has been replaced by a darker red, and even a hint of warmth can be found inside the silver cup. Empress Mariah might have seen it as a hesitation on Gwyn's part. But Gwyn had other things on his mind. I'm... Immortal. Truly. That terrible question that I once had at Mount Gudu, the answer to that question is here now. If I am immortal, even if I drink this cup away, I will still be, but if you don't. This is Janus' opportunity, isn't it? You may try, but if you don't. If you were not immortal. You don't want to die, Gwyn, he asked himself quietly. The answer, this time, came quickly. Yeah. I don't want to die. But why? I want to know who I am. I've made friends in Chironia. Friends who would accept me even in my monster form. One of them even entrusted me to his care. I can't die. I don't have the right to test your immortality. Doubleday. A thick, muffled voice that sounds as if it is lingering. Well Gwyn. To drink or not to drink. The potion is melting away. The time is running out. If you're trying to buy time, you're wasting it, and Darcius and even the king himself cannot enter this palace. It's... Do you want a drink? Don't you want a drink? Well... You want to join my guard? No. Well... Let's see what you're made of. Before I could even say it. Oh, mother. It sounded like a slice. No, 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 princess, that's not where I... Your Highness, I am at your service. They're going to kill us. Shut the fuck up. With a determined cry, the Billodo curtain was violently swept to the left and right. Of course, it was the familiar princess, Princess Sylvia, who burst into the room. Mother. What do you mean? I didn't, I didn't, I didn't hear that. I was just about to say that, when I noticed Gwyn, and he quickly changed his color. No. She ranted. No, no, no. How can this animal be here, alone with your mother? Mother, what is the meaning of all this? I hate him so much that I can't even get enough of him, how? Sylvia. My mother's voice made even the most reckless girl jump. You're still the same obnoxious little bitch. How many times do I have to tell you? You're not a child anymore. Don't be so rash. How dare the heiress of Chironia come barging in like that without a word. Mother, don't play games with me. Sylvia, indeed, somewhat smaller than usual, clogs the ground. I've heard. The first man to dance with me at the feast will be my groom. That's terrible. Then I'll have no choice but to marry Laos. Because it's customary to dance in order of rank. No, I don't want to marry Laos. Oh, so you prefer Baldur. I decided this because you dislike Baldur so much that you would rather marry Laos than Baldur. And I don't like Laos. What do you want, Sylvia? 
don't be so selfish. You follow Demos around all the time and you're the envy of the court. You should know your place and your rank. What I don't like, I don't like. Even your mother must think that Laos and Baldur are both too much, too bad. Yes, there are times when I feel that way. But you have no choice, princess. Demos has a wife and child, Robert is blind, Prince Mayer is dead, and Lord Crystal is. I don't care if it's Lord Crystal. Sylvia was so angry that she seemed to have forgotten even Gwyn. Your age and status suit you. Yes, Lord Crystal, I'd make a good husband for you. Don't be silly, Sylvia. That's... Oh, my God. Men of Pa, Pa, etc. Paro and Chironians don't mix. Not with a schemer like him and a would-be son-in-law of the Duchess of Mongol. It's better than Reyes and Baldur. Xenon, then. Outrageous. He's such a lowly one. Do you understand, princess, your son-in-law is the man who will become king of Chironia and later emperor of Chironia? I don't care about that, I do. What is it about Laos or Baldur that makes them worthy to be king of Chironia? It's not worthy of, but... Suddenly, the empress stopped talking. He said in a voice that was fully aware of Gwyn's silent listening. So you'd rather have one of the three dukes of Kham as your son-in-law? Oh, mother. Talud, Talsand, Tarek, you are all of the right age. When you are the sons of Kumu, Baldur and Laius will not be so easily dissuaded. Because. Sylvia looked astonished. Your father won't allow it. Kumu's story about the three princes was never told in the first place because your father was against it. So. The empress said it in a strange, gentle, insistent way. She put her hand on her daughter's shoulder. You don't, you don't have any objections to that yourself, do you? Objection. What's wrong? There's something wrong with your mother today. She doesn't look right, she's giving these animals to the chamber, and oh. Sylvia narrowed her eyes. When did this happen? The hunter dragon chief has just left, not wishing to be disturbed. Illyria, the maid of honor, spoke up fearfully. But Empress Mariah knew that long ago. Of course, a half-beast, half-man like him would be a waste of life. Chuckling, the Empress took up the untouched silver cup that Gwyn had left behind. Good, good, that's good. For now, I've given you enough of a scare that you're not thinking of taking your life, so you'll think about it. There. If you open the cup into the fountain that is set up there by the two windows, you will immediately be filled with smoke and a terrible stench, and the fish inside will instantly appear with white bellies. An interesting one. I'm sure he'll enjoy it. This is an unexpected turn of events. Mother, did you try to kill that beast? You don't have to worry about that. Well, Sylvia, who hated Gwyn but was a good person at heart, put her hand over her mouth and looked at her mother in horror. Your father would be very angry. With you for liking that beast so much. Yes, I'm sure he'll be very angry. Very. Empress Mariah smiled falsely again. Sylvia looked at her mother anxiously. That story you told me about Kumu, it's not true, is it? Why? If only your father hadn't objected, it would be a good story. Because I because I. How long can you keep talking about Demos and dreaming? It's not that I know perfectly well that I'm in a position and a status and that it's a love without any hope. But 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 I still think that Demos is, Demos is. Sylvia nearly cried out and bit her lip. One of these days you'll go to the palace of Sards and relax. You'll feel better. Yeah yes, that's right. Your mother. Sylvia fought to keep from squirming. But, so, will you ask your father to forgive me for choosing the bridegroom at the time of the great liturgy? Well, I don't know. I tell you, but it's already decided. Besides, Sylvia. A royal princess can't just fall in love and marry whomever she pleases. Not even me, not even the Princess Amneris of Mongol. Or do you want to be a laughing stock like the three sisters of Yulania, a princess without a husband? Terrible, mother. I don't think I'm as ugly as the three Uranian sisters. Oh, of course. Of course, you're very beautiful, Sylvia. 
A little bit of. Sylvia said sadly. She must have remembered Baldur's abuse. But then, she let it slip. I should be a little more beautiful. Even if I can't compare to, say, Julia Euphemia. Mother, how, how? Sylvia. It sounded like a whip. What did you just say to me? Julia, where did you hear that name? To whom? To where? Hi. B.A., I'm Baldur. Sylvia's fragile heart was easily overwhelmed. This time she collapsed on the sofa and began to weep bitterly. But her mother didn't even look at her. Her eyes were blue. Ghosts. A manly moan escaped from his clenched lips. Chapter 2 The Dungeon The weather was fine for the silence. When the weather is fine, Marius is always in a good mood. However, it does not mean that he is particularly moody when the weather is bad. When the weather is bad, he is even more cheerful, as if he were thinking that he must take the place of the unseen sun. In short, he is usually smiling, in a good mood, and seems to be shouting with his whole body that he is happy to be alive. Because he is such a man, he naturally attracts the attention of the townspeople. Especially in the downtown area, Marius is already a popular figure. There are few people in the neighborhood who do not know him. Yes, Marius. Hello, Marius the poet. Where do you sing? I don't see you around here much these days. I've been a little busy. Hey, auntie, how's business? Hello, Marius the bard. Long time no see. I'll buy you a glass of Callum water, but you're gonna have to start playing. I o. Oh. Let's make it daughter of Saria. Dot. When asked, he would unload his luggage, sit on the stone steps, pick up a kitara, and sing. By the time the last line of the song is over, it's his stage. There is a crowd of people around him. Good. Bravo. Do more. Hey, Marius. Where the hell have you been? I was a siren. I've been busy. She has a friendly smile that can't help but make anyone fall in love with her, her cheerful talk, and her shining curly hair. No one would have suspected, even for a moment, that Marius was not his usual self, or that he was troubled in some way. However, Marius had a small problem. Although it was a much simpler affliction than his original affliction concerning his true identity, it was not so easy for Marius. Now, I'll come back and sing you a song. When are you coming back? Now, as for the memory of Kalra. When he had finished, he stood up with his kithra, but before going to any of the seven gates of the Silen, he went into the Alley of Spells. Without much hesitation, he selected an old fortune teller and walked up to him and clicked a silver coin he had taken out of his hiding place. I'll take one. What do you want me to tell you, young man? First, the direction. Is it good or bad to go to Sards? Sards. Give me a minute. The old man took out various things and put them on the table, shaking the table and preparing to tell fortunes. Sards, Sards, oh, there it is. Not bad. Not the most auspicious direction, but not a bad one either. I'd say it's reasonable. The best direction is usually the one that turns bad. Where is the most auspicious direction? Ah, uh, oh. It's in the northeast. Which way is northeast? From here, yes, Kazagaka, Jolna, that sort of thing. Kaze Ga Oka is where the royal palace is. It's none of my business. Well, I suppose you're right. I don't have one either. Anything else? Yeah. Marius turned blurry eyed. It was the kind of look you don't give people out in the open. I was just wondering if a certain someone was doing well. What's your name? I can't say. You can't tell my fortune with that. You can't tell anybody, but I can't tell him. I swore an oath to Yarn. So you're a woman. Well, why don't you at least tell me where you are? Oh. It's Paro. Paros. To the crystal. Oh. Did you leave your girlfriend at the crystal? It's not like that. It's not a woman. It's my. Marius got a faraway look in his eyes. That's my that's my brother. The only. Brother. Let's see, oh. 
The old fortune teller looked into the Ouija board. You seem to be well, prosperous, and loved by others. But, hmm. You're a lonely man. The loneliness oracle is on. Maybe he's lonely because you're not here. No way. Marius muttered. That's not true, that's not true, that's not true. But unfortunately, Paro's the bad guy for you. Very bad. If you want to live, stay away from Paro. That's how bad the oracle is. Anything else? Yes. Marius thought. Your grandfather will never see the afterlife. After death, oh, no. I'm just a town crier. I'm not a medium or a talisman. If you want a talisman, you'll have to go to the Temple of Dole. Yeah, I know. Have a drink. I want to hear some more. Marius sent out another run. I'm being chased by a woman I don't like, how do I get her to hate me? I'm getting the feeling that this woman is bad for me. Let's see. You're right. You're looking at some pretty nasty stuff, you better watch out or you're gonna get pulled in. It's a bottomless pit. I'd avoid seeing him again if you can. I will, but... Hey, Grandpa. I don't know if there's anything, anything good that's gonna happen to me. To be or not to be. All events are neither good nor bad by themselves, kid. They can be good or bad, depending on who's taking them in. You have a oracle that says many things will happen to you. To turn it to good fortune and keep the bad gods away, you should make offerings to the doll. You should also exorcise them if you can. Okay. Marius stood up without much to gain. The old fortune teller felt sorry for him because he looked so dejected. The old fortune teller stopped him. What's troubling you so much? One more thing, I'll look at you for free, so why don't you go ahead and tell me what's bothering you? Yeah. Marius thought about it and then straightened up. Hey, Grandpa. A mage told me something that's been bothering me. I've been thinking about it ever since. A certain magical path, this magical alley. Yeah. Who is it? Luca, a man of the world. Oh. Luke can't be wrong. He's one of the most learned men on this path. And what did Luke say to you? I, ah. Uh, Marius clammed up. Every man, as long as he lives, must one day find his own bride. You've already escaped twice. Beware, if you try to escape your fate a third time, you will lose the light that guides you and you will be guilty of running away again. Your soul shall no longer belong to the doll. Your soul is no longer a doll. Grandpa. What the hell does Luca want me to do? What am I supposed to do? Marius said with a clammy voice. I don't know what Luke meant by that. When a magician tells you something you don't understand, it's because he has to. As expected, the old fortune teller was dismayed and said in a troubled tone. Eventually, when the time is right yes, when the time is right, you'll know. Yeah. Realizing that he had nothing more to gain from the old man, Marius stood up and resumed carrying Kid Era on his back. Thank you. You've been very helpful. Look. The bad guys are in Paro, and they're up north. Oh. I'm going to Sartes. Even out in the bright light of day, Marius was somehow still in a daze. I can't help but feel like I've still got some mushrooms in me. I should have asked her about Iris. But there's no way you'll get a clear answer anyway. Marius is a citizen of Paro, the city of magic. He knows all about the nature and limits of witchcraft and divination. As he walked out of the alley, Marius walked with a vague expression that was unlike him. Various thoughts flashed through his mind. Thoughts of Sylvia, of Iris, of Baldur, of Gwyn, and of the people of his hometown of Paro, whom he had abandoned. Paro didn't have many good or happy memories. I don't know why. I've been thinking about her a lot lately. Maybe it's the Iris. Is there a resemblance? That guy is at. When I was a child, he was the brother who really cared for me. He was the brother who taught me how to draw a katara, how to hold a sword, how to do everything. He was the brother who could do everything and knew everything. He was the brother who could do everything and knew everything. I always
always looked at him with worshipful eyes, but secretly he was annoyed with his brother who did not look like him. When did it start? When I loved him and admired him but began to sing a different song from him. When I began to neglect my sword training. When I left political science and military science and spent my time in the kitchen watching him make honey wine. He never scolded me, got angry, or even complained. He just always smiled gently and quietly. Dean, are you more interested in the kitchen than Alexander's book of military tactics? He said, well, maybe there's something to be learned in the kitchen, too. But deep down, he was disappointed and discouraged in me. And every time I found out, it hurt me and I ran away to be among people I didn't like. I felt strangely at home in the company of kitchen servants, horsemen, and flower trimmers. The men of Paro's court mocked me as a manifestation of the foul blood of my origins and scorned me outright. My brother, a man of noble birth, would never have done such a thing. How they looked at me. My brother was the only one who never said that to me. But it was his kindness, love and disappointment that gradually came to haunt me the most. I couldn't tell him. I couldn't tell him that I wasn't you, that I could never be like you and that I didn't want to be like you. I was afraid of disappointing him, of losing his love. I couldn't even stand the slightest clouding of his beautiful brow, and I kept betraying him by trying to meet his expectations and I ran away from him. Yes, I've escaped. Luke's right. I ran from him. I know what he was expecting from me. To be the other him, to be his alter ego, his right-hand man, to assist him for the rest of his life. To be his sword in battle, and his counselor in peace. I couldn't tell him. I couldn't tell him what I wanted to do. He'll never forgive me again. He had a kind face and voice, a smile like an angel's, and he never forgave anyone. I know that he's not the kind of person who'll ever put his hand out again once it's been removed. I can't go back. Not as long as I live, not as long as Aldo Neris, Lord of the Crystal, lives, not to Paro. Crystal, the only place I've ever known. Where my parents' graves are, where people of my blood live. Does my brother sometimes think about me? You betrayed Lord Crystal, who would not tolerate one betrayal, not once, but twice, your brother Aldine. No, Aldine is gone. That man died far away in Mongol with Prince Mire. Now, here is Marius the Bard, a merry, good-natured man named Marius, unknown to Nerys. I remember Iris calling me a clown. Iris. Marius, unknowingly, let out a little gasp. Sarts that way. He was originally a drifter, a minstrel who did not care about the fortune of his direction. It is not uncommon for a person to decide to go somewhere and have their direction read, but today, they went to the trouble of going to the spell path and were told that it was not bad, even though they did not have any plans, they were somewhat hesitant. Marius didn't know it, but he didn't feel comfortable leaving the silence. Marius does not yet believe that it is because of Iris. But he has been putting off for some days now the journey from the silence to Sards, a journey of two or three days, even though he would have preferred to go a day earlier. However, there is no longer any reason not to go to Sards. Since yesterday, Gwyn has also moved from the barracks on Twin Hills to the Obsidian Palace on Windy Hill, and I've been told that he's not expected to return for the time being. Recently, both Iris and Sylvia have been keeping a low profile. Marius does not know that this is because of the riot in the Obsidian Palace over the assassination of the Marquis of Langobard. Sards. Well, I'm sure it's a nice place to live if you go there. There's a saying, if you live in Nosphorus for ten years, it's more heavenly than the Crystal Palace. Well let's go. It's Mr. Marius. As if to cheer himself up, Marius muttered aloud. I'm sure there are fine women in Sards. Good wine and generous lads. If I'm comfortable, I might stick around Sards for a while. It was when Marius started to walk towards the south gate, which led to Sards, that he felt a sense of reluctance. A silvery vision blocked his path. Oh Iris. Show. A black cloak and hood completely enveloped her, but she could not conceal her fuzzy silvery gold hair, which fluttered softly. There's no time. Look, poet, just, just go. Go hide somewhere. 
When night falls, you leave the silence without being seen. Good. What what what? Oh. That's when he whispered so many words that Marius lost his temper. Iris. The figure of Iris had disappeared. A vision. It was a momentary incident that could have been mistaken for something like that. Iris. Marius looked around, but could see no more than a Miroka pilgrim strolling along the edge of the road, nowhere to be seen. Isn't that guy really the spirit of the moon? What's that moon doing from Hiruma to? This downtown. The area is a busy street, and it is late at night. Marius twisted his head. However, he decided that thinking about it would not help, so he carried Kid Era back and started walking again. Why do I have to see visions of Iris? Somewhat in a complaining mood, I bought some dried vatch of fruits, which were hung tightly on a string, along with Kalam water at a Kalam water shop on the roadside, and chewed them as I walked. When I thought that I had left Silent and would not come back for a while, I felt fluffy, depressed, free, and strange. Iris, you know, I don't know what he's really like. I don't think he's a bad guy, but it would have been nice to have a long talk with him. But he's never gonna show his face. In this way, although the Silent seemed to be the most peaceful, prosperous, lively, and prosperous people in the world, there must be many people like me who have come from all over the world with various thoughts and feelings. He was somehow in a rare mood, drifting through the crowds, and I wonder how long he had been here. And then I realized, he was under siege. If it had been Gwyn or Ishvan, they would have noticed the sign much earlier and would have done something about it. Marius, however, is vaguely lost in his own daydreams. Besides, he's not very good with swords or deadly weapons. What the? I still don't get it. I look around in a daze. A group of men in black cloaks and black hats approached from all sides, blending in with the crowd, and before they knew it, they had completely surrounded Marius from front to back, left to right. What? Even then, Marius didn't know it was coming for him. What? Feeling something unpleasant, I wondered if I had gotten mixed up with a group of King's Guard without knowing it, when I rushed to get out of the way. He grabbed my arms from both sides. Yeah. Marius's heart jumped out of his chest. What are you? You're coming with me. You must be Marius the Bard. One of them, grasping his right arm, whispered to him in a low voice. The brim of his hat was down, a silver mask was on the upper half of his face, and the eyes that looked out from it were as cold as blue ice. Hey, who's this? Why oh, could it be? When he realized that he was not without enemies, the blood seemed to drain audibly from Marius' body. What the hell are you doing? You're hurting me, let me go, don't hurt me. It's better for you to be quiet, minstrel. Otherwise, I'll have to take you with me. You are. Of Baldur. No. They denied it outright. He didn't believe it all, but the thought that it might be Sylvia made Marius feel a little more secure. Just come. Come and find out. There's a nobleman here who wants to see you. The sublime. It was Sylvia, after all, Marius thought, as he relaxed his resistance. If it was Sylvia, he thought he could persuade her somehow. All right, now, you just follow me and I won't hurt you. Marius was mounted on the back of a knight's horse. All right, let's go back. The leader's piercing voice. The group runs as if they are holding the horse with Marius on it. For the inhabitants of the town, it was a momentary, wind-like event. Laughs irresistibly. Those men. Show. They look at each other, panic, keep their mouths shut, and go about their business as if nothing had happened. And the fact is that nothing happened in that peaceful downtown. Only a stray minstrel had vanished. The town's appearance hasn't changed a bit. No. Not really. The pilgrim of Miroku, who had been huddled by the roadside in prayer, rose slowly to his feet. A ray of moonlight spilled from the shadows of the black, deep-covered hood. It was Iris. He's an idiot. As if spitting, he murmured. Then, abandoning his pilgrim's plodding steps, he galloped off in pursuit of the group. At last, true peace has returned to the silent underworld. What? Marius was blinded and looked around. When he came to an empty place, he stopped his horse, covered his eyes with a black cloth and tied his hands behind his back. 
The horse was made to walk again, and they must have walked for about a quarter of a mile. It seems that we have entered some huge building, the cool air and the smell of incense hit my nose. Just as he was thinking that he would not be able to reach the obsidian palace, he was dismounted from his horse, and after being walked a little further with his arms gripped from both sides, he was forced to kneel down, and finally his eye patch was removed. When my eyes became accustomed to the light, I found myself in a large, high-ceilinged room, which I recognized at a glance as the private quarters of a nobleman of very high rank. The lavish furnishings are unified in black, creating a dark and solemn atmosphere throughout. The walls are inlaid with suspicious statues and the pillars have detailed inlays. This is. That's when Marius realized what was happening. Thank you for having me, a low voice said. At the same time, a man stood up and came around from behind a huge desk on the left side of the room. Not Sylvia, of course. But it wasn't Baldur, either. A large man of mature years, wearing a loose toga, with a huge jewel ornament around his neck, and with cruel eyes. He stood in front of Marius with surprising swiftness, his bulky but still fearless body. And... A hand reached out and grabbed Marius by the chin and lifted his face. It was a relentless force. His dark brown, piercing eyes scanned Marius's features. The dark eyes with their cheerful underbelly, the curly hair, the smooth bridge of the nose, the sunburned cheeks, the usually smiling lips. Where are you from? A low but clear voice said. Paro. Kumu, Yulania. Something like that. What the hell is this? Marius almost shouted in frustration. But a man kneeling behind him pulled a rope and silenced him. Answer me, your highness. Ku comes. Where's Kumu? South of here. Near the Paro border. How old are you? 223. I guess I'm older than I look. The other said in an apish, insolent voice. To all appearances, we're not so bad. Please. I'll answer any questions you have. Just tell me. Why am I here, where am I? I see. The older man, ignoring Marius' words, lifted his chin again and stared at him, then withdrew his hand and nodded to himself. There was something in his eyes that Marius had already seen, a light of sullenness. It's true, at first glance she looks like a woman, with a pretty face. Curly hair and red lips. So my foolish niece prefers men like this. I don't care if he's a drifter or a minstrel as long as his face is like a woman's. That's why. Ha. My foolish niece. Ah. It's my brother, Grand Duke Darius. Marius felt a jarring impact. I had a bad feeling about this. However, with his level of skill, he couldn't escape from the group of swordsmen, so there was nothing he could do. Ambitious Grand Duke Darius, that means we're in the Little Moon Palace, I once followed Iris there and she disappeared. Iris called you Grand Duke, so you just came to warn me. That's when I started speculating too much. Turn to me, poet, the Grand Duke said slowly. Don't turn your head when someone's talking to you. Is. Yes. There's no time to relax. Let's get straight to it. Poet. I hear you've fallen in love with my niece, the only princess of Chironia, the Princess Sylvia. Yes, no no such thing. It's no use hiding. I've heard everything. Sylvia has visited your shop many times, and persuaded you to take her as your own. I don't believe the Princess of Chelonia would take a minstrel seriously, no matter how beautiful her face, and she's a rebellious girl. But. Hey, get rid of that nurse. Marius was nodding, rubbing his numb wrists as the rope that had been torturing him was removed from his back. There is a horrible feeling that a huge black cloud is slowly but surely approaching to envelop him. You have hands like a woman's. Hands that can do nothing but pull Kit Terra and play with women. Darius's voice took on an even colder contempt. And... He bends down slightly and pops something in front of Marius. I didn't even have to look inside. A leather bag as big as a grown man's fist, heavily laden with gold dust. You can have it. The Grand Duke said in a low, laughing voice. Take it. Why, sir, do you command me to leave these silence? If so, in the midst of the ominous premonition, 
a mad hope suddenly raised Marius. Originally, they were about to leave the silence. No, it isn't. But the Grand Duke laughed mercilessly. Take it. It'll give you enough to live comfortably for the rest of your life. But in exchange I need you to do one thing for me. Like a snake, Darius chuckled. Marius was frightened and fell back prostrate. But he was spurred backwards. Sylvia. Darius crouched down and whispered in Marius' ear. Take Sylvia in your arms. And tease her. Drown her, in a way no man knows yet. One time, you'll be hooked. Oh, no. Marius gasped. He looked around the room, as if searching for somewhere to escape. Behind him, Darius's swordsmen form a wall, their faces as expressionless as masks. Oh, no. Such a horrible thing to. I'll make sure you get your chance. The Grand Duke continued. It was chasing you to begin with. As for you, a minstrel is bought and sold, not feared. Even the great princess of Chironia is but a dumb little girl once you hold her. Perishable, perishable. Listen. Let him wander to you. Make him lose his mind. Your looks, your bearing, you know how to play with women. Use every secret you have to make her fall in love with you. If you succeed, I'll give you two more bags of gold. Outrageous. With a trembling hand, Marius pulled down the leather bag. There was no need to shake his hands. For his body had been trembling a moment ago with something that he could not control, something that was rising up in him. He did not know whether it was anger, at those who would use him as a tool in this way, or fear of his fate, or a mixture of the two. No way, no way. I am but a minstrel. I cannot do such a horrible thing. Forgive me. Forgive me. Don't worry. I'll take care of everything. Of course, after you've done your business, we'll let you go where you want to go. All you have to do is hold her and take the money. That's not a bad deal. Don't you think? No, no. Please, Grand Duke, please forgive me, forgive me. You're a coward. The Grand Duke clicks his tongue. A man should be glad to hear such a good story. Or are you saying, poet, that your tortured arrows are for sale only to men and are useless to pretty young girls? Marius is being hunted down, bit by bit. He became like a spider, rubbing his body on the floor as if he wanted to disappear into the depths of the earth, desperately thinking about what he should say and how he should cheat his way out of this situation. Say it, poet. Or do you think you're not being paid enough, yeah, you don't know that when you're small like that. Hey, Taos, Tynus, make him look up. Marius, who had been forced to look up, looked up at the Archduke with desperate eyes. I'm 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 making a wish. Please don't. Wish. What? The Don't say that. I'm sorry my niece didn't hate you as much as you hated her. No, no more please, for such a disgusting person like me, such a horrible thing. Very. Let me. Darius jerked up. He's got a tantrum on his forehead. Don't irritate me too much. The Grand Duke said in a shrill voice. I'm a quick-tempered man by nature. Besides, I'd feel nothing for a nameless minstrel or two if you twisted them to death. Marius shuddered as if struck and tried to fall flat. But the swordsmen holding his arms were holding him firmly in place. Slowly the Archduke draws his dagger. He placed the tip in the hollow at the base of Marius' throat. Come on. He said it like he meant it. In reply, Marius's heart was beating so loudly he thought it would burst out of his ears. Marius gasped uncontrollably as he was forced to turn his face away. But he could not cower. I can. Please forgive me. Poet. I told you I'm not a long-tempered man. Forgive me. For calling someone, another another. It is you that Sylvia is in love with. The point of the dagger pierces his throat. It's nothing, I know. Holding Sylvia, talking about love, that's all. That's what you've always done. I can't. Gathering all the courage he could muster, Maria said in a faint voice. Even a minstrel who sells colors cannot deceive a cunning, ignorant girl who knows she will be used as a tool. Forgive me. 
Besides, the princess is your only niece. The Grand Duke slapped Marius on the mouth with the back of his hand. How dare a minstrel teach me the ways of men? Anger flashed in his cruel eyes. Marius panted bitterly again. I'm sorry, but I can't do it. And if I do what you say, you'll never let me live anyway. I'll give up and let you kill me, please don't make me do such a horrible thing. This guy. The Grand Duke bit his lip and stifled his anger. You look like this, but you're an odd one. You know I'm not going to kill you and you're not going to let me get away with it. And, outrageous please. I wouldn't say he's very brave to begin with. Besides, even if I accept, I know I'll be killed when I'm done. Whether you accept or not, nothing good will come of it. Marius's mind was in turmoil and his heart was beating out of his mouth, but he still tried to persuade him. Besides, the princess not that she has any real interest in me to begin with is afraid that the Marquis of Wallstadt's. I know it's true. But I wouldn't have told Demos to rape the Lord's daughter. For all I know, once a dunce gets to know a man, he'll forget all about his previous loves and follow the first one. How dreadful, isn't she your brother's only daughter? Too dreadful for Princess Sylvia. You're annoying. It's not the time to be worrying about others, Darius said coldly. Hey, poet. If you're not going to listen to me no matter what, then I've got a plan. There are only eight days left before the princess chooses her groom. If we press too hard, we'll be too busy preparing to take the princess out. I'm in a bit of a hurry myself, and I may have to do some rough stuff. Why don't you ask her before you do? I'm not going to let you do it anyway. Tell him before he hurts you. It's the smart thing to do. Please kill me, Marius said weakly. Please, just kill me. I can't. It's not that I don't want to, it's that I can't. I can't, I can't trick people, please kill me. You seem to be underestimating the fact that I will never really do it. The Grand Duke stood up slowly. Something awkward hovered over his face. You don't understand how impatient I am. And that I will stop at nothing to get what I want. Taos. The dungeon. Yes, sir. The swordsman said in an impassive voice, trying to get Marius to stand up. I'll be right behind you. For now, give him a little love. Try to change your mind. Yes, sir. Marius defied him. But it was in vain. He was roughly pulled up from both sides and dragged out of the chamber. As he looked at the archduke with despairing eyes, begging for mercy, Marius thought he saw a soft cascade of light in the crack of the door. Then the door closed, and all that remained was to drag him, screaming and resisting, to the dungeon. Uncle. There you are, Octavia, no, Iris. The Grand Duke Darius rests his hand on the toga and looks back. You're still a creepy little bastard. Don't sneak up on people without their knowledge. Is anyone out there? Bring me a leather coat, no matter how dirty. And pants. Yes I'm here. So you finally caught him. Iris leaned heavily against her uncle's desk and said. What are you going to do with this man? It's known. We're going to seduce Sylvia and make her do our bidding. So you've given up on Baldur completely. If he hates you, he won't be able to rule the country even if you marry him. I'd rather have Sylvia in the arms of that poet, expose her, strip her of the throne and make you. Well, I hope it works. I'll make it work. It's my last chance, too, if Sylvia doesn't drown like I think she will. They'll use him as an assassin and make Sylvia disappear. It's the same thing anyway. I'm sorry Mariah, but as long as Sylvia's gone, even if she knows you're a woman, I'd rather join forces with Kumu than be forced to choose Baldur or Laius. A chilling laugh. The Grand Duke seemed startled. Don't be ridiculous. Your mother is a Ulanian. Yes, but not for me. What a dick. Oh well. If it's good enough for Baldur and Laius, it's good enough for Sylvia. We'll talk later. I'm busy. So you're off to torment that poor poet. I don't like the way you're talking to me. You're starting to look more and more like somebody else. To whom? To Julia. She's quiet, she's fragile, 
but she's never flirted with me. I don't think I'm quiet or fragile. Don't talk too much. Now, get out of my way. Poor little thing. Such an insolent coward, a little bird in a good mood as long as it sings, locked up in a cage, beaten and beaten to make it sing. The life of a bard like that is nothing compared to the life of a country like Chironia. Well, I told you it wouldn't work. What if he doesn't listen to me? Kiku. My dungeon is well stocked. You may be more stubborn than you think. It's just extra suffering for him. Now, get out of my way. I'll go. Slowly, Iris said, sliding off the desk. Her long hair swayed softly. The Grand Duke, having dressed, hurriedly turned to leave, and his brow furrowed. Why are you following me? To see. If you think you can protect him, you're wasting your time. I'll make him my trump card. He doesn't know who he is, he doesn't know his connection to me, but Sylvia loves him. He's the perfect assassin. I'll cover for you. Why? I'll cover for you. That's fine. But it's not very pleasant for women and children. I don't want you to faint in front of your men and they find out you're a woman. Don't come. I don't have nerves so weak that I'd faint from mere torture. Uncle, if you're in too much of a hurry and blame that man for killing you, there's nothing you can do. I told her to be careful. Don't hurt your face or your hands or your feet, and don't let Sylvia make you useless. Doll's sister is Doria, huh? What, all of a sudden? It occurred to me that perhaps my uncle and I were alike after all. It's no wonder the bard was such a disaster. He didn't even want Sylvia to fall in love with him in the first place. He's a fool. I've told you so many times to get the hell out of Silen or even Chironia. The rest disappeared into his mouth. The Archduke looked at Iris with a wishful stare. The pale face of Iris was cold and it did not appear that she was even a little disturbed by Maria's pitiful fate. Well, good. The Grand Duke muttered. When you feel weak, remember how your mother died. If you don't lose heart, come with me. They got up and left the room. The dungeons. Like many palaces, fortresses, and the residences of kings, the beautiful little palace standing in the middle of the silence the Little Moon Palace also hid a mysterious and dubious part once one entered it. It is the dark, damp, and bloody face behind the scenes that cannot be seen from the lavish, black and silver front face. Through the hidden door to the dungeons, Archduke Darius and Iris descended a long, dark stone staircase. Gradually, the air began to grow cold and stagnant, and the flickering shadows cast by the lights of the humble candlesticks protruding from the stone walls flickered beneath their feet. A torque runs underfoot, trying to escape from the unexpected figure. Like many dungeons in many palaces, fortresses and towers, the dungeons of the small moon palace of the Silens also harbor foul and bloody histories and memories. If you think about it, Sylvia's stupid daughter fell in love with a man who was convenient for me, Darius says as he walks down the stone steps with care. His voice echoes softly. In Demos, we can't torture him to win him over. Aulis is with him and he has his brother's favor. On the other hand, a novice poet who comes to the silence from who knows where and when is mine to deal with. I suppose he's no stranger to the silence. Probably. Iris suddenly thought of the mysterious leopard-headed warrior, but said nothing about it. After a while, however, by a strange coincidence, Darius himself spoke up about it. That monster you showed me the other day, I hear he got quite a reputation. He defeated Zeno, did you see that, Iris? Yes. What do you mean? It's probably just a clown show with a mask to sell. I don't know. But he was a hell of a warrior. It doesn't matter how great a warrior you are, if you're riding on the brain of a leopard. Darius spat. Has my brother lost his temper? So passionate about something so trivial, he doesn't even know what's going on beneath his feet. But it's a good thing for me that Hazos is dead. Only Hazos could have done that. He's the only one smart enough to know what I'm up to. The Chironians are all fools. Yeah, you might not want to lick it. Think about it. Zeno is just a mass of muscle, Demos is a fool, Robert is blind, and Laius is just a fool with a taste for color. 
Aulus is too old to come out of Anten, and when he does, all that's left is Darcius, Adon, and Almerian, all single-celled warriors. The most tricky one is Empress Mariah. You ought to have been born in Paro, sir. Uncle. Irony, that is. I know all too well that my scheming is child's play among the wily, scheming parrots. But this is Chironia. That's why I've been hiding my true nature and waiting for the right moment. Poor clown, he just happened to jump in there. The poet. You're strangely fond of him. Darius stopped, turned and looked at Iris with dark eyes. You don't mean to tell me, Octavia, that you have a thing for that cowardly male whore. Please don't. Iris seemed to snap out of it. Disgusting. My heart died with my mother when she died. Even if she were still alive, she'd be a pathetic, indecisive, clownish fool. That's a terrible thing to say. So you'd prefer something like the Zeno. I'll turn that down too. Please stop it. I'm never going to fall in love. You know that. Uncle, isn't it only because I'm a man that you can fulfill your ambition? Exactly. We're all in this together. I hope you'll always be aware of that. Darius kept his mouth shut. From behind the heavy door, you can faintly hear the cries of people. Darius raised the small window in the door. It's me. Open. Yes, sir. Immediately, the servants opened the heavy iron doors from both sides. Immediately, what Iris and Darius heard was a muffled groan of pain. Iris narrowed her eyes, looked at the horrible scene illuminated by the dim light of the kettle, and her mouth quirked up a little. The slender, Jolly Bard's body hung limply in the air, his wrists clasped together in a crook. His black curly hair was sticking to his pale face, wet with the sweat of pain, and his black shining eyes seemed to be blind to the fact that Iris had come in. His skinny back, shoulders, and chest, where his clothes had been torn off, were covered with club marks. The black hooded, black cloaked jailer who stood at his feet, grabbing a thin bamboo stick with both hands and beating Marius mercilessly with it, stopped his hands and bowed politely. As you requested, I've given him a good beating. A muffled voice came through. The archduke nodded, stepped over the various devices and implements at his feet, and approached the suspended Marius. Marius nodded his head and breathed heavily on his shoulder. The wound on his right shoulder, which had been reopened by a blow just as it was about to heal, was dripping with blood. Why? No sooner had the Grand Duke said anything than a feeble, almost curse-like moan escaped from the victim's mouth. Why why is this? Well, have you changed your mind? The Archduke stared up and down at Marius, and reproached the torturer. You have a bruise on your cheek. I told you not to hurt my face. Well, good. Well, you've been hurt. You've changed your mind. If you'd have said something sooner you wouldn't have had to go through all this. You, Marius moaned. But when he opened his eyes feebly, he summoned up courage and pleaded. Forgive me, forgive me. Forgive me. I can't. This guy. The Grand Duke's face turned black with anger. Haven't you had enough pain? Hey, Gloss, it looks like your whip was a little soft on him. Don't you resent that? The torturer threw away the bamboo stick. He held in his hand a supple leather whip with sharp spikes planted in it. It had a three-pronged end. When the whip was raised and wrapped around Marius' bare torso with a loud thud, Marius let out a horrible scream. With a single blow, the skin was torn and blood spurted. Marius twisted madly to escape the whip, but it only made the whip hit him more. Hi! Hey, poet! This is just the beginning. The Archduke grabs a handful of curly hair and turns Marius, who has already lost his identity, upside down. I have no use for you if you're too broken. Stop being so stubborn while you're still in one piece. What? Ah. Ah. The whip fluttered in the air with a snap, snap, snap. A bestial scream erupts from Marius' mouth. Dantia, don't do that. All you have to do is say, no, sir, and I'll stop the moment you do. I can I can't do it. I can't. I can't. Please understand, please. Out. 
There's nothing you can't do. You've always done it. Oh. Marius' eyes blurred and blood-colored foam dripped from his mouth. His wrists and shoulders felt as if they would fall out at any moment, but this was nothing compared to the intense pain in his whole body. In his hazel eyes, something golden glowed softly, and that was the only thing that seemed to shine strangely brightly in this dark and bloody room, but he could no longer tell what it was. Ah, ah. Why are you so stubborn? The Grand Duke seemed annoyed. What is there for a lowly man like you to protect? Manners, justice, decency, they are not life-giving things. Vasilian, Vasilian, blood splashing. The moaning increases. Stop and give me. Help me. Splash the water. Marius was dismayed, and a handful of water was poured on him. Grasping his limp chin, the Grand Duke whispered. No need to be stubborn. One word will make you feel better, and you'll see that your body is anything but strong. You're thin, slender. You'll die. Which do you value more, the manipulation of some random girl you don't like or your one and only life? You, you a. Eh? Looks like you're holding up a little better. The Grand Duke has given the signal. Take it down. You don't want to leave too many scars on your body, you'll be naked in your bedchamber. We'll find a better way. Is. The pulley turned just barely, and Marius' wounded and bloodied body fell to the stone floor with a crash. The torturer dragged his emaciated body up and seated him on a chair beside him. It was a stout chair made of stone, to which he was bound by leather belts tightly around his hands, feet, and neck. Marius was tied there, limp and insane. A strong drink is poured into his mouth. Marius groans and opens his eyes faintly. You seem quite overwhelmed, uncle. A chilling voice said. No way. No matter how you look at it, you don't look like you have much guts. You're so skinny and thin. I'll have to kill you if you don't. All you have to do is say the word, and I'll stop. The Grand Duke interrupted in a frustrated voice. If you're gonna talk to me like that, get out. Yes, yes, excuse me. Gross. Is. The torturer rises softly. Burn the needle. Turn it red. The whole scene, Marius was only aware of, like a long, bad dream. Everything is uncertain and wobbly. Even the intense pains that torment your body somehow seem natural, as if they have always been there, and you begin to lose track of where you are, what you are, why you are being tormented, and by whom. In the midst of all this, only a pair of suspicious, black, cold eyes peered at him like a dreamer. Brother upon. Marius, or rather, the forgotten vision of the fourth prince of Paro, Aldine, was screaming at his only beautiful, cold, and profitable brother. I'm sorry, brother. Forgive me not anymore. Dean. Deeply buried bitterness and frustration. In truth, she had always been afraid that her brother did not love her. Ever since the day she was told by her brother's mother that her mother had taken her father away from her by the gossip of the maidservants, she had been afraid that underneath her brother's gentle, quiet, and calm expression, the curse and bitterness against her would always burst forth. Brother. Dean, you're the only one who's gonna stick around, right? Always. Always. Yes, brother why would I leave your side when I have nowhere else to be but by your side? No matter what happens to me. Even if I do something unforgivable, even if I become a sinner. Sins. Brother. It's nothing. Dean, you're my only true brother. If you and I don't trust each other and help each other in this court, we'll be, we'll be fatherless. We're fatherless. Your uncle has a newborn son. We must work together, or we may be exterminated. To whom? Brother, to whom? The world. You don't know that yet, all you have to do is follow me. I'll make sure you're good. So. So you're trying to tell me to stay with you. That was when my brother was sixteen and I was fourteen and a half. The dreaming prince was startled by a sudden rush of reminiscence that he had never remembered before. I wonder what happened to Nerys. What did he say to me? I always believed he was the darling of the court of Paro, that he had never had a bad or a hard time. That night he pleaded with me and clung to me like a man clinging to fire when he is frozen. 
I'd long since forgotten that he, too, had suffered. At the time, he was irritated by my inadequacy, irritated by the lowly blood in me, and it frightened me, wondering when he'd give up on me. I wonder if it was he who was frightened. But why? That pain, the pain of my brother hitting me with a ruler on the back of my hand for neglecting my studies. For so long, I believed I was the lonely one, the insecure one. I wanted to be like him, I wanted to be like him, I envied him. Was it Nerys who was frightened, envious and jealous? Was it Nerys who feared that I would one day go away from him, that I could go away? Loneliness Oracle on. Nerys. Suddenly, a violent slap on the cheek brought Marius back to reality. You still don't know what you're doing. A stern voice said. Before his eyes, a stone wall stained with blood, a shimmering lamp, and the figure of a black-robed torturer spread out. His cramped but dexterous and useful right hand was firmly grasped by the big hand of the torturer. And in the man's right hand, he is holding a long needle with a handle that is bright red and almost transparent. This one's a little tougher. Someone's voice whispers to me. Brother brother. You might not even be able to pull your kit Tara. Now, get over it before it gets too bad. I won't let up until you say yes, no matter what it takes. Brother help me. Get me out of here it's dark here, very dark. I don't want to be here. Take me back to the Marga's palace. Gulp, and one of Maria's fingers is pinched up. The tip of the needle, burnt red, approaches the tip of your toe. Hi. Oh, no. Unbeknownst to Marius, an exclamation came out of his mouth. Daunt daunt. No. No. No, please. So, do you understand? Marius nods his head, rushing about. Archduke Darius looked back at Iris and smiled, a smile of satisfaction on his face. How's that? Well, yeah. Leaning against the wall, coldly he says. Man is what he is. You're a good man, with your body and your gentle spirit. You should be praised. Hold Sylvia and try to make her fall in love with you. The Grand Duke said with satisfaction. Marius is nodding like a dead man. Let him wander in and make him do whatever you tell him. You understand. If by any chance you can't drown her that well, kill Sylvia. That's part of your job. Don't worry. I'll make sure you can escape. The Grand Duke laughed, not even trying to hide the fact that he had no intention of letting him go. Sylvia. I have an order from Lord Nerys. Lorca's low voice. Be sure to fulfill them together, and if you can't, send in the Kaidai assassins. The secret orders of Lord Nerys. For Meyer, Prince of Mongol. Mr. Mire. Mr. Merle, have you fallen asleep? Like a marinia flower, white and innocent, the sleeping face of a fourteen-year-old. Those blue eyes, that will never wake up again, those soft and fleeting smiles. Marius. Hey, Marius. Sing it again. The Swan Song. Hey, Marius. Oh. Marius screams and flails as if he's going to rip off his leather belt. No. No. I can't. What? The Grand Duke's eyes were on fire. You've got to be kidding me. This. I can't. I can't I can't go through that again. I can't. That. I'm not running away. I'll never run away again, poor Mr. Merle, if only I'd had a little more courage at. That time. I would not have let you lay a hand on Lord Mire. You mean this. Luca said this, sure. There's no escape. I will never again, not from Nerys, not from destiny. I should have fought you, brother. I should have protected Mire and defied you. I would never have been free of you otherwise. Aldo Nerys, brother, Lord Crystal, Aldo Nerys. You're wrong. Only I could have taught you that, not to let Mayer die. If only I'd gotten away with him. Wah! Wow. An unbelievable burst of pain. A tremendous pain exploded from the tip of his right hand, piercing and burning his brain. A fierce, beastly scream spurted from Aldine's lips. Oh, you idiot. Two black eyes approaching. 
The Eyes of Evil is it Grand Duke Darius or the brother who betrayed and abandoned him? Do you really have to go through all that pain? I've still got nine fingers left. How about? That's enough, Mr. Mire. I'll sing it to you as many times as you want. As many times as you want, as many songs as you want. So, don't cry anymore, open your eyes. Can't. Marius says in a hoarse voice, not quite human, but clear. I can't. Then his neck snapped forward and he fainted. Just like that, how many hellish hours have passed? Marius couldn't remember anything anymore. He didn't know how many times he had fainted, how many times he had been sprayed with water to bring him back to his senses, where he was, what he was supposed to do, or what was being done to him. He was nothing more than a tattered mass that kept screaming and sobbing. I have no memory of when I was released from further torment or where I was taken and given away. I had no idea what was going on in my body. I had lost the strength to move a single limb, or even to turn over in my sleep. In the feverish heat, the face of a black-haired, beautiful, cold face with absorbing black eyes, the face of a blonde boy with gentle blue eyes, the face of a strange torturer, like a demon, peering at him, comes at Marius in turn. Each time, he screamed as Dean or Marius, called out his name, stretched out his hand, and was tormented by a ghost that vanished in a flash. One day, in a strange vision of a feverish head, he became an assassin in his own right, and fought off the other's desperate attempts to restrain him, and choked Sylvia. When the screaming, struggling girl's body lay limp and breathless, he was relieved that he could live, but in the next moment, in his hand, what should have been Sylvia had been replaced by the corpse of the frail and dull Prince of Merle. Lord Mire. Marius feverishly tries to revive the boy, breathing in through his lips and rubbing his chest for repeated artificial respiration. In the darkness of despair, he knew that one day he would have to die if he could not bring the boy back to life. Mr. Merle. Mr. Mirail, if there is anything in the world that is innocent, it is you. A world that has never killed, hurt, maltreated, hated, or fought, that even in death has quietly disappeared like a flower being folded, a world that can't even keep alive or make happy the one innocent thing in the world. The world that can't even make the one innocent thing in this world alive and happy, get lost. You don't deserve to live. All that mattered, Mr. Merle, was you. You were all I had. I'm just as guilty as you. I was the only one who could have saved Lady Mira, but I didn't. I let the assassin into the palace. Oh, just as I killed you with my own hands. Lord Miael, Lord Miael. My hands are wet with blood, too. In blood. When you're trying so hard to come back to life. The boy moaned faintly. Her chest rises and falls unsteadily. With a start, Marius shook the boy selflessly. And. The boy's eyes widened. Her skin is so white it's almost white, but there's a hint of blood. He's come back to life. Meyer, my lord. Meyer, my lord. A crazy joy rose up in Marius, and he thought that it had all been a long, bad dream, that he had been sleeping beside Meyer in the peaceful palace of the Golden Scorpion in Mongol, and that he had been having bad dreams, I had been sleeping beside Meyer in the peaceful palace of the Prince of the Golden Scorpion in Mongol, having bad dreams, I thought with a sense of relief and emotion that brought me back to life. Thank God. Miss Merle is alive. Nothing bad has happened. I was in between. I don't need position or rank or country or anything. It wasn't too late for me to know. I'll take Mire and leave here. We'll live together in secret forever. I'll let Eunice come if he'll follow me. I will protect you with my own hands and make you happy and bring you back to health. I'll build a little hut in the woods and leave the two of us alone turning our backs on the strife and wars of nations and the miseries of the world. Mr. Merle, Marius is Mr. Merle's. Yours forever and ever. This sword, which has never been offered to anyone, is now, once again, yours, so smile for me. To this Marius who loves you, come on, let's go out together. Mr. Mire. 
The boy raised himself gently and held out his hand to Marius. I wanted to hug her tight little body. And Marius stood still, the eyes of a boy looking at him. It no longer had the gentle blue-green color of the rosary flower, but in exchange. The color black in the night, with an unfathomable sparkle, bewitching, absorbing. And his lips moved slowly and called to him, Dean. What? Dean yelled. Suddenly, a feeling of intense fear and disgust came over me. The thought of seeing the smile of the dead that comes to life, stands before you, and beckons you. Dean, what's wrong? It's me. I've been worried sick. You leaving so suddenly broke my heart, what wrong I've done. Come home. You're another prince of the house of Paro. There's no place for you but in the crystal. You. Ah. A cry rises in my throat. You're lying. It's a lie. It's a lie. Lies. What? Are you lying, Dean? What's wrong with you, Dean? Just tell me. He used to say so. He would take his brother's hands in his smooth, ivory-white ones, and look at them anxiously and wishfully, never letting him see the anger, the frustration, the annoyance that he must have felt inside. Always, at all times, his brother's voice was gentle, patient, enveloping, trying to win Dean over. Come to think of it, I don't think he ever knew what his brother was really thinking or feeling, even though he lived with him for ten years. Don't be fooled, Dean said in anger. Never again will I be deceived by your gentle smile or your meek voice. That's how you signed the order to assassinate Mireille. That's how you mocked Amneris and made him kill his brother while you held his sister in your arms. A horrible, a horrible man. We all knew that's what some people said. That your nature belongs to the darkness, but I didn't believe it. I didn't want to believe it. You're my only brother now, my only brother in heaven and on earth. My only brother who lost his father and mother, and you killed Mireille. Without even getting your hands dirty. It's worse than getting your own hands on him. You never saw the man you killed. You're proud of your intelligence, not knowing what a small, kind-hearted child you've killed. Yes, it may have saved Paro's life. But, but what about Paro? What about the rebirth of the house of St. Wang? Compared to the life of one innocent boy, what's the rebirth of Paro? If Paro couldn't break free of Mongols' yoke without the death of that sweet boy, if that's the case, I'll destroy him with my own hands a thousand times over. I will destroy Paro with my own hands. I won't let you kill him even if you make the whole world your enemy. Even if even if. Aldine hesitated. Aldo Neris looks at his brother in silence, his lips twitching slightly as if he were wondering. He looks like a beautiful statue. Dean knew that his words, his grief, his tears, had not moved him in the slightest. He was as immovable as death itself. As long as he couldn't move, Dean had no choice but to yield. Always, always, it was. He always tried to stay out of the way, to stay out of the way of his brother, to stay out of the way of the Kitera, to stay out of the way of his brother, to stay out of the way of his brother. She was afraid that she would not be loved by her brother, the only two people in the world. I wonder what Nairis saw in me, Aldine thinks. It's true, Nairis loved him. But it was that love that hurt Dean. Nairis, who had always been so kind, so loving, so patient with everyone else, always hid a secret anger and frustration, but only with Dean. He didn't raise his voice when he hit me hard. For your own good, Dean, that's what he said. Because I want you to follow me. But I'm sorry. Forgive me. He said it with such tenderness, such sadness in his beautiful eyes. A piece of memory I had forgotten. At the time, my brother was already an honors student at the Royal Academy. When he came home and found him neglecting his studies and playing the Kit Terra in the garden with the servants boys, he quietly ordered the dean to come to his room. He was frightened and followed him like a sheep to the slaughterhouse, but his brother still ordered him to give the Kithra to him, and with his pliant hands, which were fine and crisp but had a strange power, 
he snapped it and threw it into the fireplace. I watched my first kithra turn to ashes in a flash. And the pain. The ruler against the back of his hand, the skin torn, the blood flowing. My brother bit his lip and stared at Dean. Those eyes that sucked you in. You don't understand, Dean. We don't have a father. It's my duty to raise you to be a worthy lord of Paro. No more Kithra. You're too much of a Kithra girl. You got it, Dean. Yes. Brother. Was it, was it jealousy? Of Kidera, who occupies Dean's mind more than his own. Dean, our father is our uncle's brother, the eldest son of the Holy Kings. He should have been the Holy King of Paro. But he stepped down. Fearful of the flesh and blood feud between him and his uncle and the civil war that would unravel in Paro. The kingdom of Paro was split in two, one for your father and one for your uncle, and the two armies were already encamped, ready to turn the crystal into a battlefield, when your father was told to give up his throne to your uncle and become the chief priest of Janus. You see, Dean, your father saved Paro from the brink of civil war. And out of gratitude to him, your uncle promised that his son would be the crown prince. But. Promise was not kept. Now who can remember such a trifle of the past? Now that we have no father and our mother is hidden away, we are naturally supposed to be our brother's children and our brother's children's subjects. No, it's not that I don't like it. But I feel that you and I, as your father's children, must grow up to be respectable adults. And for that, as your brother, I have a responsibility to you. Oh, Dean, please understand. Alexander's book is more important than the Kithra. There will be time for the Kithra when the world is settled and what needs to be done is done. So for now, just for now. When Dean saw the tears in his brother's eyes, he was moved to the depths of his soul. I made him cry, he thought, and he hugged him. I'm sorry, sir. It won't happen again. I swore. Please forgive me. Brother I won't do it again. So, so don't hate me. How could I not like you? I'm saying this for your sake. I say this for you, I love you, Dean. You're my only brother. Brother on. As he had promised, he tried as much as he could not to show Nerus his sympathy and interest in Kidera, in song, and in servants. But even so, he could not find anything interesting in the military and political teachings of Alexander, or in the history of the world as taught by O. Tang Fei. All he could think of was that Elena was crying in the corner of the kitchen because her boyfriend Yuri had gone back to Karavaya, or that the gardener Garu had told him that three lovely chicks had fledged in the nest of the caramu bird in the garden. Why didn't it work out? I worshipped you and you loved me. Why did I let myself be driven to this point? Is it me or Nerys who's at fault? Were we always two people with bad luck with the stars? Was it me, the lonely star, who made the prince of Seria lonely? Was it he who stole the boy Mayer from the kind-hearted bard? Send Mayer to, one day. In Marius' hand was a sword, which he had drawn at some point. Dean. You're gonna put a sword in my hand. Aldo Nerys whispered, as if he were amused. You think you can kill me? Sure, go ahead. I'll let you kill me any time you want. Here. A white hand relaxed the collar of the toga, and a throat and breast smoother than a woman's and more lustrous than a woman's were revealed to him. Dean, come on. Don't, don't call me that. I'm Marius. I'm Marius. Give me Meryl, you evil bastard. I do. I love you, don't I? Shut up, ew. Marius Dean Marius picks up his sword and slams his body into Nerys. Nerys did not resist. The sword dug into his smooth flesh, and with a blow he fell there irresistibly. Brother. Nerys is dying with a calm, even faint smile on her face. Dean, trembling with rage, gazed at the sword in his hand, at the beautiful black-haired god of beauty who had fallen, at his own bloodied hand. I did it, I killed him. Nerys I did it with my own hands. I hate you, Nerys. Meyer's revenge. 
Brother my, Lord Nerys, Rena was screaming somewhere, Lord Nerys, Lunan, Lygia, Linda they tried to run at him, but Dean drove them away with his sword, which was wet with Nerys blood, and then he threw it away and embraced his brother's body, don't touch him, no one touches you, you're mine, he's mine, too, hey, I told you to get a grip, Marius Marius, my brother, Marius, quickly, consciousness was coming back, violent, unremitting pain, at the same time, overwhelming the whole body, you, ah, you okay, here, here's your drink, Marius gasped, it's a room in a dark underground stone prison, above his eyes, there was a golden waterfall shining brightly, and a pale, beautiful, troubled face wrapped in it. You, or, are you okay? You've been having terrible, terrible nightmares. No wonder. Oh. Marius finally began to feel a little more at ease as a strong drink was poured on his lips. Sow. I'm beat up, man. I'm all torn up. I'm having a nightmare. What did I say? Brother, brother, he called me. That's all. Brother, I'm sorry. Oh, slowly, very slowly, you are pulled back to reality. The pain and weakness that tormented his whole body to the point where he could not even say what was wrong with him was unmistakably real. I in my dreams. In the dream, I can clearly see the soft touch of the sword that gouged my brother's white chest, and even the color of the blood that spurted out, all over my body. Did I want to kill him? Why don't you ask me why I'm here, poet? Oh no, Marius said weakly, feeling terribly dizzy. Because you were in league with Grand Duke Darius. The Archduke wants me to seduce Princess Sylvia into relinquishing her throne, or else he'll kill her and install you on the throne of Che Iron as the rightful crown prince of Che Iron and his puppet. And for that, he needs me, a non chironian with no ties to the Chiron court. His heart ached to speak so much he had to gasp for every word. Iris looked at him carefully. You're like a parrot. How did you get that far? I know that much. That's why I told you to get the hell out of the silence. I didn't think. I didn't think there were people in Chironia who would conspire like that, like. Paro. Everywhere there are men with ambition. And some want revenge. Sylvia I feel sorry for you. When you're worried about other people, poet. Iris said, somewhat annoyed. My uncle is a vindictive man who will stop at nothing to get his way. You'll die either as Sylvia's assassin or here, in this dungeon, where your uncle will condemn you to death. I'm not, I'm not an assassin. Marius gasped. Don't underestimate my uncle. I'm risking my life just to be here. He'll do whatever it takes to get you to do what he wants. I'm not going to be an assassin. There are things in this world that don't always go your way and your uncle is. About to find out. So you want me to stay here and be tortured to death? I don't have a choice. If you insist on doing. That. I can't I can't help it. Why do you keep giving up? Iris said wildly. That's what happened last time. Why don't you fight to live? Why the rush? Is your life so cheap? You make me nervous. I'm not giving up. I'm not going to be a assassin. And I'm not going to hold Sylvia. So, why? Iris's voice is sharp. It's your life. You have to protect it. Do you understand that? If you think I'm gonna let you get away with this, if you think I'm gonna. I didn't see it. Marius moaned in pain. I'd rather die than be an assassin. I can't kill anyone. Not again. Just know what it looks like, and give yourself a chance to escape. You're an idiot. I'm sure. Marius smiled breathlessly. But I can't help it. There are things you can do and things you can't do. I don't want to see someone die for me again. My weakness, my cowardice, my. I don't want to see you die of love. So I, I have no choice. I, I have to die. I wanted to die more comfortably, but that's okay. It'll be easier when I stop breathing. 
Next time I'm born, I'll be a little bird singing in the treetops. Why? Iris's bright eyes dimmed in self-doubt and anxiety. But with that conversation, Marius had already exhausted all his strength and had closed his eyes again. Did you sleep? Poet, is that so? Iris whispered. Then he murmured in a muffled voice and patted Marius' hand. I've been torn to pieces like this. And still why? I don't know. I, I look so weak and helpless, as if I could be brought to my knees with the snap of a finger. Why why do you? Why do you? Marius. Suddenly, as if afraid of what he was about to do, hesitantly, hesitantly, Iris looked around. Then he bent down and put his lips to Marius. As if an electric current ran from the point where they touched, their cheeks blushed, and they rushed out of their prison. Her long, golden hair swayed softly. The door slammed shut, and Marius's eyes opened. What? He panted and wheezed and murmured, somewhat uneasily. What is that now? I don't think so, Iris, she gave me. But that was. I'm not kidding, he's a guy. Well, she's beautiful too, beautiful to be a man. But, why did Iris find me? But the pain and weakness that came upon him were too much. He ceased to think and fell into a languid and muddy sleep. Chapter 3 Under the Hand of Saria Obsidian Palace The Hundred Dragon Chief I heard someone calling out to me. Dear Hundred Dragon Chief. Where are you? Chief Hayakuryu. Here. Standing up slowly, Gwyn replied in a thick voice. It's Baba. Sir, I've been looking for you. General Senin wants to see you, the Hundred Dragon Chief. Lord Xenon. Gwyn handed the reins over to Horse Cho. I'll be right there. Thank you, Ron. I'd love to, but I don't think I can handle this horse. He's too heavy for me to put on a helmet. I'd ruin it. Take it back to the stable. I'm sorry, sir. It's not your fault. You must have been very heavy. Take good care of him. I'll choose another one for you, so please come back the day after tomorrow. Thank you. Gwyn put back on his light cloak and walked from the stable into the hall. A large man, half a head taller than Gwyn, a twenty-year-old hero of terror and blood, Xenon, stood there, his red hair fluttering. This is, Lord Zeno. Were you torturing the horses? Did you find a good horse? No. I guess I'm too heavy for you, but you must be in great trouble without your horse. Even more so if it's a war. What is Zeno doing here? He's in the chariot. Two horse chariot. But. H.M. Gwyn pondered. The horses in Chironia seem to be a little smaller in general. There were horses in the meadow that I could ride. I'll fetch one from the meadow. I'm sure the king will be pleased. I've been thinking, Zeno. I'm just a hundred dragon chief and you're a general. You will not be treated so well. They were walking side by side down a corridor lined with pillars towards the direction of the main palace. Gwyn and Xenon when the two of them stand side by side, it's an impressive sight. The red-haired half-breed and the leopard-headed super-warrior both have physiques far beyond that of normal people. The two of them looked as if they had been born to fight. The broad shoulders, the thick chest, the stout neck, the slim waist, the strong and powerful limbs, first of all, there is not one man in ten thousand in this world who does not feel himself too shabby and miserable in front of these two men. No, Master Gwyn, you are the greatest warrior who ever lived and you are far older than I am. As a warrior, I think it is only natural that I should pay my respects to a superior warrior. So, what do you want? Ha! Ah. With an admiring eye, Zeno looked over at Gwyn's wonderful muscles from shoulder to arm, which were higher than his own. His Majesty has summoned you in secret. Your Majesty. Yes, sir. He asked me not to tell His Excellency, Darcius, so he sent me. Okay. He's not even close to being able to change his ways. I'll be right there. Lead the way. What's going on? I thought so, sir. Xenon said, his blue eyes shining like the sky. I wonder how you train your muscles to be like this. My muscles are strong, but yours are supple. 
That allows you to move faster. Perhaps you'd like to teach me some swordplay sometime. Whenever you're ready. Xenon smiled happily. Then he turned into a boy's face. As they walked along, all the courtesans and military officers who passed by turned and gazed at them with open mouths. They were two living statues that were worth seeing. Entering the opulent inner hall, Zeno led Gwyn through a gate normally reserved for only the most high-ranking nobles to the emperor's private chambers at the far end. The emperor Achilles' tastes are simple and arrogant. In fact, the first and second circles are more opulent in appearance. But the well-kept and clean main hall was pleasant. Oh, here we go again. The emperor of Chironia, who had come to meet him on his own, saw this and gave a low cry. Looks like Balbus and Silenus came along for the ride. It's impressive. The two warriors knelt on the stone floor in silence. The emperor was alone. He didn't even have a maid. In his cramped living room there was only a simple chair and desk, a huge jeweled globe, a map of Chironia and a magnificent marble statue of Janus the Twelve. The emperor wore a loose toga with a fur girdle, and looked somewhat pale. I'll have a drink brought to you later. Well, Gwyn. Have you become accustomed to my court? Thanks to you, all is well. You cough a lot. You don't seem to be good at using honorifics. Don't be so hard on yourself. I don't care about formalities. The great king of Zhong Yuan, who was known for his wisdom, laughed. I have asked you to come here today in secret for two reasons. The first is that, in due course, I will make a formal request that, after this ceremony, you leave Darcius and join my king's guard to protect me. Yes, sir, Gwyn said. What do you say we start tomorrow? No, it's not that. As you can see, when you've been here for so short a time and are so skilled, some people fear that you might be an assassin. I know you're no such thing, but after the ceremony, the electors will return to the front of the country. At that time, I will ask you to lead 200 men as the commander of the King's Guard Battalion, but please keep that in mind. I understand. No fear, no trepidation, no flattery. Achilles muttered. That's exactly the right attitude. Depending on how things go, I'm planning to ask you to lead an army as commander of the King's Guard and eventually as general. I'm just a kid who's been around the block. No. Hazos, Margrave of Langobard, was a counselor like no other. In all of Chironia, we have fewer wits than we have heroes. Losing Hazos was a terrible blow but you must be mistaken if he believed in you like he did. I believe in Hazos. I can't be indebted. Gwyn slowly pulled his sword out of its scabbard. He held out the hilt of his sword to the emperor and fell to one knee. I've only been here a month. He said gravely. Wherever I have been, I have been called a monster and shunned, but Chironia has accepted me and treated me well. In order to repay my debt to Chironia, I will work as your loyal knight. I got this sword. Impressed, Achilles said, he drew his sword and lightly placed the flat of it on Gwyn's shoulder. Let this be my homeland, my resting place, brave Gwyn. Then the great emperor returned the sword to Gwyn, made him stand up, and told him and Xenon to sit down. The other thing is that Hazos. I'll keep saying it. There's a rumor going around the court, Gwyn, you were told by Hazos that he's been keeping some kind of secret from Chironia. Gwyn is silent. Since you didn't reveal it to Darcius, Mariah, or Deimos, I've heard that you've been targeted by assassins several times, even in just the last two days. That's what I'm talking about, quick ears. Gwyn tweeted. It is the court of Chironia. But I'm sure you'll open up to me, the emperor of Chironia, even if it is you. What if I... Zeno sat down in the middle of the room and looked as if he wanted to sit down, but the emperor stopped him. What do you think, Gwyn, the hundred dragon chief? No. A very clear and unobtrusive voice. I don't say. What? Achilles' eyes flashed. Why? Why not? I am the lord of Chironia, you know. How? And now, my only lord, canst thou not tell thy master? Now, just now, with the mouth that offered the knight's sword. I can't, no, I can't. And why is that? I can't say. This guy. The emperor was on the verge of retorting, 
but he decided against it. Is there any reason why I shouldn't tell you? How? What the hell is that? Tell me why, and I'll tell you all about it. Do you keep everything to yourself, you? I hope you'll forgive me. Somebody. Achilles took a heavy paperweight from his desk and toyed with it. Because I'm about to accuse a serious and unexpected person. Isn't that right, Gwyn? For which, however, there is not yet sufficient evidence. You can't even say that. When the time is right. What if the time is not right and Chironia is in danger? Do you think you're a yarn, that you can carry the fate of Chironia in your breast and your sword, Gwyn? I'm not conceited, but I can't say. Now, while with your mouth you apologize for the hospitality of Chironia, with your hands you bring danger to Chironia, you. In any case. Slowly Gwyn went. Danger is always lurking beneath our feet, and sometimes the most correct thing to do is not to know. And when you don't know where the arrow is coming from, avoiding it will cost you your life. The arrows they are shot, are they not? I'm not gonna say anything. Xenon. The emperor threw the paperweight on the floor. Cut him down. He may be too brave, but he relies on himself too. Much. A man like him would upset the king's prestige and the control of the entire army. Cut him down. Forgive me, your majesty. Zeno threw out his sword in a panic, jumped to his feet and fell flat on the floor. I am not a match for you. Besides, Gwyn will not be defeated. Cut him down. I can't. If you let him live, he'll make a mess of things. It's a shame, but it's for the good of Chironia. Forgive me, your majesty. Zenon's eyes grew desperate. He crept up and grabbed Achilles by the waist of his toga. Lord Gwyn must have a very good reason for doing what he did. I beg you to change your mind. Why, Zeno? His presence frightens away the name of the bravest man in your court. This is the man who defeated you. My inability to do so is unavoidable. Your Majesty, this Zenon, Gwyn. I admire your skill and your character. I cannot bring myself to raise my sword. Well. Xenon. The great emperor looked down at the prostrate young general thousand dogs and burst out laughing. Xenon likes Gwyn, too. Yes, sir. I'm at your service. Darcius, Hazos, Demos, and now Xenon. Emperor Achilles made Xenon stand up and stared at Gwyn, who stood there without moving a muscle. Zeno says, did you really think I wouldn't let a man as brave as you die? You're a hateful little fellow. No. I didn't think anything of it, Gwyn said. The emperor slowly began to walk around the chamber. I've never met a man like you, he says as he slowly walks around with his hands behind his back. I've seen a lot of heroes, great men, wise generals, and great generals. I think I have a good eye for people. But there's never been anyone like you. No, it's not because of your otherness. Your confidence, your composure, it's too strong, too big. If I'm truly a judge of character, the only thing I should do immediately is kill you. Darcius, Hazos, Zeno, the pillars of my camp. And he eats them all up in a few days at a glance. Zenon, who knows nothing but loyalty to me and boasts of his own valor, has come to my defense and saved my life. That's strange. I doubt it. I'm sorry I'm sorry. Shut up about that, Zeno. I've been thinking. This, however, may be the greatest gamble of my reign, even greater than the Chironian crisis. It may turn out to be a good thing or a bad thing. If I may, your majesty. You don't understand, Zeno. I'm afraid I'm going to have to bet on you. What? Whether you are worthy of the sword he has given you, whether you are more popular than this leopard. If I am not what you think I am, Xenon, he may take over Chironia. I don't think. No, not with malice, nor with an army. It's a single, unhurried movement of the finger. If I were an emperor who could not use him, then Chironia would fall. So, at his age, Achilles Chironius must return to his roots. Well, good. Achilles the Great began to chuckle. Hey, leopard. All right. Then do as you please. 
I don't ask. Do you know what this means? I've given you Chironia. Gwyn silently took up his sword, half pulled it out of its scabbard, and with a flash of lightning, struck it with his sword. It was the pledge of a warrior. E.I., you're an utterly, disgustingly arrogant bastard. The emperor started to laugh out loud. I've never seen such an arrogant, rude man in my fifty-odd years of Achilles' life. Well, good. Hey, leopard, tell me. Is there anything you need? No troops, no money. A sign of freedom. What's this Sinan? Xenon is too obvious. Slowly, Gwyn said. Your men will make it. I've picked out the best ones for you. You don't need money. But, say what you will. After all, it is the fate of Chironia that is at stake. One thing, please. What? Say whatever you want. After this, word by word, carefully delineating each word, he said. No matter how much trouble there may be in the court, no matter how many crooks may be crawling around, no matter how many riots may be going on, keep a very tight guard. And don't let them catch you or steal your secret documents. What the? For the first time. The emperor's eyes shone truly brightly. What did I say? Gwyn. Keep your voice down. Gwyn went to the emperor's side. Perhaps the anniversary ceremony will be a mountain to climb. Until then, remember that water leaks from good hands. And don't move lightly on rumors or tip-offs. And again. There is something unusual going on in the court, he said, and I want to make sure that as many people as possible don't find out about it. Okay. Slowly the great emperor said. Do you understand, Zeno? You understand. If there's a bogeyman, don't let him catch you. You must follow it and lose it just in time. What what? Is. It's just not. Gwyn is slowing down. How are you feeling, your majesty? What? A few days to go, said the Marquis of Langobard, and I hope you won't be too ill before the ceremony. His majesty was worried. His majesty's health, I'm afraid, is not good. Gwyn. The great emperor interrupted. Okay. Enough. Gwyn bows his head in silence. Achilles looked at it with suspicious, smoky eyes. Gwyn. What's going on inside that leopard head of yours? I'd like to take a look. I'm afraid so. What else? Nothing. Then I'll give you one. The great emperor raised his eyebrows. If anything should happen to you until the ceremony, who will? No one. This subordinate. Thor of Atkia. I know nothing. So you're going to do this all by yourself, are you? You've got some nerve. All over the court there are men with ulterior motives, men with darker intentions, who want to stalk your life, steal your secrets or silence you. Well, no one can kill you with a sword, but there is poison, accidents, and all sorts of tricks. I can take care of myself. I have always done so, and I will always do so. Okay. Then there's nothing more, is there? Probably. Achilles waved his hand lightly. It was a signal to leave. Xenon is a little bit of this now. Is. Gwyn kept quiet, bowed politely, for him, and turned to leave. Then, as if it had occurred to him, Achilles called out. Gwyn. You said you had no memory of where you were born, but do you even remember? Londok, he said. I don't know if it's true or not. Landlocked. Achilles thought for a moment. And then he said, You have offered me a sword. And if that Chironian should one day put a sword to your homeland? What will you do, Gwyn? I, I will suffer. It was a calm answer. I came to Chironia with a dream oracle that told me to go to Chironia and become a mercenary of Darcius. Now I have no choice but to work for Chironia, believing it to be the right path for me. If it should come to pass that I should avenge my true homeland, then I will either leave Chironia, or I will dust my homeland with my own hands, or, failing either, I will fall on my sword, myself and my people, that is also the will of Yarn. I believe in Yarn. Okay. Go ahead. But one more thing. How am I, as Lord, in your eyes? 
Is it unpleasant for you to work for me? Not even a little. I thought you were still the lion-hearted emperor of Chironia, Gwyn said with a smile. And he bowed and left. Achilles stares thoughtfully at the door. Then he starts to chuckle. What do you think, Zeno? First of all, I've never heard a man speak to me so insolently and rudely. It's hard to tell which one of us is king or emperor. I'm sorry, sir. Idiot. What's wrong with you? I've picked up a hell of a lot more than I ever thought I would. Okay, Zeno. Do me a favor, will you? Is. Go to the Temple of Cassis and meet the head of the temple, Castor, in private. The chief physician of the court, Castor. Yes, sir. Do not let anyone see you enter the inner sanctum. And take this. The emperor went to his desk and began to write something. Give this to Mr. Castor so that he and his lieutenants can take care of it after we leave. I want you to hand them over. Yes. Hurry up. Yes, sir. There was something awkward and tense in the Obsidian Palace. The funeral of the Marquis of Langobard has also been postponed until the end of the ceremony, because it would be bad luck to cast a dark shadow before the splendid ceremony. The preparations for the large-scale ceremony and feast were being made, and the early envoys from various countries were beginning to arrive. There was something gloomy about it. Or perhaps it was because the people of the court were well aware that the 19th birthday celebration of the Princess Sylvia, which was to be held two months before the 30th anniversary of her accession to the throne, was to be the occasion for announcing the princess's groom, and that the princess herself was in a state of agitation over her prospective groom. Prince Lai of Danae it was probably because she knew very well that the princess disliked both the Duke of Danae and the Viscount of Baldur, who were candidates for the bridegroom, and that the princess was in a quarrel with Demos, the Marquis of Wallstad, who had a wife and child. This, given the princess's temperament, might not end without some sort of uproar, and this thought made people both amused and anxious. Among them, Gwyn is no different from the rest of us. It was already known throughout the court that he was in possession of some great secret connected with the assassination of the Marquis of Langobard, and yet his manner did not change in the least. He just does his daily work quietly, and does not allow any assassin to come near him, even if he sneaks up on him every night to kill him. Gwyn. Rather, it was Thor of Atokian who was worried and upset. No offense, but you got to get Daniel away from me. With him around, I can't help but wonder if you're getting cold feet today. Did you get any evidence? No, but we already know he's an idiot. Sometimes you just have to keep him close at hand. I know you're a spy. I just want to know who the hell you are. Of course. Baldur's. That's why I don't know anymore. Gwyn recounted to Thor that Daniel had gone into the chambers of Laius, Marquis of Danae. Thor's eyes rolled back in his head. Rayos, those two, more than anything else, are the ones whose interests don't match up, the ones who are unlikely to join forces even in death. So, either Daniel is acting as a double agent, or... Or... I would not be surprised if Laius and Baldur were to join forces. If there are more serious enemies out there. For example, Iris, if she became aware of the existence of the Prince of Chironia, which would overturn the question of which of the two would succeed to the throne of Chironia as the son-in-law of the princess. But Gwyn doesn't say a word. He doesn't say a word, sure or not, but he keeps it to himself, waiting for the right moment. Preparations for the ceremony and feast were steadily underway, and the elite of the Twelve Knights were sent out in turn to practice the march for the Grand Review ceremony. But, you heard the man, General. It was Thor who brought about the rumors in the first place. His Majesty, Achilles, is not well. How much? Oh. I don't know what it is but I've been sick for a day or two. But he won't cancel the ceremony at all costs. I wonder what's wrong. I've never heard of His Majesty getting sick in thirty years. Hmm. This morning, come to think of it, it seems that Archduke Darius was out for the morning review training instead. I think I've been poisoned by someone. Don't say that. Tell Daniel what you told me as soon as you can. Two. Thor looked at Gwyn with a frown. Okay. He grinned and nodded. 
It seemed that Thor had gotten around well, and had become quite friendly with Daniel. Gwyn watched in silence as Thor spoke to Daniel with an air of entitlement. But when Daniel sneaked out of the room late that night, he thought no one had seen him, but in fact Thor of Adokaya, whom Gwyn had convinced to follow him, had already followed him. Daniel, unaware of what was happening, quietly slipped into Viscount Baldur's room, came out a few moments later, and disappeared into the Marquis of Danaeus quarters. That guy. I knew it. He's a two-timing jerk. And Thor went back to his room to report it, but Gwyn wasn't in his room in bed. He's nowhere in the dormitory. Hey, where's the hundred dragon chief? He said he was going out for some fresh air. Alone. When? It was about a quarter of a century ago. Hmm. Thor of Atkia nodded his head. Careless. Or do you have something on your mind? There's no need for me to worry about such a strong demon like him. Thor decided to do so, and quickly crawled under the covers to fall asleep. Gwyn and Daniel didn't come back. At that time, Gwyn, there is a figure that has risen from the darkness. We were in a small pavilion in the inner garden. He wore a mage's cloak and black clothes and was tall. You must be Iris. I'm glad you came. How did you know it was me? Oh. Look at the throwaway sentence. Gwyn quietly slides into the pavilion and closes the door. Bold. The court is on high alert these days because of his majesty's absence. If they find you, you may not be able to escape. Achilles is sick. Iris has flipped her hood. It reveals a pale and well-groomed face. Is that true? Don't you know? I've been sick since this morning. He hadn't been feeling well for a couple of days and this morning the chief physician, Castor, was called. He said it was probably just a cold. Stupid. Iris said solemnly. He's been poisoned. Of course they did. It's not you, is it? Ha. Huh? Of course. How can I lead the lords without an emperor who recognizes me as the crown prince? My uncle is completely rejected by the lords. Otherwise he wouldn't have bothered to appoint me. He'd be plotting his own way to the throne. Since the incident with Empress Mariah years ago, which was known to everyone except the emperor, he has been turned away by all the twelve electors and twelve divine generals. I see. Who? We have to stop this. At least until the end of the ceremony. Don't worry. We've already got a team of doctors on board. How do we know it's the doctors? Well, okay, then my uncle will take care of it. You were with the Grand Duke, were you not? That's right. Why? The Grand Duke was at the reviewing exercises this morning as the Emperor's unofficial representative. I'm sure the Grand Duke was especially aware of this. I'm sure he's got a lot of things he wants to keep from me. It's not like he and I trust each other one bit. A fox and a raccoon. What a silly thing to do. You say that, Gwyn. For foolish men, it's a lifelong ambition. That's not what I meant. I was saying that it's silly for allies to become suspicious of each other by hiding things that are immediately obvious to the casual observer. You don't seem to have the same moral compass as the rest of us, Gwyn. Iris said, a little intrigued. That doesn't mean I'm not as vile and selfish as Baldur. What is the ultimate loyalty that drives you? Yarn I guess. Do not let fate. You can't make me look like that. That's exactly what Yarn would do. You didn't call me out in the middle of the night to ask me that question. Gwyn softly digressed. I thought you had something to do with this. Oh. Iris' expression changed. He suddenly became restless, bit his lips, brushed his hair, adjusted the collar of his cloak, and coughed. What's wrong? Noah. Iris is terribly hesitant. Gwyn didn't try to help or make it easier for him to talk. He stood silently, waiting for Iris to cut him off. All oh, that. He hesitated for a moment, and then suddenly Iris spoke up. Marius. What about Marius? Help me. Do it please. What's wrong with Marius? You're not my friends, are you? Very much so, but I haven't seen him in a while. What's wrong with him? My uncle, well. Iris clammed up. But suddenly, he regained his composure. I'm sorry, Gwyn. 
My uncle has him locked up. He's been torturing him for the last three days, trying to get him to listen to me, to be my assassin for Sylvia. He refused to say no, and my uncle became very stubborn. If you don't, they'll blame you and kill you if you're my friend, you're. He looked at her as if to ask, what about you, and Iris froze. I've I've stopped. He says it as if he's panting for conscience. At first I tried to get him away from my uncle, even though I knew he would scold me. For warning him. But he wouldn't listen to me. All my life I've been telling him to get the hell out of the silence because nothing good would come of it. I, I tried to think of my mother's suffering as a small matter before a great one, as my uncle said. But no. At least, I wish he had been meaner. How could such a weak, cowardly man try so hard, after all that he'd been through? I just couldn't stand by and watch, but... If I could sneak away. But my uncle's a slippery bastard. I thought about it, but I just couldn't think of a way. So remember you. Hurry up and do it. If he doesn't, he's gonna die soon. He's already very weak. He might not last another day. Friends. You're going to give up on a guy who's so weak he doesn't even know how to defend himself. You're such a strong man, well, you may have your faults, too, but, he's so healthy, so foolish, so honest that it makes me sick. He can't even tell a lie for the moment to escape the blame, he just suffers. After all that after all that's happened to him, irritated with Gwyn, who was staring at him in silence, Iris raised her voice. Don't you believe me? Do you think this is some kind of a trap? That I'm using Marius as bait to lure you out and steal the secret that the Marquis of Langobard told me? That may be what you think, but... I don't think so, but it's not. Trust me, Iris didn't hear what Gwyn said. He was too eager to tell him. That guy, I don't know what's wrong with him. Marius makes my heart flutter. He's been that way since the first time I met him. He's always, always so timid, like he'd kill me if I didn't help him, like he'd rather sing than fight, even though he's a man, playful, timid, timid. I wonder why he's so happy, so joyful, so smiling all the time in this world full of suffering and filth. And I'm tempted to torment him. But then, when I see him suffer, when I see the smile disappear from his carefree face, I regret it again. Oh, what am I going to do by pushing this man so hard? I don't know what I've become. I've never done anything like this before. I'm frustrated I can't calm down. But, that's usually the human word for love, Princess Octavia. With a low laugh, Gwyn slowly opened his mouth. That's what we call falling in love, I suppose. I'm not so sure. Hey, hey, what? Octavia was so startled that she seemed to have turned to stone. No, no, no. How could I be such a clown? You are a womanly and passionate girl, princess. And no matter how many times you kill, your true self can never be hidden. An oracle. That's just the way it is. It's no wonder I'm willing to give myself to yarn. I am, I am an ambitious man first of all, such a lowly, beguiling, beguiling, cowardly, chattering, clownish, clownish. As far as I can tell, I've never seen Marius sell himself to anyone for money. Gwyn put his hand on Iris' shoulder soothingly. He'll talk about love all he wants, but there's something truly noble about his soul. He would not be lowly enough to sell himself. Cowardly, perhaps, but he will endure terrible tortures for the sake of his principles. Talkative, good-natured, clownish, well, that's what he's born to be. But he's also cheerful and cheerful and makes those who are with him happy, that's for sure. And sometimes a strange, lonely, sad look in his eyes. I don't think he's as carefree and clownish as he seems. I don't think he's as naive as he seems, but I think he's got his own troubles, scars, and sorrows that he wants to forget. Gwyn. Iris clammed up, her cheeks flushing somewhat. You know what he is, don't you? Where he was born, what he. It's not necessary to love someone. Gwyn said flatly. 
If he wants to tell you, he'll tell you himself. If you feel like telling him your secret, tell him. He's a man worth trusting, and if he thinks it will hurt you, he'll keep it, even if it costs him his life. Just like now. Yeah. Deeply, Iris breathed. His face was pale now. I can't hide anything from you. Maybe I was just jealous. I thought that the reason I had watched him suffer so long and so bitterly, and had stood idly by as he was tortured, and yet had never said a word, was because he loved his sister, Sylvia, even a little. I thought it was because he loved his sister, Sylvia, even a little. Sylvia Octavia, Gwyn said softly, what will be a sister like a flower? But the time has come. Where in the castle of Lord Darius is he? The dungeon. I'm being tortured from morning till night, so much so that I'm almost unconscious most of the time. Where is the dungeon? Where are the guards? The basement of the East Tower. I'll draw you a diagram now. There are two entrances, but one is behind the bookcase in my uncle's living room. And the other one has a lot of guards. How do I get into the castle? I'll manage. I've managed to keep a cold face, so my uncle won't have noticed my betrayal yet. Go into the castle, tell me where it is, and I'll take care of the rest. Calm down, said Gwyn Iris looked at him suspiciously. Are you insane? You t well, you stand out like a sore thumb. You can't even disguise yourself. Besides, the East Tower alone is guarded by a hundred of the finest guards in the world. No matter how strong you are, and there are too many of them for even my hands to contain. I'm not taking a lot of people with me. I'm going alone. What the? Iris clamped her mouth shut. No. There's nothing to worry about. You've been informed. I'll take care of the rest. You'd better make up another plan of action for the night so you don't get yourself mixed up. You'll always find a woman or two who'll say they were with you. Wow, my uncle has given up on me wandering around like I want to, so it's fine with me. But, Iris gasped. If you were to fall into my uncle's hands, I can't imagine how happy he would be. I'm not falling. Didn't you say, hurry up? Yes, yes. I finally couldn't take it any longer, and thus and when. Tomorrow. The day after tomorrow. Tonight. Ha. Huh. Show, but then. I'm going to have to ask you to cross a few dangerous bridges, but I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. Gwyn said. Just give me a half a minute. I'll get ready. And I'll come with you. Gwyn. Iris gazed up at the giant with the head of a leopard and the body of a man with a shimmering gaze. And he said in a voice of awe, Who the hell are you? By whom, and for what purpose, were you sent to Caronia? Selino sent to Yarn. Or is it? It's not like that. This plan was hatched on the spur of the moment, and I don't know if it'll work. If it doesn't, well, we'll figure it out then. Then meet me at the south gate in exactly half an hour. I'll have a carriage ready for you. Don't let anyone see you. Yes, yes. Gwyn. Half a dozen more. Gwyn's huge body agilely and soundlessly disappeared into the darkness. Octavia looked away, shook her head with an indescribable expression, and shook out her hair as if waking from a dream. Gwyn. What a man. It's like. As if. Suddenly, she took a troubled breath and cupped her breasts in her hands. Love? No way. How could I be in love? That's not possible. A voice like an exhalation danced in the depths of the night. Obsidian Palace knows nothing and is still in its sleep. The dungeons of the Little Moon Palace. The sound of a candle wick squirming. A faint, feeble moan. The smell of burning flesh mixed with the sound of dripping blood. Marius. Under the flickering light, the face of the big man looks twisted like a demon wandering out of the eternal darkness. What's the matter? You don't even have the energy to talk to me anymore. Even though he was given a quick slap to wake him up, Marius did not react in any way. His head was swaying faintly, as if his neck had been broken or something. 
Archduke Darius stared at him with an impatient look in his eyes. You, too, are a stubborn man. I'll whisper it to you. I thought you wouldn't be so hard to find. Or should I say, foolish. You've made me very, very angry at last. A faint, whistling breath escapes from Marius' bloodied lips. I don't even think he understands what's being said. I don't think I'll be much use screwing Sylvia over before the ceremony. You idiot, you didn't have to die in vain. You're annoying. I'm so angry. Marius doesn't say anything. No, he can't say anything. He's been tortured day after day, and he doesn't feel like living. The only thing left for me to do with it is to use it as an assassin, but I don't think you'd approve of that either. Do you know what I'm thinking about? Marius. I'm thinking of giving you, or rather what's left of you, to my mercenary troops, who are known for their bravery and cruelty, and let them dispose of you as they please. I'm sure they'll get rid of you in no time. Well. You know what I mean. Marius. Uncle. A cold, haughty voice. Iris was standing there with her arms folded. Darius jumped up. How many times do I have to tell you, don't do anything that's gonna freak people out, like sneaking up behind them? You're a creepy little bastard. Not as much as your uncle, sir. Iris didn't even look at Marius, who didn't seem interested. You deceived me. I don't know what you're talking about. Of the disease of Achilles. Ah. It's not a serious illness, you shouldn't have to report it every time. It's nothing serious, huh? Iris's voice took on a cynical tone. I guess it's a good thing I went to check it out myself. My dear father is in a critical condition, isn't he? What the? Grand Duke Darius threw off Marius' body and raised himself. What did I just say? Are you still trying to hide it? I didn't know you had so much to hide even from me. I'll have to change my mind. No, it's not. Wait a minute, hey, oh, Iris. Is that real? I sneaked into the inner sanctum to check on him. The chief vassals and the doctors were discussing whether it would be better to let him hold out until the ceremony or to have a shadow warrior. What the? I'm not sure I understand. Was it you who poisoned him? Uncle, don't be ridiculous. I don't want him to die now. Then who is it? Who would want to kill that man? Immediately the Grand Duke stood up. I don't have time to play with these little fish anymore. If that's true, it's a big deal. What are you going to do? I'm going to Obsidian Palace. Taz, the carriage. Ha! This one, well. Tell him I don't care how he cooks it, and he can have it for his mercenaries. Is. There may or may not be time for another assassin, if my brother's life is on the line. Oh, my god. Vlad of Mongol, now Achilles of Chironia. What a yarn trick. The Grand Duke's face had changed. Iris watched as the Grand Duke left in a panic. Taos. Yes. The mercenaries are too weak to be tamed. Take them back to their cells and do as your uncle said tomorrow. Ha. What's with your eyes? Are you trying to tell me that, unlike my uncle? I don't have to obey you. Don't forget. If my uncle's plan succeeds, I will be the next emperor of Chironia. Is. Where is the dungeon? To number three. Do we have enough guards? Yes. Keep your eyes open. The Grand Duke had long since disappeared into the Obsidian Palace, and the living room was empty. Iris slammed the door shut so that everyone would know she was out of there. But he did not go out, but quietly went to the window opened the curtains, and pushed open the window. Gwyn Gwyn. I'll call it a twitch. Beyond the window is a garden at night. A faint scent of flowers flows through the air. There's no sign of anyone. I can't. Gwyn, all by herself. ILS mumbled, hiding behind the curtains, patiently enduring the anxious moments. At that time. The Lord's hasty ascent of the castle caused a great commotion among the Umayya and the guards. As he had come to the castle in secret, he could not bring many of his men with him. It was only after the Grand Duke had left in the darkness, guarded by ten or so of his best riders. Hey, hey, gun. What's going on? Did something happen? 
Come on, man. We don't know what you're doing. Well, good. Close the gate, I say. Let's lock it, buddy. The two gatekeepers were about to close the heavy iron gate with a creaking sound. A black wind rushed through the air. What? What's wrong, gun? Yes, now, something. Are you a dog or something? That's not. Gun could not finish what he had said. Gun's body crumpled as he was hit, and just as his partner was about to yell, a fist went into his stomach. The huge black shadow quickly took the two men by the body, and with his sword and spear on the ground, he leaned them against it and tied them to the shade of the gate post. To the night eye, the two men appeared to be standing guard without incident. As soon as he had gagged them, Gwyn left the place as if a gust of wind had blown past, moving from shadow to shadow in the blink of an eye, aiming for the inner garden. It was the midst of a small moon palace of an ambitious lord and in the midst of a conspiracy. In ordinary times, there would be mercenaries everywhere. But on this night, the Nainamarut and Sanamaru were almost deserted. This was because the Grand Duke had ordered the guard mercenaries to be ready for action at any time before he hurried to the castle. That, too, was in Gwyn's mind. With the help of his natural instincts and the circumstances, Gwyn reached the main palace in the back without being seen. But, as expected, there was a buzz here. Bonfires were lit, shouted orders were shouted, and knights in loincloths came and went. Well, what do we do now? Outside, hunkered down in the Lunarian bushes, Gwyn thought to himself quietly. Even he did not have the confidence to walk through the courtyard, passing through the eyes of the fully armed mercenaries that filled the garden. Time slips. He feared that the impatient Archduke would order the torturer to kill Marius as a matter of course. Of course, even if Iris would cover for him, he could not be sure how things would turn out if too much time passed. I didn't fear that Darius would come back knowing he'd been deceived. Hmm. Looks like I'll have to take a chance. Gwyn has decided to go for it. You're not gonna find anyone as big as me, but at least you're gonna find the biggest one. As you look around, you will gradually narrow down your target. That's him. He spotted a large-bodied, strong-looking mercenary carrying a helmet, wandering about. However, he was not nearly as big as Gwyn. Gwyn gently picked up the stone. When a big man passes by near the bushes, he throws it gently at him. With a thud, the stone struck him on the back. The big man turned around with his hand on the hilt of his sword. Who is it? He barked in a coarse voice. What? What the hell, Zod? What's wrong? No no matter what, there's something on my back right now. You're not getting anywhere. You've got the wrong idea. The pride of a regiment, Zod, is no more. The big man seemed to have lost his temper at being chided, but he looked around and saw nothing. Seeming to have no choice, he returned to his original position and began to groom his horse. After a while, nothing happened and everyone forgot about the little incident that had just occurred. Zod Zod. A muffled voice called him and he turned around. What? Who is it? It's me. Zod, I need your help. What? Where is it? In the shade of this bush. Hey, I need you to help me get this thing off. It's stuck. Power. I'll take care of it. Let's see. This is when he loosened up and went in behind the Lunarian bushes and peeked out. Gee. Suddenly, a fearsome, strong arm wrapped around his throat and neck, dragging him into the bushes. His throat is blocked so tightly that he cannot speak. Zodo put all his strength into his arms, which were like the roots of a pine tree, in order to repel the arm. But the other man's strength prevailed. Zod looked incredulous. It's no wonder, with his size. It's no wonder he's confident he can take on Xenon, the Thousand Dog Warlord. But now, the thickness and strength of the hand that clutched at his throat was so strong that he could not believe it without seeing it with his own eyes. Zod's face turns red and his eyes start to bulge out. He struggled for a while, but his body suddenly slumped. Slowly, Gwyn lowered the man's body. After checking to make sure that no one had noticed, he quickly hurried the man over, took off his cloak, tied him up by the belt behind his back, put a gag over his mouth and pushed him into the deepest part of the bushes. Even for a man as big as Zod, his helmet was still too small for Gwyn, 
but as expected, she was able to fit. Instead, his shoulders felt as if they would burst open. He loosened the laces of his robe and pulled on his cloak, which seemed to cover him. He tucked his head into his helmet and pulled down his cheeks halfway, as it would look suspicious to do so. Once his disguise was complete, and without a moment's hesitation, Gwyn, wearing the helmet of Archduke Darius Mercenary, left the bushes of Lenoria. Avoiding the flickering bonfires, they walk busily with their big feet through the darkest corner of the garden possible. He must have thought he was Zod, of course, because of his great size. His friends called out from behind him. Hey, Zod. You, what about the horse? I don't care. Just pick and choose. He coughed and tried to hide the difference in his voice as he strode across the courtyard. A cryptic voice followed him from behind. I don't care what you, you know, you're usually. Hey, Zod. I've got some business to attend to. I'll be right back. The rest of the way, I just kept on going. There was some shouting behind him, but he paid no attention to it. As soon as they had passed through the courtyard, the rest of the way was almost like running. Fortunately, the men and women in the inner courtyard were so caught up in the mercenary look of Darius that they did not notice the suspicious yellow eyes lurking beneath. By the time they had managed to reach the inner garden that Iris had shown them on the map, even Gwyn's body was drenched in cold sweat. Iris, when you get to that point, you're no longer human. Gwyn called out in a whimper. Immediately, the curtains wavered behind the pillar and the platinum blonde's head appeared. Are you okay? He sounded rather frightened. Well, I'm glad you're here, what's your pleasure? I got him. Where's Marius? He's okay not yet. But I'm pretty weak. Don't go in there. Gwyn quickly ran to the window. He climbed over the window sill and entered Darius. Living room. From where? I want you to move this bookcase like this. Iris pulls out a book and moves a device hidden in it. The bookshelf jerked, and a black, hidden staircase appeared behind it. It's also a loophole in case of emergency. Come on. Let's go. It is. ILS hesitated. This loophole, you can get in, but from the inside, you can't. You can't leave. We have to open it with the key. My uncle's the only one with a key. It's a natural precaution. Don't worry. We're not gonna get past those mercenaries with Marius in tow anyway. We'll find another way out. No. Gwyn looked at Iris warily. You get back from here. What? How did you? All you have to do is tell me which cell you're in. You're not going to lie to your uncle about everything just so long as you can save Marius. If you go back to your room and pretend you don't know, no one will notice. The Grand Duke will be suspicious, but you're his trump card and he won't kill you easily. Besides, you'll be a liability. One man against hundreds, if not thousands of mercenaries. I'm not that stupid and I'm not that conceited. I'll find a way. That's what this head is for, a leopard's head will do just as well. I'm sure it's hard to resist having someone like you as an assassin. Emperors and kings, muttered Iris. All right, sir. Well there we go. If you're worried about Marius, you can ask him at my quarters later. And, princess. Ha. Huh? Remember what I told you. You can't fall in love if you don't know who you are. How much more suitable for a beautiful girl like you a love song than a bloody revenge play? Octavia nodded sadly. No I've come to the point of no return. A low voice broke out. But when he raised his eyes, Gwyn was already gone. The hiding door of the bookcase was tightly closed. Gwyn. Octavia clasped her hands together and murmured a prayer. I can't I can't go back. My hands are soaked in blood from, but thank you. You're the only one who's ever called me, Princess. Princess Octavia, and. Please, Gwyn, help Marius. To safety. Gently, he cut the mark on the yarn and strode noiselessly out of the living room. After that, a profound silence descended upon the inner hall of the Kogetsu Palace. On the other hand, Gwyn turned into a huge black shadow and slowly descended the long, winding stone staircase to the basement. 
Marius is in dungeon number three. I trace the map that Iris handed me in my mind again, and descend as if I were carefully clinging to the wall. The dungeon reeked of damp, stagnant water, stale blood, and a foul smell of decay. Gwyn knew how to make his huge body move like a shadow itself, without a sound. Soon, without running into anyone, he is down the stairs, looking around, and slips easily into the depths of the cell. Step by step, he moves forward with a hesitant but steady gait. Suddenly, he ducked his body to the rear and was lost in the shadows. He has completely disappeared, and only his twin eyes are glowing faintly. You know. At all. Yeah. That's true. Two guards walk toward us, talking to each other. I hate it when you think that. Well, it's not like that. I'll take that as an order. Jarong, Jarong, and a bunch of keys clanged at his waist. They probably never knew what had happened to them. The two men who had been hit by the armor fell to the left and right with a faint shout. Just before the armor hit the stone floor and made a rattling sound, Gwyn's strong hands grabbed one of them by the neck from behind and supported the other with one foot. Gently lowering him to the floor, he takes the key from his waistband. This time, without bothering to tie him up, he dragged him into a corner and once again Gwyn ran without a sound. The next guards he encountered were hidden in a corner, and when he went down one more floor to the basement, he found a row of dark dungeons where prisoners were locked up. Gwyn estimated the distance with his eyes. It seemed that things were not as easy here as they had been in the past. Instead of the sentry patrolling at intervals, there were a number of soldiers walking back and forth in the corridor in front of the prison, each carrying a spear. No more than ten. Seven or eight, maybe. Gwyn counted with his eyes. There must be enough people for him to take care of by himself. But the problem was that even he could not defeat that many people in an instant. If you can't get rid of them all in an instant, they'll immediately blow the whistle or shout to let you know that the bastards are coming. Then hundreds of them will come. Hum. Gwyn pondered. We can't do it by force. Then we'll have to think of a way to distract. Them. I was just messing around with my thoughts. I guess even he let his guard down for a moment. Suddenly. There was no sound, but something was coming at him from behind. Gua. Gwyn barely contained the scream that threatened to burst out of him. A raspy, ha ha ha. A nagging pain in my arm. Woo. Human, it wasn't. No human being could have been oblivious to Gwyn's creeping presence. A huge black leopard was threatening him. This, this, this is Darius's, watchdog. Terrible and well-trained, apparently. It didn't roar, it crept in, breathless, and it came straight at him. It sunk its fangs firmly into his strong arm. A leather gauntlet barely protected his arm from being bitten by the blow. Gritting his teeth, Gwyn grabbed the leopard by the nose with his left hand and tried to pull it off. He dodged with the small of his left hand as a tremendous claw struck him in the side. The thick skin of the gauntlet ripped open. Whoa! With an inaudible groan, he tries to pull the sword out with his left hand. It's backhanded and won't come off. Fuck! Giving up, he suddenly stopped trying to escape from the fangs, and on the contrary, he took the beast by the body with all his might. He wrapped his left arm around the supple torso of the beast and clasped its legs together with his feet. The leopard's spine snapped with a crushing sound. Even though he was dying, he still refused to take off his right arm. He pulled it off, tooth by tooth, and threw it away. It was a huge leopard. An ordinary man would have been killed. It's been a hell of a lot of cannibalism. I cut the Janus sign and examined the wound. It's not so bad thanks to the patches. Waving his right arm a couple of times, he did not look at the leopard's carcass anymore, but went back to the upper floor where he had escaped the attention of the people. He crouched down, took a set of hoofs from his waistcoat and lit them. He throws the ring into a cloth bag at the end of the corridor. After watching the fire rise, he quickly runs downstairs. Seeing the smoke drifting away, he... There's a fire. There's a fire upstairs. Somebody get up here. He shouted at the top of his lungs. At the same time, he hid himself in the shadows for a moment, 
What? What did you say? Didn't you say something about a fire, now? There was a murmur among the guards. You're burning up. Smoke. Up here. Go. I'd like to see him go. Wait. It could be a trap. Go see if you can find a couple. That's when the captain called him out. Yes, sir. The three of them immediately ran out, not knowing that Gwyn was lurking. Is. That was good enough for me. At the same time as the three disappeared, Gwyn drew his great sword and darted from his hiding place. A giant black and yellow whirlwind. Gaw. When a voice shook the dungeon. One on the right, one on the left, cutting them down, blood and smoke alike. What? What are you? Who? In the next moment, the heads of two more men sprang up, and in his haste to bring his flute to his mouth, the captain was struck in the chest with his sword and was knocked down by Gwyn. As soon as he jumped, Gwyn pulled out his bloody sword. Not paying attention to the corpse, he rushes to number three's cell. He takes out a bundle of keys, but seeing that there is no time to search for a suitable one, he quickly falls back and recoils, hitting the door with his body. The door swung open from its hinges for the third time. I jumped inside and scooped up the shadow of a person lying on the bed in my arms. Marius. Stay with me. It's me. What appeared in the dim light was unmistakably the black hair and delicate face of Aldine, the Prince of Paro. But even if he is lifted up, he does not notice. His head droops backward without resistance. Sense of alienation. Gwyn muttered. Then he quickly tore off the sheet, tied Marius's torso, and lifted him on his back like a piece of luggage and tied him down. Then he wrapped him in a light blanket. I'll make you comfortable in a minute. Just hang in there a little bit. As soon as he whispered to the deaf man, he grabbed his bloody sword and ran out of the prison. Captain, there's a fire, sir. A fire broke out in the execution chamber. You son of a bitch. I met the three of them at the bottom of the stairs. He immediately launches a thrust and uses a counterattack to sweep the opponent to the right. Wah. Gaw. Is. Even the super warrior couldn't make the same moves as before with Marius alone on his back. Somebody. Come on. It's a monster. It's a freak. There's no time to stop the third soldier from screaming. But his voice trailed off, and the soldier's head flew through the air and landed on the stone floor. Gwyn lowers his body and starts running. He ran as fast as he could towards the other entrance that Iris had told him about, not the hidden door. What the hell, I heard something. What's the matter, ah? Who the hell is this? Whoa, 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 whoa. Iris taught me that there's a third way out. Before I could reach the sewer, however, soldiers came running down the stairs in pieces. Immediately, the whistle is blown violently. Chit. Gwyn reholsters his sword. What the hell was that? They're going to take the prisoners. Don't let him get away. Don't let him get away. That number. There must have been thirty of them. Cut off the pursuers, cut off the pursuers, cut off the pursuers. He had the disadvantage of protecting Marius, but in the narrow passageways of the dungeon, with its low ceiling, even if there were many of them, they could not come at him at once. At most, there were only two of them who had time to swing their swords. But Gwyn is clever enough to catch them and wield his sword, and a pile of corpses soon forms before him. You're strong. Who are you? Tell me who you are, you son of a bitch. Stay sharp. Tire him out, catch him. They don't seem to realize that Gwyn is aiming at their filthy mouths, which go straight down into the sewers. When you see that your opponent's strength is unusual, you become more cautious. Gwyn drew his sword and grabbed the iron ring on the stone floor at the very end of the cell. Oh, that's it. Idiot, what are you doing? Don't do it. You're gonna die. Grasp the wheel with all your strength and pull. When you do so, the ring rises up around you. There's a black, unfathomable space down there. And when he saw that, without a moment's hesitation, Gwyn threw himself into that darkness. There was a great deal of and swirling flow and faint voices of people shouting and rustling, and Gwyn's body was enveloped in deep darkness. One moment, 
The sensation of falling, which seemed to last forever, caught Gwyn. To say that he had no fear would be an understatement. He had no way of knowing where and how the sewers of Chironia were structured. But how long did it continue to fall, after a time that felt like tens of minutes, but in reality was probably only a few seconds? With a splash, Gwyn's body falls into the cold water. Suddenly a fast current and a bad smell try to engulf him. He tries to stand up, but his feet are swept away by the current, and for a while he struggles in solitude, but with more difficulty than before. When he finally stood with his sword tip against the slippery wall, the water was up to his chest. Marius. You all right, Marius. I called out to him, but he didn't give me any help. He just looked around in a panic as his labored breathing confirmed that he was still alive. As his eyes gradually became accustomed to the darkness, he was able to see most of his surroundings, as he had always been a night-sighted man. With the moss stuck on the wall emitting a faint light, he was able to see most of his surroundings. Along with Paro, Chironia is one of the only two countries in the Middle Plains that have water and sewage systems. Needless to say, however, this is limited to large cities. The stone-built sewer is high enough for an adult to stand and walk comfortably. On both sides of the sewer are steps that are not very wide. When I put my feet on the steps, the water was up to my waist. Torques, water snakes, worms, and all sorts of creepy little creatures run through the darkness. The indescribable smell of them almost chokes me. I can't say that I escaped to safety. At his back, Marius's breathing was labored, yet ragged. Gwyn bit his fangs and began to walk in the direction he wished, using the inspiration of his beastly instincts. With each step, he had to defy the force of the water and bear the weight of his back. This was no easy task, even for a man of Gwyn's superhuman strength. Moreover, it required a fearsome amount of mental strength to walk all the way through the darkness of the sewers, where it was not even clear which way to turn to find the light of salvation, while being overcome by the unpleasant smell and the anxiety that this might be the wrong way. But Gwyn was both of these things. He stopped thinking and worrying, and just went on and on as a beast. In this case, the human brain was more of a hindrance. Occasionally, he looks back to make sure that no one is following him. Even Darius mercenaries don't seem to like the idea of coming down this sewer, a sewer that is always filled with corpses and filth. Gwyn kept walking. It felt as if he had been walking like this for days and days. The rushing water seemed to be filled with strange and mysterious things, such as dead animals and human fetuses. Occasionally, my feet would be covered with a slimy feeling. After a long, horrible time that would drive any normal human being insane. But finally, a way out is in sight. The water was flowing down in a rushing waterfall. There was an iron grate, but it was not very sturdy. It was a simple device for trapping large pieces of garbage. The water seems to flow down to the river from there and then to the sea. Gwyn clutched the bars, relieved by the dim light. Time had not passed as he had expected. The moonlight of Iris cast a blue shadow over the river beyond the bars, and the faraway cities and mountains beyond were still asleep. The whiteness of dawn was beginning to creep in somewhere. They had been walking for only a day or so. Gwyn inhaled deeply, filling his chest with fresh air. Marius. You're safe now. One more step and you're a free man. Good work. I'll get you to a doctor. You've got nothing to worry about. He calls out softly over his shoulder. And then. Behind me, the air shifted. I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name. The horrible way the darkness grew more and more as if it were pining for him, and then it condensed into the face of an infinitely old man, twice his normal size, only from the neck up. Then he looked at Gwyn and smirked. Gwyn wasn't afraid. You're gracious. Sternly, he said. Once again you've tried to mess with me. I'll never be in your hands again. Have you seen me? The leopard-headed warrior. The dark priest let out an unpleasant laugh. Good grief. The future leopard king is crawling through the sewers with Torek, and all for the sake of one useless kid. If only he'd said a word to me, 
I'd have sent him off to his old home in Paro without lifting a finger. Okay, gracious. You and I have nothing to do with each other anymore. You may have your reasons, but I do not. Gracious chuckled. I'll follow you. Wherever you go, all right, Nosphorus, I'll follow you, I'll follow you, I'll show up. Why? Gwyn's eyes are glowing with fear. What do you want? It's obvious. I want you, leopard man. Your power, your cosmic secrets, I'll have to take them no matter what. And now that Nosphorus has fallen into the clutches of that damnable northern beholder, you are my only hope. The last part was almost inaudible even to Gwyn's keen ears. Gwyn complained. What? What did you say? It's all a dream, it's all a dream. Gwyn, my hope. It's no use bothering that Prince of Paro. He's not made for a greater destiny anyway. Feed him to the rogue mercenaries in Darius's dungeon or the torques in the sewers here, and leave those transient creatures alone. Or you can come with me. I'll make you king of the stars and ruler of time, space and dimension. If you and I work together, nothing will be impossible. No, that's another one. Why? Because my gut tells me you're my enemy, dark priest. So tell me. What are you planning to do with your time here as a Cylon? What are you up to? I've heard from your mercenaries that where you appear, nations will become battlefields, some will perish, some will become demonic realms ruled by the demon doll. What makes you think of Chironia? Easy for you to say, easy for you to say. Because of you, Leopard King. You attract both darkness and light. You have both in you by nature. But that young man is not worthy of you. Aldine, fourth prince of Paro, brother of Aldoneris, lord of the crystal. Gwyn said calmly. Yes. Butterflies of the fleeting world, cicadas of a night singing in beautiful voices. Gracious said in a blunt chant. If it had been my brother, I would have taken him and made him my messenger with care and training. Now put the boy down and come with me. You'll be in your kingdom of Nosphorus before dawn. No, I don't want to. Gwyn had said something he hadn't expected to say. It was almost as if it was an instinctive choice. In that way, you try to get this young man out of my hands, dark priest, he has some power, too. Like a stake to keep me in the realm of light. Is that so? That I don't even know myself. Gracious said as if offended. Well, good. This is only our second meeting. My involvement with you is likely to be a matter of the future and I'll be watching you closely as you become entangled in the shadowy confines of Chiron's court. There's still time. And I will not fail to take you by the soul. Cuckoo cuckoo. For now, you just have to remember that I am watching over you at all times. Leopard man, there are no two leopard-headed kings in this world, we will meet again in the Obsidian Palace. At the Obsidian Palace. That's when I tried to ask him what he meant. Gracious's face suddenly melted into the darkness and disappeared. All that was left was a strange, disturbed feeling of space. Oh, my God. Gwyn moaned lowly. Then he suddenly grabbed the bars and tore them down. Marius. Just a little patience. I called out to him, and without hesitation, he danced his body from the sewer to the surface of the river, which was flowing down as a waterfall. Finally, the eastern sky began to widen, and the signs of night were beginning to fade from the silence. It is a tributary of the lower natal river, which flows through the silence in all directions. On the outskirts of downtown Silen, it's still morning in sticks. Several washerwomen, baskets on their heads, came down the still-dawned road to the bank, rustling merrily. Long hair tied up with a white cloth, a long apron, pantaloons tied tightly at the ankles, and leather underwear, these are the cheerful and sexy silent customs. So, I told him. I said, Jaren, you're out of your mind. And you know what he said. Karna, have you ever heard of anything like this? Jaren's not a very nice man at all. But when it comes to his bread, he's the best silent. The women came down to the riverside, chattering happily, set down their baskets, and bent down to draw water for washing. A huge hand came out of the stone wall. Hi. Yikes. Shoo, don't bother. 
It's nothing fishy. Hands, and a yellow round head. Kaya, Karna, Karna. Oh, I know you. You've been to the lap and on the rid, haven't you, Selinos? Ah. Oh. That. Of the Obsidian Palace. I am General Dulcius Hundred Dragon Chief, Gwyn. Gwyn leaned forward and said, I'm sorry, but I need your help. Even I'm a little tired. And can't carry a single person up this stone wall. I should have managed to get back to Kaze Ga Oka by the end of the day. The women looked at each other, but rumors of Gwyn were already rampant throughout the silence, and their curiosity gave way to fear. The women then pulled up Gwyn, the wet mouse, with their hands. Gwyn pulled up the sack of cloth that was tied to the string with his last effort. Ha! Just like they say, muscles. It's a thing. You're moving. But you do have beautiful eyes. Gwyn nodded reassuringly to the women who were murmuring. I'm sorry, but would you mind going to the wagon maker and bringing me one of those tough-mouthed ones? It's a small favor. Oh, my god. I like the fell. I'll bring the fell. Hold on a second. The two women ran out. Gwyn gently gave the package to them, cut the string and pulled off the blanket. What emerged from inside was a pale, bloodless, powerless face. Oh, you're beautiful. Karna said. Is he dead? Gwyn silently pulled off the blanket and pressed his leopard ears against Marius' chest. For the first time, a relieved color flowed over his face when he heard a weak but firm heartbeat. No. I'm not dead. Yes. But you don't look terribly ill, do you? Yeah. Hurry up, we need to get you to a doctor. Gwyn said, gently lifting Marius to his feet to place him in the carriage the women had brought. The Silent is finally waking up. Chapter 4 Serious Daughter Marius Marius I had a faint feeling that I was being called somewhere very far away. Suddenly, his voice reached inside my heart like a ray of light in a dark room. What? Oh. He's got eyes. A faint voice. And gradually you'll come to your senses. Ugh. Marius. You see. It's me. Mysterious swirls of yellow and black whirl in front of your eyes. Gwyn. I thought I screamed. But my voice didn't come out. Don't talk. It'll break your heart. Oh. An intense pain ran through my whole body like an electric shock. Bo. K. This is the place near the Obsidian Palace, the place where the Wind Hill is. Gwyn's deep voice, soothing and comforting, reaches into the depths of our hearts. Without knowing the meaning, the comfort of being held and nursed soaks Marius. There's nothing to worry about here. You can relax and let your mind and body heal. Oh. Marius goes limp and shuts his eyes again. He's still so weak and dazed that he's lost everything. The only thing I can feel is that my whole body is wrapped in something comfortable, plump, and smooth, and that I am in a safe, clean, and most certain shelter. That's, that's Gwyn. You don't have to worry about a thing. Gwyn's here, Gwyn's here to protect me. Losing himself in a pleasant sense of free and unrestrained satisfaction, Marius was again drawn into the depths of his unconscious. What do you think? Gwyn says, looking at Marius gravely. You're still pretty badly beaten, sir. If I'd been half a day late, I wouldn't have survived. I'm not a very strong person by nature. I'm sorry, Castor. I'm sorry to bother you. It's what a doctor's supposed to do. So, please, keep this sick man to yourself. I know what to do, my lord. So, I'm sorry, everyone, but will you please keep him safe and let him rest? I understand. I'm sorry. And then Gwyn stood up and said. He left and returned to his lodgings not far from there in a waiting carriage. Was about to walk in with his big toe. Gwyn. There was something behind the door that called to me. You are bold, Iris. You walk about the palace in broad daylight, you know the story of the water jug that goes to the well. It's okay. It was not the blonde, cold, black-robed swordsman who emerged from the shadows. She was a ravishingly beautiful courtesan, her hair brushed and veiled, her whip-like body clad in the garb of a courtesan. 
On her shoulder she wore the crest of the Grand Duke Darius. Is he? Pretty bad. The doctor said you're all over the place. They won't let him move for a while. But you're young, anyway. It won't take you long to recover. It's nothing for you to worry about. There is no other life, is there? Apparently. But if he'd blamed me any more, I wouldn't know. Rest easy, and go home. Gwyn. I'd like to thank you for. You have no reason to thank me. I was just helping a friend. So, but, you're still on the Grand Duke's side. Remember that and behave accordingly. That underscore. Iris stammered, then said, I'm sorry. Where is he now? You don't deserve to know. But, it's a safe place. There's nothing to worry about there. Let it heal. You can't go out in the open for a while. I'm... Iris coughed. If you think I'm going to sell Marius to my uncle, I'm not going to ask you to help him. I'm... I don't think so. I just think it's better for you if you don't know where he is. What? Why? If you knew, you'd see him. And if you do, you'll be followed. Why would I want to see him? He was about to say something when Iris stopped and nodded her head with a heavy heart. I hate you. Iris twitches. Why did you say those things to me? To mess with my mind. I'm not in love. I'm not in love not ever. I'm a man. I have to be a man. I have to be a man on the throne of Chironia and there is no other way. Do you understand? You don't understand, revenge and hate are secondary. The truth is, I can't live without it. You're telling me that Darius is going to erase me. Perhaps, but to have the great emperor of Chironia for a father, and the noble princess of Eulania for a mother, and still live as a mere, obscure, insignificant town girl. If you were a woman, and you were in the same situation as me, would you be able to endure it? I have the blood of the royal family of Chironia and the nobility of Irania flowing through my body. My cousin of the same blood, as princess of Chironia, is gorgeous, extravagant to the fullest, and surrounded by glittering light. No. I don't think she's very happy. Gwyn interrupted slowly. She may wish she could give up her position and live as a city girl with the man she loves. I like that girl. I feel sorry for her. She's a pretty girl who's strong and doesn't hide who she is, and she's not fit for the cold, cloak and dagger position of princess. I bet you don't even like the doll, Octavia said, pursing her lips. That selfish, arrogant girl. She's just like her mother who had my beautiful mother beaten to death. I can't forgive that woman. That was a long time ago. And now you're this beautiful adult. Why are you so obsessed with the past and so obsessed with blood? What greater happiness is there for a man than to be able to live as he wishes and be himself? I can't help but think that I can't be myself. Perhaps you were attracted to Marius because he chose to live as he thought and gave up his fetters. I'm not falling for that guy. Iris said madly. All I want is to live and bring my mother's honor back to life, and to do that, I will ask for the doll's help. Even if it means selling my soul. Don't. If you say it, you're already wishing it. I've always lived with dolls, you know, said Iris defiantly. Do you think that I have been living as myself? Did you think that I could not walk the streets, that I was always afraid of assassins, that I had to take on the name of the wicked, that I had to disguise myself as a man? You're too feminine to be a man, Gwyn said softly. I think it's as great for a woman to win a man's soul as it is to win a country. It's hard for a man to live under a false name and keep his identity a secret. Save him. And be saved. You can stand before men and pass as a man and they will see right through you. And if you try for the throne as a woman even Sylvia will be in an uproar like that. You're the most beautiful woman I've ever seen and I know what kind of misfortune and civil war would ensue over your good name. If you think for the good of Chironia and for your own happiness, there is another way for you to go. If you weren't a leopard head, I'd slap you. Iris said in a trembling voice. Why do you speak so confidently as if you could see through me? 
You don't know my thoughts, you don't know the envy of these long twenty years. Do you want me to be the wife of a clownish bard? Do you think I, daughter of the great Achilles, deserve to be a wanderer without a home? Then I'll say nothing more, Gwyn said softly. Go where you believe and do what you want. But let me tell you one thing. Marius is not a lowly wanderer. His soul is noble and honorable. Or I would not have called him friend. If you're going to measure a man by his birth or his blood, do what you must. Yarn's sarcasm will never reach your eyes. I don't know what you're talking about, Gwyn. A little pale, Iris said. You be careful. My uncle received the report and already knows that it was the leopard-headed monster who rescued Marius. My uncle is a scary man. Don't let regret make you think you were too late when you found out. I'll keep that in mind. Tell Marius I'm coming. No, sir. I'll never cross a dangerous bridge for that guy again, Iris said wildly. And suddenly she ran off. Gwyn watched him from behind, lost in thought. There was a hint of concern and anxiety in his topaz eyes, which was unusual for him. Day by day, day by day, the days flowed by in the Obsidian Palace as if they were counting down the seconds. The preparations for the grand ceremony were complete by the seventh hour. All the gates were adorned with huge wreaths, and in the middle of the wreaths there was a brilliant portrait of Achilles the Great and a smaller one of the Princess Sylvia. All the corridors were covered with flowers, and the halls, the coronation chamber, and the mausoleums dedicated to the spirits of the fathers, which were not used every day, were redecorated again and again. The soldiers were given new cloaks and coats, and flower fetters for their horses, and their daily training was replaced by practice for the parade. Gradually, the envoys from various countries began to arrive. Of course, since this was a domestic event, different from a coronation or a wedding of an imperial princess, there were no guests of the royal class as at a real grand celebration, but only envoys with words of congratulations. Nevertheless, Count Linus, the new holy knight, from the neighboring country of Paro, Count Elia representing the three Gaulish countries, the female delegation led by the beautiful female envoy Chan Van Lang from Kitai, Lord Heimdall from Tartuan, and Duke and brother of Wallachia, who came directly from the coronation ceremony of King Remus I of Paro, representing the Primorsky territory. Ali Trevan and Count and Countess Orlok of Thrace, who had come directly from the coronation ceremony of King Remus I of Paro. All the guests were lodged in the detached palace in Hikarigakaka, and every night, the welcome banquets were held at the Obsidian Palace and the Small Moon Palace, and the reply banquets were held at the detached palace, and Silen was very crowded. Especially, the female delegation of Kitai, consisting only of beautiful female officials, was very popular among the citizens. However, it was Kaze Ga Oka that was the most hectic of all. Every day, from early in the morning until late at night, various goods are brought in and many craftsmen come and go. From the empress to the twelve princes and twelve generals, and from the ladies to the young nobles, they celebrate the thirtieth anniversary of the accession to the throne of the great emperor and present him with elaborate commemorative gifts. Hazos had a way with these things, Gwyn. General Dulcius lamented to Gwyn. Not at all, when he died, I realized how heavy his presence was for my Chironia. Who's gonna take his place? Aulus is too old, and Dimas is unreliable, though he's serious. Poland is too young to hold his own. In the end, he's been invaluable. It is strange that a country as large as Chironia does not have a civilian staff of such caliber. We're more of a warrior nation. In return, we have some of the finest warriors the world has ever seen. Don't worry, even without Hazos, you'll be there in the end. His Majesty's power is great after all. General, I'm not sure what to tell you, Gwyn said. Eulania, and how are things going with Kumu and Chironia? Eulania, Kumu and Chironia's relationship. Frowning, the general looked at Gwyn. Whom Chironia has basically taken the stance of getting along with all surrounding nations. Though we don't know how they feel about that. I can't say we've always gotten along with Eulania. But since we are neighbors who share a border, 
It would be a problem for both of us if our relations deteriorated to the point where we were constantly fighting each other near the border. Especially now, Yulania is at odds with Kumu, and that would be a problem. I don't want Chironia to lose too many men to them. Well, I'm sure both sides agree that nothing is better than nothing. The problem is Kumu. Grand Duke Talio of Kumu has been said to be ambitious. However, during the time when Vlad of Mongol was rapidly growing in power, he seemed to have been careful not to start a war and have Mongol eat into his own country's wealth. Now that one of the three Gora kingdoms had fallen, he would have taken Gora in his hands at will. The whole world knows that this is the secret ambition of Talio, Vlad, and Orkin, the three Grand Dukes of Gora, to bring the three Grand Duchies under my control as the Kingdom of Gora. So you want to embrace Chironia and make an enemy of Eulania? I see. But Eulania is not strong enough to defeat Kumu without the help of Chironia, and Kumu is not strong enough to defeat Eulania alone. Especially when it comes to the control of the enfeebled Mongols, the two Grand Dukes are laying bare their ego which they have so far suppressed. If things go wrong, there will be a war, but for the time being, there is no telling where and how it will turn out. Empress Mariah, sister of Kumu's Talio, and Octavia's mother, Uri Euphemia, daughter of a Eulanian nobleman, and so on. Gwyn scratched his chin. One more thing, General. Where is the mother and mother-in-law of our great emperor from? She was the lady of Eulania. Darcius went easy on him. However, the Grand Empress, being a man of great wisdom, saw at once the folly of being drawn into the struggle for power between other nations, and thereafter avoided involvement in the internal affairs of these two countries and Paro as much as possible. There was considerable debate about Mongols' invasion of Paro, but he decided to marry our princess to the prince of that emerging country in order to prevent outside interference in the dispute between Kumu and Yulania. As for Paro, well, the Chironians and the Paroians are incompatible. I can't say I didn't secretly wish for the annoying Paro to fall under the control of Mongol. Of course he wanted to be a friend. But if Paro were to join forces with either Kumu or Yulania, then Chironia would have to join forces with the other side, though Paro does not have that power at present, so there is no need to worry about that. I've only recently come to this country. Did it not occur to you that Chironia, as an ally of Mongol, might be able to assist your country? With the death of Prince Mayer, the preparations were abandoned. And, as it would not be amiss to say now that the Battle of Paramongol is over, two men have sent word to Chironia to refrain from intervening in the Battle of Paramongol. Even in Gora, Kumu and Yulania refrained from participating in the war against Paro. And with the steppes and the coastal provinces on Paro's side, even the land of the prince who was to become my princess's son-in-law will not be able to sway Chironia. Even though Chironia is powerful, there is no way it can take on Paro, Kumu, Yulania, the Primorsky Territory Navy, the Steppe Nations, and all of them. Well who are the two people? Aldo Neris, Lord Crystal of Paro, and Scar, Dauphin of Argos. Darcius said. Lord Crystal presented Kumu with a written agreement not to enter Yulania, and Prince Scar sent an envoy to our country at the same time he announced our entry into Argos. He is indeed a strategist of the Central Plains, a whirlwind of the steppe. There were rumors at my court that he was doing everything right. I see. It's not enough to be smart in the future. Darcius laughed. Those two, they've proven it. I did not expect such wisdom from the wolf of the steppe, Prince Scar, let alone the brilliant Lord Crystal. That's why, from now on, we in Chironia must gradually cultivate not brave generals but wise generals and excellent diplomats, as His Majesty said to me only half a month ago. We Chelonians are simple-minded. We believe everything and we show it. After all, Hazo's death, it hurts. It hurts. That's where the old general keeps coming back to. But why would you ask such a thing? It's what I wanted to know. What would a hundred dragon chief know about such a thing? No. Gwyn laughed low. When you're being shot at, you want to know where the archer is hiding, I do. What are you talking about? Dulcius said sternly, but Gwyn digressed. Kumiolania. When he is alone, 
he takes his time, pondering the information he has just acquired. Recently, Gwyn has been doing nothing but sinking into thought, except for completing his training. Kumu. Erinia. Or both. Excitements of domestic, various positions, and ambitions of neighboring countries. Sylvia, Baldur, Laius, Daniel, Grand Duke Darius. Octavia. Don't forget. Gracious, the Dark Priest. Each one has its own excitement, its own backstory. I said, where do the arrows come from? That's not true. Arrows come from all directions. It's which arrow hits the target. Hey, General, I don't know what's going on with you lately, but you've been thinking a lot. He nodded earnestly to Thor of Atokia. Oh. I've got a lot of things to think about. And yet, you do nothing. I went to a lot of trouble to find out about Daniel. Why? If I move now, what comes out won't come out. Ha! Ah. So it's a leopard waiting for its prey in the pit. How long do we have to wait? We're almost there just a few more days. It must be hard to wait. I feel for you. No. Gwyn laughed for the first time. I'm used to waiting. It's nothing. I'm waiting to see if there's one that isn't, but they all seem to have a lot of self-control. Hmm. Five more days, to the celebration. Gwyn said, lost in thought. His eyes, topaz with some thought that Thor could not fathom, strangely made him look like a real leopard. Lord Gwyn, the hundred dragon chief, is here to see you. The maidservant told him and left. Perhaps he thought that if he had one woman with him for a long time, she would fall in love with him but every time a different woman came to look after him. And no matter how much he tried, she would never tell him where he was or whose house he was in. Ah, Gwyn. Marius had grown numb. As soon as Gwyn came in with his cloak flung back, he raised himself up and began to speak. Hey, where the hell are we? Whose house is this? You could have told me. I mean, why do we have to lock the door? That's just, that's house arrest. Why in the hell are you? Are you feeling all right? Not bad, if you can talk that much. Gwyn's voice has a hint of laughter in it. I'm relieved to see you're doing much better than I expected. Well, not that I'm fine. Marius said, somewhat meekly. You're all over the place, you're itchy, you're limp, you've got a fever. It's a wonder I'm alive. I don't ever want to remember what I went through last night. But I knew it was Gwyn who saved me. Actually, I thought it was a dream. I thought I saw Gwyn in a dream I was having all kinds of dreams. Don't talk so much. You'll run out of breath. Hey, how the hell did you find out about me and come to save me? Gwyn was silent. Marius, seeing in the silence a rare hesitation, cried out more urgently. Hey, tell me. Why? I mean, it's not like Gwyn can see everything that's going on, right? I came here today because I wanted to come in and ask you a favor. Gwyn said slowly. A favor. What? Promise me you won't ask any questions and that you'll listen to me, Marius. It's not like you. Marius looked at Gwyn with his eyes as wide as they could go. What the hell is this? You have to promise me. It'll help me, too things that need my help. Like singing. Well, of course, I'm always. Not exactly. Oh, my god. It's not like you to say things like that. Gwyn sighs a little. Then he said, I don't have a choice. In fact, I brought this here as a request. He takes from his closet a small leather bag. When I opened the bag, what I found inside was a border pass. The destination had not yet been written down. And a ticket for a stagecoach. Hey, 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 Gwyn. I'm asking you, of all people, for this bill that I've accepted for you. Take it and go where you like. If you don't want to go to Paro, go to the east, go to the south, go to the east. Gwyn wait. Kumu, Yulania, and I don't recommend Yulania. There may be a disturbance soon. If you want to go back north to Creamhild, hold on. What the hell is going on here, Gwyn? Marius cried out and coughed so loudly that his throat burst into flames. But he would not be silenced. 
I'm not kidding. You're just going to leave without telling me why that's not going to happen. Explain it to me. What's there? You still don't get it, do you, Marius? Gwyn, calm down. You are now under threat for your life by your brother, Archduke Darius, and by Viscount Baldur. Now that you know the Grand Duke's secret, he will not let you live. For the moment, I have managed to keep you hidden, but even in this mansion, you never know which secret agents are lurking around the corner. That's not. It's not that. It's a terrible thing. Your body cannot protect you now from ten children, let alone Baldur. Besides, I won't be able to leave the Obsidian Palace much longer to guard the grand celebration and the muster ceremony. I don't think I'll have any free time at all for several days once the celebration starts. I won't be able to protect you or help you when you're in danger. So, if you'd just leave Chironia and go and rest in a safe place, I don't know how much easier it would be for me. Besides, if I may say so, it seems to me that you no longer have any reason at all to stay here in Cylon, if anything, you only have reasons not to want to stay in Cylon. Marius was at a loss for an answer, but with a stubbornness he did not want to admit, he turned his head and said nothing. If I'm wrong about that, just tell me. If there's some reason why you must stay in Chironia, then so be it. There was no way Marius could have done that. Marius was pouting, and then suddenly. Hey, Gwyn, it's not fair to change the subject. I said defiantly. Who informed you that I was in the clutches of that nasty archduke? What are you gonna do when I tell you? Well, you have to thank me. Or if it's just a riddle to get you to do what Gwyn says in exchange for a lesson. No, it's not. I don't like that kind of deal-making. Then why are you hiding it? Okay. Grudgingly, Gwyn nodded. Then I'll tell you. Iris has come to inform me that you have been captured. Obviously, Marius suspected that this was the case and wanted to find out. But as soon as he heard the name Iris, blood rushed to Marius' scarred face. I knew it I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. Because he came all the way to warn me to get the hell out of here right before he caught me, and since he's with Darius, he figured out early on what the Grand Duke of Dole was up to. I knew what the Archduke of Dole was up to. Ha, but it's very kind of you to go all the way to Gwyn to let her know. Yes, Marius tried to say it as casually as possible, as if it were nothing, but he failed miserably, and his voice was trembling badly. Gwyn looked at Marius with great attention. I have no wish to interfere in the mischief of the gods, but if I could, I would not wish this mischief to be accomplished. I don't think it's a chance encounter that promises a happy outcome. Hiccup, Gwyn muttered. What? What? No. It's nothing. I don't know, Gwyn, seems different today. I don't think so. I know. We haven't known each other that long. What's the matter, what's going on? No, Marius. Ha, huh? what do you think of Iris? How beautiful, that is, beautiful, cold, mysterious as the moon, elusive, skillful, burning with vengeance, the unknown crown prince of Chironia. I guess. What else would you have me believe? Do you think that Iris likes to do all these things? The truth is, Iris has far better things to do with her young days than to spend them in vain on revenge, don't you think? What is to be done? Hmm, yes. Like, like love. If you were so beautiful, you'd have no shortage of women to talk to, Marius said with a somewhat unamused look on his face. But you can always fall in love, can't you? And what can anyone else do to help him do what he wants? I don't want to be told what to do, either. You still don't know what I'm talking about. Sighing, Gwyn said. So, what do you say? Will you do me a favor and leave Chironia quietly? No, not forever. In a year, six months, you can come back to Chironia, to the silence. How's that sound? Marius pondered. But after a while, he said seriously and firmly. I know you're thinking of me, Gwyn, but I don't want to leave the silence now, Gwyn. I don't know why, but I just don't want to. Is that is that for Iris? Hesitantly, slowly, Gwyn said. If that's the case, 
I can promise you that I'll watch over and protect Iris so that you can leave the silence with a clean slate. What? Marius was horrified. What the hell are you talking about? Why am I doing this for Iris again? No. I thought you might have a thing for Iris. No way. I don't care how many times I've been called a man whore by some idiot Ishvan, you can't do that to me, Gwyn. Iris seems to like you a lot for that. No, you don't. He's always bad mouthing me, calling me a weakling clown. First of all, however beautiful and unworldly he may be, he's still a man. I don't care what the Ishvan fools say, I'm a womanizer, I like pretty little girls. I don't like men. Well, good. Gwyn laughed. So you don't want to leave no matter what, or even to leave the silence once you've decided to return. Then do what you want. But in exchange, I'm sorry, you'll have to stay here for ten more days. It's difficult even for me to keep an eye on you in this state when I don't know where the enemy will come from. As long as you're here, you're absolutely safe. But you're like a little bird that can't stand to be locked up. Gwyn, hey. I can't afford to make even one blunder now. Knowing the relationship between you and me, there would be more than one or two who would want to hold you hostage and bring me to my knees. So I'm sorry, but it's for your own good. Stay here, ten days. It's only ten days. Be patient. Wait a minute. I'm not. I'll make sure he comes to check on you as often as possible, and if there's time, I'll come too. For now, just relax and think about getting yourself all right. Oh, and tell your butler Lance to bring whatever you like. I'll be back. Get well soon. Gwyn, wait. Even Gwyn can't keep me in here and... Can you promise me you'll never leave? You. Marius is trapped. But. I'm fine. As long as my body's okay, I won't let anyone get away with this. Besides, no one is going to try to kill me, and the only one who knows that me and Gwyn are close is Baldur. Gwyn. Gwyn nodded slowly, as if he had no choice, and was about to leave the room. The door slammed shut and there was a click of the lock. Gwyn. That's not fair, that's not fair. You can't just lock me up and leave me to molder here for ten days. Marius was in a panic and tried to jump up, screaming. In fact, however, he was more tortured and weakened than he thought he was, and as soon as he raised himself, he screamed and fell flat on the bed. He lay on his back for a while, groaning in pain with a frown on his brow. Finally, as the wave of pain subsided, he clicked his tongue and jerked himself upright. He clucked his tongue and started to move, but he didn't dare to jump up anymore. My god, Gwyn, you must be out of your mind. He's gone mad, he's gone mad, he's gone mad, he's gone mad. Who in the world is holding my life back? That's ridiculous. That's when I turned in anger. The door was opened and a maid peeped out. You wanted to see me, sir. Oh. I was gonna say nothing, but then I thought back. Excuse me, can I get you something to drink? Would you like a drink, sir? Yes, sir. I'll get it for you. Immediately, the maidservant brought him a glass of sweet Vasho wine drunk with water, and holding Maria's head in her hands, she gave him a drink. Up close, he saw a pretty girl with brown eyes and dark hair. You're a pretty girl, what's your name? It's Alina. But I've been told not to speak to my guests. To whom? It is, of course, for the master of this house. Hey, you're pretty smart, too. I'm not falling for it. I'm bored. Why don't you sit down here and we'll talk about it? I'm sorry, sir. It's forbidden. I'm sorry to bother you. Please go to sleep. Only if you kiss me. I'm kidding. No, um. Turning red, she says. Anything you want. You. Oh, no. Not that again. I'm sorry. Hey, have you seen my beloved Kidera? Alina. Well, you've brought Marius with you all by yourself. But if you need anything, I can get you a Kithera somewhere. If you do, 
I'll sing you a great love song. You're a dark-haired angel, Alina. Alina like a flower. Don't you want to whisper a love song to me? Seeing the maidservant leaving with a chuckle, Marius decided that she did not seem to be complacent. And so, in less than half an hour, she came into possession of a beautiful, old Kithra from somewhere. Thank you. You're so wonderful. If only you'd stay with me from now on, I'd stop thinking about running away, and I'd hold your white hand and stare into your beautiful, gentle eyes. If only you were here, this would be heaven. I don't want you to play with me. And you can't play the kithra with your body, can you? I'm fine. I just want to know if I can still speak. Hey, whoever your master is, he locked me in this cage, but I'm not allowed to sing, am I? What about love? I wasn't told about the song. But I'm sure it's safe. Marius is not locked up. He's a very important guest of the Dragon Chief. If Marius were to escape, his master would be very angry and troubled for the sake of the Hundred Dragon Chief. For the sake of my precious master, please don't trouble me. How could I possibly want to embarrass a beautiful person like you, Alina? Will you sit there and help me up and put a pillow on my back? I hope you're okay. I'm fine. With Alina's gentle hand, Marius sat up gently on the bed and touched his lips to Alina's cheek as he did so. Kia. Please don't do that. You'll get scolded. I'll take your scolding. You're beautiful, pretty as a rosary. Don't you want to make love to me for a night? I'll sing for you. For the Kithra. I'll sing you a song that's just right for you. Daughter of Syria. Marius slid his wounded hand gently over Katara's. No matter what, the most important things to him next to life were the kid era and the songs. Even when he was groaning uncontrollably all day yesterday, all he cared about was that the torture might crush his fingernails and fingers so that he would not be able to play the kid Allah, that he might be struck in the chest and throat so that he would not be able to sing anymore. His body was not in the best of shape, but Marius wanted to find out as soon as possible, and he was in no mood to wait any longer. As I stirred the strings, I felt a sharp pain in my fingers and shoulders. However, he was well cared for by the chief physician of the royal household and, above all, by his young body. Knowing that he was recovering well, Marius was completely relieved. Don't you like the daughter of Saria? No, I love it. I'm singing this for you, and I'm dedicating it to you. Try to speak a little while practicing. It was painful at first, but after a little vocalization, it became easier. Marius sang in a low voice, keeping the chords to a few easy tinkles. You are the beloved daughter of Saria, the blonde maiden whom all love. When I speak out for the first time in a long time, even though my true voice has not yet come out, I am filled with a sincere feeling that I am alive. With golden hair and blue eyes. For the smile Saria gave me. I can't help falling in love. The wind, the setting sun, even the stars. He says he's in love with you. Daughter of Saria, maiden of purity. Can't help falling in love. I couldn't sing for a long time. But Alina sits quietly at the foot of the bed and listens attentively. You're like Saria's daughter. Marius put Kidera down, whispered to her, and took Alina by the neck and kissed her. Alina didn't blame him. She closed her eyes and received Marius' kiss. But. What shall I do? Please don't think of me as a trifling woman. He suddenly jumped up, turned his cheeks, covered his face and ran out of the room. He hears the click of a lock. I think I'll play with her for a while. Then maybe it's not a bad idea to stay here for ten days. Marius was smiling foolishly to himself thinking of the gentle, sweet touch of Elena's lips. I heard something hit the window with a thud. What? Marius wakes up with a start. Indeed, I can see what appears to be a figure beyond the window frame. Assassins. No way. But this is. Marius has always been a man of great curiosity. He tried to sit up and get out of bed, but he did not have the strength to do so. Who is it? To speak softly, harshly. And. A white hand reached out and gently pushed open the window and parted the curtains to the left and right. Cold, steely, blue-gray eyes, 
blazing with anger, stared straight at Marius from the window. Marius almost shouted, Iris. It was, indeed, Iris. Marius forgot the pain in his body. In a panic, he tried to jump out of bed and groaned in pain. Iris stopped him with her hand. Quickly, he put one foot on the window sill, turned his body upside down, and slipped in between the sills like a cat. He was able to do this because he was very slender and had no extra flesh on his body, so there must have been no way for most people to get through. Iris, what are you? When Marius started to speak in a panic, Iris stopped him again with a gesture. By this time, Marius, though he did not know why, was very angry, and he knew very clearly that the anger was directed at him. What the hell? Marius said softly. Iris gave him a piercing, cold stare and looked around. So this is where you've been hiding. Well, that might have been a natural thing to think about. This place, where the hell are we? Tell me, how did you manage to sneak into a place like this and not be in danger? If anyone finds you, you wouldn't tell me you don't know where I am, would you? No matter how much of a clown you are, more than ever, you've, how should I know? You were carried in unconscious, and the next thing you know, you're lying here. Well, I'll tell you what, we're in the villa of Demos, Marquis of Warstadt. On Hikarigakaka, the Marquis of Warstadt. Ha, you're not frightened. Because, why would Gwyngwyn bring such a great person here? How could I know that he knows the Marquis of Warstadt? Iris, wrapped in a black cloak and dressed as a Miroku, said plaintively. I followed Gwyn. I guess he didn't see me coming. Yeah. So that's it, Marius thought to himself, but another question remained unanswered. So, I know how you got here, but how did you get here? Is it bad if I come? Iris has a pointy voice. I didn't say that. You're even more of a thorn in my side today, you know that. I'm the poster child for the doll, anyway. But I think I'm a hell of a lot better than you, Thotha's poster child. I never should have gone to all that trouble to help you. You have no idea what a dangerous bridge we've crossed thanks to you. Oh, yeah. I heard it was you who helped or rather, who told Gwyn to help. Anyway, thank you. You saved my life. I don't want to be thanked. I hate people like you the most. Hey, what the hell is wrong with you? What are you mad about? Nothing. Because that's what it looks like when you're shub, 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 shub. There was a light knock at the door. Before Elena could come in, Iris quickly dived behind the curtain. What can I do for you, sir? Somehow, Elena says with a frown. I thought I heard your voice. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I tend to talk to myself. But I'm gonna stop now because I wanna sleep. Can you just leave me alone for a while? Please, take your time. Elena leaves with a smile on her face. After making sure that she was not coming back, Iris slipped out from behind the curtain. Hmm, I see, she's pretty cute. He says it in a very cold tone. That's what you like, isn't it? I don't think you'll like it. So you're going to kiss me whether I like it or not. You were watching. You're a bad person that was just a game. It's no fun for a woman. There's nothing I hate more than a man who plays with women. I want to burn them all to death. If only my father hadn't loved two women and kept his one wife faithfully my mother wouldn't have met such a cruel end and I wouldn't be in this mess. I wouldn't have ended up like this. So, are you angry? But having two or three wives and mistresses is a common thing for any royal family in any country. It's hard to find a royal family that doesn't. My father's father, Linda's father, Remus's father. Then let every last one of those kings die. Iris said in a hushed voice, but firmly. Oh, my God, that was intense. How could you possibly know? I would never, no, if I were a woman, I would never, no matter what, be at the mercy of a man who looked the other way. If only all women thought that way. Then the men would have to change their minds. Well, then, when you get a wife, you'd best be loyal to her. I don't want that. Every child has his own charm and good qualities. One is as beautiful as a flower, one is as pretty as a bird, 
and the other is as radiant as the sky, and I can't choose just one of them. Before he could finish, Marius's cheek snapped. Hey, what are you doing to a sick man? Guys like you are the most disgusting. You act like you're on the side of women and then you hurt them. I should have let the ghouls eat him in my uncle's dungeon. Then why did you help him? I didn't ask you to. And Marius, in his disgust, said something rather stern. I don't think I've done anything to you to make you feel so bad. In the first place, the reason I got into this mess was because I resolutely and heroically refused to do what your partner's uncle wanted me to do, which was to screw over your naughty sister. Yeah. Iris says, somewhat meekly. I know. That was, that was a surprise. I had no idea you had it in you. What do you mean? I thought you didn't have a backbone like the ID of Nosphorus. But you were quite impressive then. I don't think you're the same person as the clown that's here now. That kind of thing again. Why not? Suddenly, muttering, Iris said. What? Why didn't you listen to your uncle and at least try to avoid the blame in front of you? Did you really want to make Sylvia unhappy? Come on. Marius growled. You're even crazier today than you've ever been. I don't care if your cheeky, mischievous sister dies, lives, or falls, I have no interest in her. It's just that. I don't want to have to go through that again. I'm not interested in any of that. I just don't want to have to go through that again. The eyes that trusted me so much can't see anything anymore, and they've turned into hard mucus. Innocent people are dying because of the greed of miserable adults, it would have been better if they had at least hated or resented me. They died believing in me, not knowing that it was my hands, my body, that drew the viper into their beds and invited it in. I don't know who killed me or why, and like a flower pinched by a heartless hand, I remember everything about that time. Without any resistance, meekly and quietly. That stormy day will never leave my heart. I'll never do it again. I don't care what happens, even if I have to die for it, it's much better than having something die quietly like that again. I'll never again help an innocent die, much less kill someone with my hands that don't even want to pick up a flower. I can't. You can't. Well, you know, sometimes I don't always understand you. There are times when you seem like a dreadful minstrel and then there are times when you have a surprisingly noble gaze. You're a mixture of earnest and fierce and clownish and playful, and I don't really know what you're like. I can't decide if you're naive or not, kind or womanizing, lying or honest, cowardly or brave. Did I say something that touched an old wound of yours? I don't think so, though, Maria said in a somewhat weak voice. I don't think you're the only one with scars and a past you can't forget. Your tragedy may have been unique and you may have been right to be angry when you were unjustly deposed from the throne of Chironia, but even the most powerful family in the world, even the poorest family of shoemakers and liquor stores, live and have dreams and hopes and plans, dreams and hopes and plans and joys and sorrows, there's no difference at all. I may be nothing more than a clown, a coward, a philanderer, a nasty minstrel to you, but that doesn't mean I've always been so carefree and happy singing and dancing and playing with women. I'm not. No matter how small I am compared to you, you know. Iris was silent for a few moments. Then you were surprisingly calm. I'm I'm sorry. What? No, it's okay, I'm not trying to get you to apologize. Marius is somewhat surprised. That's not the point. I'm such a lazy person, but still, there are some things I just can't do. And even if I were killed for not doing them, I still can't do what I can't do, that's all. I like girls very much, but I can't touch a girl I don't like for some reason, and I don't want to touch a virgin as a rule. And anyway, I don't want to fight, hurt, or even kill each other. If I have to, I'd rather be killed than kill. You once said that if you didn't kill, you would have been killed. I'm luckier than you because I'm not in that situation. So maybe I don't have the right to say this, but I once let a 14-year-old boy die because of me, in front of me. That time changed me. 
I've since come to think that I'd much rather die than kill someone else, or have someone else die because of me. For a while, Iris kept her head down and didn't say a word. But then he chuckled. Then again, maybe I should have been dead a long time ago. I can't even begin to count how many people I've killed, but I didn't want to die. Not just to avenge my mother. If I had to stay in the shadows and be killed by assassins, why was I born at all? Without knowing it, exposing the cold corpse on the street somewhere as I thought is unbearable. Am I wrong to think so? Is it wrong to think so? It's not okay to kill others to keep me alive, I know that much, and I'm not going to pretend that I'm from the royal bloodline of Chironia but. Then what should I have done? What should I have done? I didn't mean anything about you, and if I were in your shoes, I'm sure I'd do the same thing as you. First of all, I'm sorry, but I don't think a helpless person like your uncle would feel that way at all. I guess so, Iris muttered. To tell you the truth, sometimes I feel like giving up everything and throwing all this away. Somewhere far away, where no one knows or cares about me, where I can live quietly and do nothing I assent that a much better, more just, happier, and better thing to do. That's nice, Marius said with a sigh. I've always wanted to do that, too. But no matter where I go, I always end up falling for something or someone. And here I am, in the middle of all this nonsense. The world, it's a hard place. I think it's hard to live. Even I, who's supposed to have nothing now, feel that way, so I'm sure you, who's about to be crushed by your burden, have it even harder. I'm sorry for saying such trivial things. I didn't know anything about you, so I shouldn't have said anything unreasonable. So please don't think that I think that you're better off dead. Anyway, just because you're as beautiful as you are doesn't mean you should die. It would be a national loss if a beautiful person like you were to disappear from this world. You're not like me. You're the cold, beautiful iris, the moon in the night sky. The moon always shines high in the sky. We'd miss you too much if there was no moon in the sky. So you mustn't die. If you want, I'll die for you as many times as you want. If I'd known then what I know now, if I'd given up my worthless life to protect the little Marinia flower. I think I might have been different. That Marinia flower. Iris then crouched under Marius's bed, and her hair, like an overflowing moonlight, flowed down from the hood of her cloak and glistened on the side of Marius's face. What's your, what's your story? You said it was a boy. A brother. No. No, really, she was just some girl I had no connection with. I met her by chance, and I taught her the Kithra, a sickly, neglected child, very kind-hearted, fond of music, as quiet as a marinia flower on the side of the road, but she was so sad. When I taught him the Kithra, he was so happy, he loved me so much, and yet I let him die. It was my fault, it was as if I'd made him die. I thought I'd put the sword down. Last time, I didn't have it in my heart, but, did you love that boy? I love you. Yeah. He was so cute. He loved me, and he adored me. He smiled at me, and there were times when I thought he was so cute I didn't know what to do. She was a sweet girl blonde hair and blue eyes. She was slender and always had teary eyes. You have such kind eyes when you talk about her, Marius. Yeah, I guess so. That boy, how did he die? My. He was killed by his brother's assassins. Marius clammed up. Iris looked panicked. If you don't want to tell me, I don't want to tell you. But I've been through a lot myself, and I thought you might not understand. But if you don't want to tell me, that's fine. There's a lot of stuff going on that's a little hard to talk about, and I'm hoping that someday, someday, I can talk to you about it. Marius suddenly had a strange feeling. I'm hoping that this blonde-haired moon nymph will listen to me and tell me everything. The secret of his birth, the complicated love and hatred for his brother, and even the Prince of Mayer, everything that he has wanted more than anything for so long. But why? Is it because he, too, 
is troubled by his mother's feud with a different sibling, or because their positions are similar in many ways. The son of a concubine, come to think of it, I and Iris are not the children of our father's queen. Is it because of this similarity that I am strangely attracted to Iris? One day, Marius said, impulsively, letting what came up to him. Someday, when I don't mind telling you, there's something I'd like you to tell me. Will you, listen to me? Of course. Whenever you're ready until then, that is, if I'm still alive. No. I've got a lot of interesting secrets that will surprise you. You'll be lost if you don't listen to them. You just have to stay alive long enough to hear them. Yes. Iris said quietly, and then stood up softly. Well. You're recovering better than I thought, and I'm relieved to see you looking so well, so I'm going home. You're right, Gwyn is right, it's probably very safe here. You'll be safest and I'll be safest if we stay here until this celebration and Sylvia's son-in-law rivalry are over. I wouldn't be happy either if you were killed so easily after having crossed a dangerous bridge to rescue me. My uncle's a vindictive man. I'm sure he'll turn a blind eye to keep you from talking. Be careful, because if my uncle or Baldur find out about you again, there's nothing I can do to help you. Now, get well soon, and one day, you can tell me your story. If you can. Bye. I'm trying to stand up straight. Marius stretched out his hand and grabbed it without knowing it. It felt so thin and fragile that I was surprised. What about you? Iris, what are you going to do now? I'm not. It's none of your business, Iris said, changing her mind. I'm busy now. I've got a lot of work to do in the court. There seems to be a conspiracy all over the silence. Especially around the Windigo Hill I'm going back there, Marius. Into the midst of conspiracy and assassination and treachery and poison. That's what I deserve. I'd love to hear your story, but until then, I'm not sure I can live with myself. No, Marius shouted. No, you don't say that. That you, the cold, beautiful moon, should be hidden in the clouds. Marius. A faint, startled cry. In an unconscious movement that he hadn't even thought of himself, Marius pulled on Iris. Wrist and cradled her head. Oh. The faint gasp of Iris aroused him, and Marius covered his lips with his own. Molly, I'm only supposed to like girls. No matter how beautiful, talking about love with a man is, what the hell is wrong with me, and, oh, I don't care if it's a man, Marius murmured wildly. Then he pushed his face away, trying to escape, and held Iris's hand down, and once more, this time with his lips deep in his mouth. Marius I'm not like that. Finally, Marius' hand was wrenched away and Iris jumped out of the way, holding her mouth with both hands. I'm not supposed to be like that either, Marius said angrily. What the hell are you? Anyway, just stay out of the house, please. As soon as she had finished, as if she were afraid of being held back, Iris jumped to the window and slipped out. Staring at the open curtains, Marius murmured absently. I didn't know that. I guess I was. Just like that idiot Ishtvin. I don't think so, but it's like. Marius closed his eyes. In his confused, feverish mind, only the sweet, soft touch of Iris's lips was clear, like that of a first kiss. Iris, on the other hand, returned to the horse that had been tied to her, jumped on it, and rode down the hill like the wind. It was not until they had completely descended the hill that they slowed the horse down. She dismounted, took the reins and walked slowly, until suddenly Iris put her face to the saddle and sobbed. Love. I knew it. Gwyn was right. I. Just now. Now is the time, now is the time, now is the time. You can't go back to being a woman. Marius. Suddenly, with a voice like a scream, she shouted toward the residence of the Marquis of Waldstadt, far up on the hill. Of course, it was impossible for her to be heard. Marius. I'm not Iris, I'm not Iris. My name is Octavia Octavia is my name. 
Marius. The voice is softly torn by the wind and swallowed up. Immediately, Octavia threw herself to the earth and fell prostrate. She continued to cry, shaking her shoulders, unaware that her beloved horse was peering down its long nose at her with concern. Marius Marius Marius. The blonde goddess of the moon, her lips covered by a black hood, let out a moaning sound. By the way, I'm not sure if Gwyn was really unaware that Iris, or Octavia, was following her, or if it was his first-class way of seeing things that allowed him to see everything, and the two young men fell in love without realizing each other's true identity. It was impossible to say, unless you had the eyes of Yarn, who could see everything. Oh, Gwyn, you're here. Would you like to come this way? Marquis Waldstad. Yes, it's a very important gift from Gwyn, and besides, it was ordered by Her Imperial Highness that Lord Demos of Warstadt should not come to the Obsidian Palace until the day of the celebration, due to her displeasure. Demos greeted Gwyn as she walked toward the Marquis's living room, her neat face beaming with embarrassment. You're going to have a lot of trouble, Marquis. No, my hardships are of no concern to me but it seems to me that I have done something wrong with his highness. Would any other man have behaved better in such a situation and distracted the princess? I don't think any of our Caronian men could do so well, but Paro's date man, for example. The princess will not fall in love with such a man. What does she like about me? I think I'm a dull man, Gwyn. I have no ambition or skill. I can't sing or speak well. I'm a simple-minded coward. Everything I do angers the princess. And yet, I suppose if she's as beautiful as you are, nothing else matters to a 19-year-old girl. Beautiful. I've never thought of myself as beautiful. What kind of compliment is that to a man? It's freaky. Don't you think, Gwyn? Well, I don't know. But you seem to be feeling a little better. As a matter of fact, even though I am only loyal to you, I think I will retire to the villa and not be bothered by the princess for a while. Demos confessed in a hushed voice. I'm really not good with women like that I'm at a loss. Even if I didn't have a wife, I'm not a princess. For me, a woman should be modest, mature, chaste and sober, just like act. After the celebration, you can return to the quiet forest on the border where Act and the children are waiting for you. I'm relieved. I'm a country girl, Gwyn. She's a frisky girl, that's for sure. Gwyn laughed. She's quite lovely. Honest and passionate a pretty girl, I think. If only you hadn't talked to me like that, of course. Oh, and, Gwyn, I'm happy to be of service. I'm happy to be of service to you. To help you in any way I can. I'm irresistibly glad that out of all your acquaintances you've turned to me. Somehow, I'm beginning to understand the feelings that Hazos had for you. I'll take care of you. That young man, I can't help feeling I've seen him before. Oh, no. I'm not gonna ask you. But it might be a good idea to know who's after you, to protect you. I've rescued him from the Little Moon Palace. But if the Teruan Viscount also finds him, he will try to kill him. His Royal Highness, Baldur. How could such an emaciated young man, no, no, no. To tell the truth, it would be safer to take him to the castle of Wallstad, where Acti and Helene will care for him well. Helene is my oldest daughter. She's barely ten, but she's a perfect lady and a kind mother. Second is Diasius, the eldest, and Amos is the youngest. They're lovely children. I hope you'll come to Waldstad someday, even if it's in the middle of nowhere. Thank you. I'll never forget your kindness. It's nothing of the sort. More importantly, are His Imperial Highness and Baldur planning to do something to celebrate the occasion? I've been hearing a lot of bad things about you. It's as if all the silence are infiltrated by Kumu, Yulin and Scouts. It seems the Kumu has finally annexed Mongol and things don't look good. And I've heard that our emperor hasn't been well lately. I feel that nothing good has happened since Hazo's death. That dark cloud will be swept away in time for the celebration. Princess Sylvia won't even call on the prince once she's found a groom. 
that's what I'm counting on. Still, I hope the celebration goes off without a hitch. After bidding farewell to Deimos, Gwyn ordered him to take the two-horse chariot that was waiting for him and return straight to Wind Hill. At Zeno's suggestion, he had decided to use the chariot as his own vehicle until he could get a good horse of the steppe. It was just as the wind was blowing at the foot of the hill that the farmer, who was standing in front of a small two-seater chariot and controlling two horses, suddenly fell down without speaking. Immediately, Gwyn jumps from the carriage, which he has lost control of. The ownerless horses gallop away. A long arrow with a black feather stands in the throat of a farmer who has fallen to the grass. Who are you? Gwyn's hand was already on the hilt of his sword when he stepped on the earth. It's surrounded by woods and grass outside the Obsidian Palace. There's no one passing by because we're a little off the road. You know, behind the trees, in the grass. A group of men in black appeared. Quickly, Gwyn counts with his eyes. He knows at a glance what they are, the mercenary knights of Grand Duke Darius, who killed several of them the other day. Come on. A gut-wrenching gust of air escaped from Gwyn's mouth. Is. Lord Gwyn, the Hundred Dragon Chief. The one in the lead, the one with the feathered hat, was the first to say it. My master, Grand Duke Darius of Chironia, wishes to see you. Will you come with me? Will you kill one of your own countrymen's peasants for saying that, Grand Duke Darius mercenary army? Behind the captain, the mercenaries put their hands on their swords. But the captain stopped him. Will you come? Do you want me to put my sword to your head and take you in? Neither. Gwyn stared into the trees, his eyes piercing. What's with the carriage? The Grand Duke's crest is on the door. If you need me, my lord, you may come yourself. Rude. Captain, you arrogant, mouth-breathing leopard, cut him down. No. It's out of your hands. And, but, hey. One of them, at the command of the captain, runs toward the carriage. Surrounded by dozens of people, Gwyn waited, unmoving, buried up to his ankles in the grass. The door of the carriage opened and a man walked leisurely towards them. It was the Grand Duke Darius. You're Gwyn. I'm sorry I couldn't be there to see your famous spectacle. I am Darius of Chironia, brother of Achilles the Great. You should know him. Gwyn bails silently. You know why I called you here in such a secluded place, don't you? Gwyn was silent. You don't want to tell me. I already know you're the one who managed to elude the minstrel. It was hard for me to believe that someone from the palace could pull off such a deed, even when I heard that you had the head of a leopard, but now that I see you, I can believe it. I see, even the strongest chieftain of the Taluans, Sigurd, has a body that even Silenos would not be able to match. That brat is a blessing in disguise. He's so stubborn that I thought I'd spend enough time with him to make up for not being able to use him, but no more. You can't hide from my assassins any longer. I don't care about him anymore. As long as he doesn't wander around in front of me, I won't ask you to find him again. I'll tell him. More importantly, Gwyn. You, who are you working for? Unexpected, but also not at all unexpected. Gwyn gave a small laugh. I'm not a pawn in any of this. Do you expect me to believe that? I'm not like the good Dulcius or my brother. That body, those arms, at first I believed Gandalf of Kumu wore a mask, but even with a body as large as his, he does not seem to have the skin of a Cumite, and it is a well-known fact that Gandalf's right hand is one palm longer than his left. Well, the world is a big place, and there may be some super-soldiers who can outdo Gandalf, but are still unknown. But at least in the forest where no one can hear you, you can speak your mind. Gwyn, who are you working for? Kumulania. Or Hanem, or Kitai, or... Someplace more outrageous, like Paro. None of the above. I have to make you believe that I'm not working for anyone. I don't care who you work for. In fact, I'm willing to work with you if that's what it takes. If that's what you want, I'll leave you alone and go out now. Do you think you can go? Do you think Silenus can fight alone against fifty elite men? I think. You're a big talker. Well, okay, let's be more direct. Gwyn, if you're working for Kumu, 
I have a way to subdue you. If you're Yulanin's pawn I have something to tell Grand Duke Orkin. I want you to be my liaison and join me. Gwyn stares at Archduke Darius with the eyes of a strange leopard. This was a strange skill of the man with the strange leopard head human body, but most people who saw him for the first time could not realize that he was a human being just like them, even if he had a leopard head human body. The round yellowish eyes and the expressionless face of a leopard make people think that you are really a leopard or a tiger, and they tend to say things that they would not say to a person with a human face. And we also forget that behind this round, yellow-black spotted head and wet nostrils, there is a brain as sharp as a human's, observing, measuring, and thinking. Or, if you insist on telling me that you are a loyal citizen of Chironia, and not a pawn of either of them, then let's see some proof. Evidence. Oh. If you weren't working for someone else, you wouldn't be hiding evidence of a conspiracy that could endanger Chironia. I would have made you emperor or general and asked you to do the right thing. If you still insist otherwise, you can show me what Hazos entrusted you with. Well, I've got a pretty good idea what that is, too. Anyway, what do you say? There's no reason to hide anything after you've read it. I'm telling you the truth. Why don't you just spill it? You don't need me to tell anyone. I don't think so. Gwyn cackled lowly. Archduke Darius snarled at Gwyn in annoyance. What a laugh, leopard man. No. So, I understand what you're saying, but, let's say I am Kumu's informant. What if I admit right now that it's in the Grand Duke's heart to join Yulania? Or vice versa? At any rate, the Grand Duke has not spoken openly. On the contrary, I don't think he's shown us anything, or am I wrong? Gwyn. Darius said slowly. I see, you've shown me that there's something in that leopard's head that's better than a leopard's brain. Be that as it may, in this case it's I who's listening. Don't forget that you're surrounded by fifty swords and could be cut down at any moment. Well, but that's beside the point, there's nothing I can do about it. I have no ties with Kumu or Yulania. Darius does not have the miserable idea of replacing his brother on the throne with some foreign power, unlike some queen. On the contrary, for now, you may consider me the most loyal and faithful vassal of Achilles the Great. The reason why I have appeared before you in this way is because I do not want my brother to die now. Until such time as Princess Yulia Euphemia's son is recognized as Crown Prince of Chironia, I suppose. Gwyn. Darius's eyes instantly burst into fire. Why did you do that, sir? It's not like Iris talked me out of it. I did my own research. I know that the Grand Duke first wanted Baldur to be his puppet and son-in-law to Princess Sylvia, but when he found out that Baldur was disliked by the princess, he withdrew and planned to have the child of Princess Julia, whom Emperor Achilles loved. Humph, you seem to have a better head than Baldur's fool even if you've managed to find that much in such a short time. If you weren't such an unborn freak, I might consider marrying you to Sylvia instead, but as it is, you're half beast, half man. How about something else? No. But I don't know what he means by wanting to join forces with Grand Duke Orkin now. If the Grand Duke really means that he doesn't want Achilles to fall into the hands of assassins now, why should he join forces with Yulania? It doesn't matter what you think. There are many, many deeper reasons for this. Archduke Darius walked slowly and approached Gwyn. As soon as he did, he flashed the sword at his waist and drew it. But Gwyn did not dodge the sword, which was pointed at his throat like a silver snake, and he did not even blink. He stood there silently, staring back at the Grand Duke. Say it, leopard. Grand Duke Darius says one word at a time slowly, deliberately. What is it you want? For now, I must protect Achilles the Great. And to find the man who did this to my friend Hazos of Langobard and make him pay for it. And ultimately, ultimately my goal is to find Locandorus the Beholder and find myself lost. Is not that the word of the leopard? No. To protect the Emperor Achilles from assassination and to find the culprit behind the plot against Hazos. Slowly, Darius repeated. Then, you and I don't seem to have any conflicts of interest at the moment. 
Gwyn stares at Archduke Darius, silently searching. You've already told me why I don't want my brother to die now. Besides, the conspiracy involving Hazos is still about the life and death of Emperor Achilles, isn't it, Gwyn? You still don't trust me, Darius thought for a moment. Then his hand went into his pocket, and when it came out, it was grasping a heavy sack of money. He threw it carelessly at Gwyn's feet. Take it. And do me a favor. Gwyn is still watching the Grand Duke in silence. This is half of the reward from my brother Darius. Until the celebration is over, protect Achilles, my brother, from assassination or harm, and if possible, find out who is plotting to assassinate him. Gwyn slowly unrolled the sack. Then he stepped closer to Darius and put it in his hand. At your service, Grand Duke Darius. I'm a mercenary of the Emperor Achilles. It's my job to protect the Emperor and hunt down those who would harm his body, but I don't think I should have to thank the Grand Duke for that. The Emperor has already appointed me as the Chief of the Hundred Dragons. You're gonna stand up to me. No. Until I know you're the one behind the assassination, I'll be happy to provide you with any information you need. I may even ask for your help. But only as a mercenary of the Emperor Achilles. I can't ask you to do this. Gwyn flipped himself over softly. He slipped past the knights and headed toward the Obsidian Palace. The Archduke Darius stopped the knights who were in hot pursuit. There was something fishy in his eyes. Gwyn, he muttered. You'll regret this, you boaster.